So, okay. Good morning, colleagues and friends. Welcome at the, the annual Baltic Musicological Conference. This conference started in 1967 as meeting place for Baltic musicologists. And after numerous transformations, it became some platform for international, global, <laughs> in context of, of a recent new reality, uh, scholarly exchange and collaboration. And it seems to me that for a first time, we have the topic music and visual culture. I mean that this year topic is uh, link to the intersection of music and other arts. And as you see, we have extremely rich uh, program and the, uh, the, our speakers is really uh, somehow represents the global character of our conferences. I mean that we have speakers from Canada to Singapore. So, but from, from probably how many, four continents, let's say. So, and uh, we, I also would like to uh, thank all our participants. Uh, we started yesterday with some uh, discussion round table on the current issues uh, related to the processes of uh, deglobalization and uh, actuality of uh, decolonization, which is probably new to some of our neighboring countries. So to start this conference and to welcome you, I would like to invite the, my colleague, uh, a rector of Lithuanian Academy of Music and Theatre, musicologist, doctor, associated professor, Judita Zhukene. Thanks, Ruta. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, I'm happy to welcome you here in, at uh, the Lithuania Academy of Music and Theatre. Uh, the organizers have chosen the interaction of music and visual culture as the main topic of a conference. This means that we admit that in music, visuality uh, become more and more sim significant. On the other hand, many visual products uh, cannot be separated uh, from music at all. So again, we re refer to the, to the discourse of interdisciplinarity and draw our attention on uh, to visuality. But uh, the way, uh, by the way, uh, here in Lithuania, it is a rather popular direction of research and is especially uh, recognizable in the research of uh, uh, art and music of Mikolaos Konstantinos Shulanis. The Baltic Conference the tradition is an example of long-standing collaboration of musicologists. More than 50 years, the musicologists of uh, three Baltic countries expressed uh, the demand uh, and the wish uh, to share the outcomes of their research, and it gave a lot of nice results. One of those is uh, a close uh, collaboration between researchers of uh, Baltic region and other European countries. I'm very glad to see so many familiar names in the program. Uh, it is so good to see you in Vilnius again. Also, I'm truly pleasure that at uh, this uh, really tense time, some of you have decided to discover our community of musicologists, our academy, and our beautiful capital. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, I wish all uh, the participants of the conference new inspiring, uh, inspiring uh, ideas for the future research and cooperation, as well as fruitful discussions. I wish the guests uh, to find some time for enjoying Vilnius, and I wish 
peace to all of us and especially our colleagues from Ukraine. Hey, hello again, everybody. Uh, let me introduce, but probably already we have met with you all. Uh, Rima Povilonene, I was addressing to many of you with the many emails, many messages. And firstly, I would like to thank you uh, in showing your interest in this event and uh, thus helping us to organize this conference for receiving your kind responses, fast reactions to any inquiries. And today I am extremely happy to welcome you here in Vilnius and with no difference, it's live or virtually presence. In this conference, the music professionals get together from different parts of the world. We are today to hear nearly 30 presentations with fascinating and intriguing subjects. Three keynote lectures, a special study session on Lithuanian opera, seven regular sessions, uh, plus a pre-conference discussion that was held yesterday. And the geography of this conference covers a wide map, which besides a company of Lithuanian colleagues, includes the speakers from USA, Switzerland, Austria, Norway, Italy, Georgia, Latvia, UK, Finland, Turkey, Slovenia, Singapore, Canada, and Ukraine. The conference topics range from 100 years old examples of music and visual art interaction to contemporary issues, encouraging rethink the existing opinions and views. The conference is supplemented by two evening concerts that will be held tomorrow, 7 and also on Saturday, 8 October, starting at 7 p.m. These two concerts celebrate the 100 year anniversary of the International Society for Contemporary Music, ISCM. Lithuanian ISCM section together with the Japan Federation of Composers present an exchange program. And for these two events, see the booklet in your participant bag. I'm sure the meeting with the Japanese traditional instruments shakuhachi flute and koto, as well as listening to, to the music by Lithuanian and Japanese contemporary composers will generate impressive memories. If you have any questions, just address to me or our assistant volunteers, whom you will find at the registration desk or at the conference hall. And I would like to use this opportunity to express my gratitude to the volunteers. They are our academy students in musicology. And I'm proud to see them getting involved in this conference willingly. So let me wish you a meaningful time, motivating presentations and discussions. And also I invite you to explore and enjoy our capital Vilnius. Make some time to take a walk in the cozy streets and lanes of the old town. And now it's time to say the conference begins. And I invite my colleague, the conference chair, Ruta Stanevichuta, to moderate the first speech and Zdravko Blazakovic to present the keynote lecture. Uh, understood? Yeah, Vilnius Re. Uh, no, it's this, this is mine, I think. Vilnius Re. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Thanks. 
So we still have a few minutes to start in time our first keynote lecture. And I would like to uh, add that uh, three of our keynote lectures uh, who will speak on very different topics, but uh, the, this keynote uh, lecture series represents somehow also uh, collaboration and networking of Baltic musicologists with uh, Central, Western European and American musicological institutions. And uh, our first speaker, Dr. Uh, Zdravko Blazjakovic, is one of the leading uh, persons, leading scholars in the area of music iconography. Zdravko Blazjakovic is director of the Center for the Study of Music Iconography at the CUNY, City University of New York. Uh, also um, director of documentation center of the international uh, repertoire of uh, music literature, founder and editor in chief of the journal Music in Art, and also uh, creator and editor of the Brepol's publishing house monographic series Music and Visual Culture. So, Today we have this uh, start our conference from this intriguing keynote lecture on theater curtains and the decorations, please. Thank you, Ruta, and thank you, Rima, for having me here. It's a, it's a great pleasure and uh, especially, you know, Rima, you, you are so good in, in uh, where, where are you there? Uh, you are so good with organizing and sending all these uh, emails and it was really easy to uh, just be focused on the paper and come here. So thank you both for having me here. Theater curtains are not something that we think often about it and they are not really that important in our current theaters, but in the history, they were super important. So I thought that this is a new topic to open, and that's why I thought it's, it's interesting to bring it here. Figuratively speaking, theater curtain marks the starting and closing point of theatrical performance. At the beginning of the show, they mark the transition between real world and fictional world opening on the stage. And at the end of the performance, they bring us back from fictional fic fiction to our reality, allowing also to acknowledge the actors who made possible for us to dream the story presented on the stage. Curtains today, in most cases, are simple. Some more famous one, like the yellow curtain of the Metropolitan Opera or the curtain of the Royal Opera House in London, provide a sort of a trademark sign for their uh, uh, houses in, in big broadcasts. And we know from the curtain uh, at the beginning that this is, this is where the, the show is happening. However, uh, at present time, most curtains are bland and generally we hardly notice them. However, that has not been so in history. There has always been the case, and I thought that is interesting to, uh, there, uh, this has not always been the case, and I thought it's interesting to bring this, this here, because um, curtains in the past had ideological significance. With its prominent position in front of the audience, stage curtain is the most valuable piece of real estate in the theater, and theaters were using them in various ways. Their designation reflected the 19th century nationalism, romanticism, classicism, historicism. They teach us about theater history, art history, and social history. And they point out important segments of local identity, which may have been overlooked by uh, the outsiders. Not to mention, uh, as a footnote, that in America, they were used for advertising local businesses. So before the show, local businesses would go and, and hang on the curtain uh, advertisements for, uh, for their uh, new goods that they, they were offering in, in stores. 
It seems that the literature about stage cur uh, curtains has not been extensive. We find references about them in books on theater, theatrical architecture. There are some articles contextualizing the art on individual curtains. Information about them is occasionally available on websites of theaters that are proud to talk about them as uh, items documenting their local heritage. And the best information is often available in local newspapers. In this occasion, I will make a very broad uh, overview. I started with antiquity and I uh, end with the Staatsoper now. So the, I, I, brought, I brought here a few points uh, so you can, you can see how uh, theater curtains change over the over the history. So we start from antiquity. And uh, here is a Roman theater where the curtain emerged from a long pit located between the stage and the spectators. Here we have a reconstruction of the curtain. Um, uh, here, I will show you this, oops. Let's see. Uh, if, uh, oh, yeah, I should. Yeah. This is the reconstruction of the theater in Lyon, Roman theater. The curtain was made a long piece of fabric fixed by the upper end to a horizontal beam em embedded in the floor of the stage. This beam was carried by uh, masts, which rising unrolled the curtain uh, to, uh, to hide the stage. The curtain was manipulated with weights and contraweights uh, that you see on the, on the side, and we know that from archaeology. So we know the mechanism, but we don't know what was on the curtain. Was it painted? Was it not? This is all we know. So fast forward. Oops. Uh, Now we move to year 1565, which is probably the earliest theater curtain that we know of, uh, painted by Federico Zuccari for the wedding celebration of Prince Francesco de' Medici and Joanna of Austria, which was held in Florence on Christmas day, 1565. A splendid catch, a sketch for this curtain is at Uffizi. Uh, now, and it shows hunters in front of Florentine skyline viewed from the north. And that was the same view that the bride who was approaching the city had when she came to, to Florence. Although the curtain was used for the performance of the comedy La, La Cofarina by Francesco D'Ambra, its design did not have a role in supporting its dramaturgy but rather played a symbolic role in strengthening of the Florentine identity and uh, presenting it to the arriving bride. There is a little doubt that Francesco's father Cosimo con uh, conceived the curtain's uh, visual program, forecasting in practice actually curtains that were in Italy uh, painted for next several centuries. And now I move Again, uh, to Baroque curtains in 17th and early 17th, 18th century. We have more uh, information about uh, them, although all comes from reproductions. No curtain has been preserved. So um, theaters where these curtains used to hang at one time do not exist and, uh, uh, anymore. And in their examination, we must depend on rare engravings of theatrical uh, interiors or on prepa preparatory sketches that artists were making for curtain designs. Although these designs gave us an idea about the appearance of the curtain and about its iconography, we are missing their true impact that once they had on the proscenium uh, as images of theatrical interiors usually do not show the coloristic effects and do not reflect, uh, reflect the details included in the finished composition. Theaters at the time provided uh, a setting for 
courtly ceremonies. Theater as the representation my status with the glamour, power, and authority of the court included both in the performance on the stage and in the theatrical space with all the decorations. This is Teatro sulla Cortina in Vienna, which was built on the occasion of Emperor Leopold's marriage to the Spanish Infanta Maria Teresa in 1666 but opened two years later in 1668. Due to its enormous size, only most spectacular operas were performed here. On, uh, this is the image of uh, the performance that we often read in our history book, Il Pomodoro. And we see, see here above the proscenium hanging uh, heavy red curtains on the top. However, The theater, at least on occasions, employed also another painted curtain. Here we see on uh, either side of the proscenium um, mythological figures related to Habsburg House, Hercules, Pallas, Mer uh, Mercy, Justice, Constance, Merit, and Peace. And between them, there is this stage curtain uh, made for the performance of the opera Il Fuoco Eterno Custodito delle Vestili by Antonio Draghi, six years after Il Pomodoro that we have seen before. So uh, it seems that these two curtains were used at the same time. There was a regular curtain up and then there was this curtain uh, at the front that uh, reflected um, majesty of the theater and symbol Habsburg symbolism. The, curtains, the curtain here is not the red one, but the painted one. Cent a central character in the composition is Pallas Athena dressed in a courtly Baroque outfit. She's armed in her, uh, with her, uh, in her right hand with the long lens. In her left, she holds an oval shield with the gorgon covering its entire space. On her head is a helmet decorated with the ostrich feathers. And in the flamboyant uh, attack mode, she is free, uh, freeing, floating in the space, attacking with her lens the hostile monsters in front of her. They are godlessness, the monsters, godlessness, malice, disunity, and greed, all enemies of Habsburg's virtues. And at the top, there is a fama uh, carrying a banner with the beginning of Psalm 91 that says, Cadent a lettere tuo, in translation, uh, a thousand, um, actually, you can see the translation uh, here at the bottom of the screen. So uh, it's interesting that here you have mixture of uh, Christianity and reflecting and uh, mythology, but both reflecting the same housework message. The Teatro Sulla Cortina was demolished during the Ottoman the South on Vienna in 1683. And uh, for a while opera was performed at the court. And then in 1708 was opened a new opera with this curtain. This was a, a magnificent theater built uh, by Francesco Galli Bibiena. And luckily we have this engraving so we know how the proscenium was looking. Here in the middle, we have, um, I think I have, yes. In the middle, we have a Mars, uh, uh, Mars coming down. Uh, from the sky and Apollo coming up with his lira uh, from um, the, 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 the bottom and uh, Putti bringing instruments and uh, lens for Mars from the top. Uh, this, uh, be, and if we think here of a fam famous motto, Arte and Marte, reflecting that an excellent ruler must unite virtues of art and of the war. And this was a message that we find in uh, 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 textbooks for training and educating nobility in Italy since the Renaissance times. 
from the side. Uh, so, um, so that that's that's how much we have about Baroque, and then uh, I come to a little bit to say about articulation of theatrical space being. Uh, physical barrier separating the space for the spectators from the space for the performance. The curtain has a critically important role in the architectural articulation of the theatrical space. When the curtain is lowered, we experience one architectural space. And then when the curtain goes up, we are suddenly in a different theatrical space that is elongating and much longer. This effect is particularly striking, striking in theaters with our modern monochromatic uh, curtains, which visually close the space of the audit auditorium when the performance is not in progress. The illusionistic compositions painting on the surface of Rococo curtains diminish this effect virtually opening the space in front of the spectators in a similar way as the Rococo painted ceilings provided an illusion of extending the height of the hall or height of the church up endlessly to the sky. And so in churches, Baroque churches, we have this extension to the top. In Baroque theaters with the lowered curtain, we have extension in front of us. The figures placed on the very bottom of such curtains are seemingly physically close to the audience sitting in the auditorium. You will see that in a, in a second. The other figures in the composition often showing floating free in the gravitation of gravitational forces are operating in the celestial space and extending illusion of the open space. Even when the mythological subject does not call for celestial or divine figures coming from the sky, painters were including them in order to expand an illusion of the celestial spaciousness. After all, most of the curtains were painted by set designers who are masters of the theatrical perspectives and illusionistic compositions. The dramatic action at that time was not only happening on the ground, but also in the air, as actors were flying operated by the various kinds of machines. And still, this was still the case until early 19th century. We can see on some sketches for the uh, stage backdrops, suggestions, open urbanized space and at the back, gods are coming down uh, from a celestial space. So I wanted to, uh, to show you two very important, I think, and to me very, very uh, uh, dear uh, curtains. One is in Torino, the other one is Milano La Scala. Uh, the mythology remained the dominant topic of the uh, curtain decoration throughout the 18th century, although not every theater needed to, uh, to project on it allegories related to the royal patrons. We all know this, this picture for all uh, music history books and uh, books on, on opera. It's reproduced just everywhere. This is... Uh, uh, Theater Regio in Turin, which uh, was able to accommodate 2,500 spectators. And uh, it was famous throughout the Europe. Here is a different view of it. I was able to find a sketch for the curtain at uh, Galeria Sabauda. And uh, when I photoshopped, uh, curtain into the painting of uh, Graneri of the theater, the two perfectly matched. So it means that the proportions of both pictures are very realistic because, uh, so um, anyhow. So the curtain was painted by Bernardino Galliari uh, in, um, 1756, and this was the second curtain. Galliari displayed here his mastery of designing sets and the composition he created appears like an opera performance in progress with all characters involved with the story. 
um, I did not say this is a, a Bacchus coming to uh, to Naxos to meet Ariadne. The mythical story here turned into a, a busy festival of characters orbiting around Bacchus and around Ariadne. The visual perspectives goes deep, visually creating an existing extension of the stage floor of the lower part of the, compos the composition and suggesting an expansion uh, of the space and the three dimensionality of the uh, scene. The eye is drawing to this big tent that you see in, in the middle, uh, but uh, at the bottom, it, but we have here composition of two uh, biographies. At the bottom is biography of Dionys Dionysus, who is coming from India on, on his chariot um, and his uh, uh, leopards uh, at the front. Uh, and in the, in the middle is Ariadne with all characters going into the, the sky that are related to her biography. And you see how uh, characters at the bottom are kind of uh, characters related to the audience and it feels like from the audience uh, you have this impression that you can go from, from the audience and just walk into the curtain and uh, become part of the story. Um, I'm, I'm just thinking if I have uh, time I, I might uh, uh, you see, this is this is the curtain in in a little bit bigger the de details. You see at the bottom is a chariot of uh, Dionysus coming, and uh, at the end. So now I will move to second curtain of La Scala. Um, it was inspired by verses by Giuseppe Parini about Apollo descending from the sky. Uh, and he is pulling his chariot with the sun over, over the sky. There is a lot of going on on this, this curtain. Uh, and each day detail tells its own story. A coloristic contrast cuts the composition into two segments. There is uh, this Apollo segment uh, divided by the dark segment of the tree and then all these characters walking and uh, dancing down below. Uh, first, I should try, you see, I have a few details so you can see better what is going on. Here, um, we come to the muses uh, that are at the bottom. Um, they are on the, on the slopes of the hill around uh, the author of genius of Italy. Talia is lighting the fire on the altar. Euterpe is tuning the, the lyre um, on, the, on the right. Tersihore is moving to initiate the dance and Melpomene is giving principle of, uh, principles of tragic action, holding a club in one hand and mask in the other. On the altar around, it's it's very hard to see, but if you enlarge the picture, you see there are uh, names of these three figures. They are Metastasio, Salieri, and Vittorio Alfieri. Next to to this this altar, you see on 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 the bigger picture there is a, a second group of muses. Urania, Polymnia, Calliope, Cleo, and Erato, and they are gathering around the mon uh, monument of immortality. And uh, they are discussing the list on the monument, which you cannot see the, the, on the painting, the, because the painting is a sketch prepared for painting the curtain, and it's today at La Scala Museum. But luckily we have, uh, uh, um, engraving of the curtain that was produced after the curtain was painted. And on that engraving, we can actually see the names that were written on, on the monument. And uh, they are on one list, uh, are set designers, Bibiena, Bernardo Galliari, and Giovanni Perico. Uh, 
Ah, uh, and a choreographer, Gaspar, Gasparo Angelini. On the second list uh, included the composers, Antonio Sacchini, Nicola Piccini, Guglielmi, Paisiello, Cimarosa, and two castrato singers, uh, Vito Giuseppe Milico and Giuseppe Aprile. So, more important, in the center of the painting is this procession of, uh, uh, of allegories. Just let me come back to, to this so you see, see where, what we are talking. It's this group on the, in, the, in the corner. And uh, at the beginning is a sculpture which uh, has Genietto holding a relief of effigy of Michelangelo. After that is architecture holding a list with names you see at the, at the top. Uh, and on the list are names of Vitruvius, Andrea Palladio, Sebastiano Serlio, Vincenzo Scamozzi, Giuseppe Barozzi da Vignola. They are mostly, uh, except Vitruvius, uh, Italian Renaissance architecture, uh, uh, architects. After that uh, comes paintings, a painting, allegory of painting with the portrait of Raffaello. You see, she is holding it down. down. Uh. Then comes astronom uh, Mimesis holding a stick with theatrical masks representing the three theatrical genres. And then comes Astronomia holding high up Galileo's telescope. You see, she is on the corner of the, of the under the monument. Then comes Dramatica holding a lyre in the right hand and script in the left. Then comes Mechanica holding in one hand Archimedean cylinder and sphere. And his, her Genietto is carrying Archimedes a screw. And all that is happening under the attentive eye of Pallas Athena who is placed uh, above them. Uh, on one side, from the group of allegories are uh, uh, four genietti who are uh, with holding wreath, laurel wreath, waiting for future artists to be crowned. And, uh, and on the side uh, is Doric column with Fama standing on the top. And behind this is River, River Tiber holding a scepter and laurel wreath in one arm and cornucopia in the other. A, co uh, a comparison here with the Roman iconography of the River Tiber as the god Tiberinus is obvious. And um, obviously it's, uh, this, uh, it's a reference to Rome, Caput Mundi of Italian art and sciences. And uh, in the middle is this Veduta of, Ro of ancient Rome. And uh, I don't want to go into it, but each building is specific building. It's not just uh, some uh, out sky outline. It's a specific building and we know for each, each one. So this composition reflected uh, this composition reflected the political reality of the time. In August 1814, succeeding years of the Napoleonic administration, the new Austrian administration in Milan banned public meetings in private homes. And that made boxes of La Scala a convenient place for confidential political discussions of the liberal aristocrats and upper bourgeoisie planning the Italian independence. Don't forget, at that time, La Scala uh, boxes had the curtains. So you could close the curtain and you could have a conversation behind that nobody knows what, who, whom you are talking and what you are talking. Um, Precisely at the time when the new curtain was being conceived and installed, some of the most prominent intellectuals in Milan involved with the Carbonari movement were making plans for the unification of Italy under the crown of Savoy. 
These Milanese intellectuals have not perceived Italy anymore only as a ge geographical concept, but also as a region with the common culture, language, and the art. And that is reflected in allegories of art and sciences represented on the curtain. The Mount Parnassus is the Italian Parnassus here, not anymore uh, ancient Parnassus. Talia is lighting fire on altar of genius of Italy. Uh, and this author is made, uh, marked by Italian artists, Metastasia, Salieri, and Alfieri. The muses are not distributing their artistic inspiration from the Castalian Spring, but from the river Tiber. And uh, so here we have a situation that uh, two narratives merge together. One narrative is ancient mythological narrative with muses, Apollos, and so on. And the other narrative are uh, uh, allegories of arts, and those are Italian arts. So here is a concept of unified Italy in Milano. And what is important here is that uh, this is the first time, or almost the first time, or the first time in such a grand scheme that we have uh, historical references to real events that are not mytholo mythology anymore. And from now on, mythology, mythology with some exception is left behind and curtains depict real events. And uh, so now I will move on to curtains of 19th century Italy. And uh, those, those curtains come out from this second curtain of La Scala. And I think that is a very important curtain in the history of Italian theatrical design. So in, uh, throughout the 19th century in Italy, there are three big, one is medieval topics, historical topics related to history of individual places. The other topic, much larger, is antiquity. And the third topic that is little, uh, the most representative curtain is in uh, Naples, uh, Italian Parnassus, uh, uh, myth mytholo fictional, uh, places of uh, Italian artists, Dante, Petrarca, and so on. So I will now just quickly show you a few curtains showing med medieval subjects. Teatro Piccini, uh, you can see under the picture what, what it represents. Um, This curtain is interesting because, uh, you know, Italian uh, uh, theaters at that time, they were not huge. So uh, curtains were also a little bit smaller than, than we would think in our biggest uh, theaters now. So this curtain is today moved to, to City Hall in uh, Trani. And you see it here in uh, how it looks during the uh, meeting of the Sindaco. Uh, so now we come to the classical world, which is to me, uh, this, is, this is the topic that I am right now working. I have been able to identify 29 curtains in Italy um, that deal with classical topics and one in Corfu because it's a Italian theater in, in Greece. Uh, many of these curtains have been lost, some in bombing of the World War II and some in, uh, I, should, I should explain uh, that uh, in 19th century theaters did not have a stage curtain, a stage tower. So for, before every performance, a, th a curtain was rolled up and after the performance was rolled down. 
And of course, that causes damage to the uh, uh, curtain. The other thing is that the theaters were light, lighted with, with the candles. So there was a lot of small smoke in the theater. And because of that, uh, curtains have to be changed every 20, 30, 40 years. And because of that, the, uh, curtains were never part of architectural uh, concept because curtains were something that comes and go, that, that is used. So many of these curtains we don't have anymore, and we know them from sketches, or uh, more importantly, what is interesting uh, from postcards uh, from the 50s or from before World War II. And uh, so it's, it's interesting for uh, thinking about our material culture, uh, how important the postcards could be a document about something that is that doesn't exist here. So I will show a few of the ancient scenes. Uh, Pliny uh, dying during the eruptions of Vesuvius in uh, Como. This is this is a little earlier than than uh, La Scala, and probably the earliest curtain with antiquity that I can find. There are three curtains that I found: Julius Caesar crossing the Rubicon River. This one is uh, on uh, just a um, carton. Uh, we don't have a curtain anymore. This one is in Rimini. Curtain does exist, as you see, but there is no picture. I cannot find the picture because curtain is down. And when curtain is down, you cannot take a picture. Uh, so here is one postcard that actually tells us how the curtain uh, looked like. And this is the third Julius Caesar on a horse crossing the Rubicon. Uh, and th this, this one is interesting to me in a small town, San Saverio Marche. Um, and it's interesting uh, to see how iconography uh, merges with local identity and with current archeology. span When the, th the theater was reconstructed in 1828, a group of city intellectuals decided to dedicate it to the Roman goddess Feronia, whose, whose temple stood nearby. And Feronia was a patron of wildlife, fertility, health, and abundance. And um, at the same time, they found two, um, how you call it, um, inscriptions talking about an elite woman, noble woman, Camorena Calar Calarina. And she is here in front of the temple. Um, she, is, she was the priestess at the temple. And at that time, they found these two inscriptions. And as you see, they put them on the curtain. Uh, so you see, this is, this is interesting to me how the real life merges with the, with the theatrical life and uh, it all underl underlines the local identity. And here are a few more uh, dedication of Chita Vecchia curtain that has been destroyed, doesn't exist, lost uh, after World War II. And here is its reconstruction. Um, another Gelone uh, grand piece. Uh, Hannibal escaping from, uh, from Spoleto. Um, Belisarius liberating Orvieto. You see, some some still exist in in theaters. Some some uh, are not, but uh, the, the, to me they are they are so beautiful, and uh, I wish we can see it when we go to the to see the performance. So it is striking that even after the unification of Italy, we do not see uh, on curtains representing recent events. It's all going back to antiquity. 
and uh, just let me look at the, the time. Oh, uh, uh, first is a, a real, uh, first uh, reality is reflecting a historical and cultural micro identity of the place. Theaters were for the Italian towns their most important cultural center. And the curtain was within the theater the most important visual object. And th this object is uh, where the focus of the attention of the audience is, is coming to. The painting narrative on the curtains had the purpose to build the myth about the origin of the place. They often represent the earliest significant event from the municipal history, manufacturing and then validating the origin of the place in a similar way as Romulus and Rem mark the beginning of Rome. So every town in Italy wanted to have its uh, historical, mythological, ancient beginning. And this is what the curtains were, were showing. The other reflection of this painting concerns, concerns the artistic side and the place in the opus of their artists. Some of the painters of these compositions works, worked as scenographers, but most were important local artists. And these curtains were often the largest and most important commissions they ever received during the life. You cannot get the more important commission than painting the largest curtain that you, you, could, you could have. But what is happening? These curtains are missing from the canon of uh, 19th century historicist paintings in, in Italy. Because they are so large, you cannot bring them to an exhibition. They are often destroyed they are often rolled up and nobody can see it. So this entire segment is missing from Italian 19th century historicist uh, uh, art history. And this is, this is important for us to bring them back to the canon because they are important paintings. Now, Comodino. Uh, Comodino was a special second curtain in Italian towns. Uh, because, uh, as I said, the, this big curtain you are rolling up and ro rolling down, communication between the audience and the theater is complicated. You cannot just go through the curtain. So there was a, the, the big curtain would go up and then there was a second curtain uh, that you see had a, usually entrance. So it's, it's easier to communicate with, with the, the, the uh, actors with the, the stage. And uh, let's see, so, so, and they, they usually don't have a specific topic. They are just, uh, um, so now I move to Central Europe that uh, most of you know. And uh, I would just, just for the orientation, I would say that in 1885, Austro-Hungary, France, England, Germany, Russia, and North America in total had 302 theaters. That leaves out Italy and Spain. By 1926, in 40 years, number of theater increased to 2,500, so huge. Um, by 1926, theaters did not have uh, painted curtains anymore. So that's, that's the reason why we don't think it's painted curtains are not in our memory now because most theaters do not have them. Only old theaters have them and only theaters that are uh, where they survived. And very often uh, they survived in smaller theaters better than in large theaters, but because in smaller theaters, there was no performance every night. So they were rolled up and rolled down less often than in the big theaters. 
So Central European theaters uh, also dealt with the pres uh, presentation of historical themes in their curtains, but in a different way. They are representing usually national uh, history. And I will just show three. Here is a Tbilisi uh, that uh, on one side, I, I will just shorten a little bit. On, on, on one side, it shows personification of Russia, uh, Russia. On the other side, personification of Georgia. It was painted around 1851. Uh, on the left is Moscow and Kremlin. On the right is Georgia and its castles. And then a uh, curtain of national uh, Narodny Divadlo in Prague painted in 1981. And it's a, an allegory of the national embodiment Slavia receiving gifts from a Czech, from the Czech nation. And then of course I have to show you something Croatian. It's a very famous Croatian uh, curtain, uh, which was so iconic in uh, uh, communist times that it was reproduced even on boxes of chocolate on the top, and uh, since it it, it it enforced uh, Croatian nationalism, it was not really uh, popular in with the uh, administration and the government. So these uh, tops of the of the of the chocolate you would see hanging in people's houses because it was a representation of Croatian nationalism. Um, so uh, I will just move on a little bit on imperial theaters, of course. And here is St. Petersburg with the big uh, 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 Russian insignia. And then there is a, a folks opera in Vienna, which I am not, it's, it's, it has a, a lot, a lot to do there, but uh, and it was painted for Franz Joseph's 50th uh, anniversary of, of, of um, crowning, and I am not going to into detail because I want to show something else. Uh, and of course, we have a uh, uh, Royal Opera House that, uh, when Queen Elizabeth died, lost its its insignia, and now we wait. We are waiting for the new insignia of Charles the Third. Uh, you see it as soon as she died, it was blackened. Charles Garnier. So this is, this is I have two more important points and then I close. Uh, Charles Garnier, architect of uh, Paris Opera. And uh, he pretty much changed the concept of theater curtain. And Wagner was the, the other one. So when he was building uh, Paris Opera, he published a large book about architectural features of different parts of the theater. And of course, there is a chapter on, uh, on the curtain. He starts the chapter describing curtains in the ancient theaters and goes on to outline the possibility used in the 19th century. He considered that the fabric which falls down straight and without faults does not have a great appearance. And I think he was right in that. For him, velvet is the best fabric because it has well composed folds reflecting the light in different directions. He thought that if the curtain has only vertical folds, which go in the same direction, it resembles organ pipes. And if, if it is too monotonous to, to be attractive in front of the audience. So um, to make the velvet curtain richer and more varied, it is necessary to break with vertical lines with some horizontal and oblique folds that can move the whole assembly and give more wealth and freedom. Such a hanging could have a great effect and it could produce a, a much more noble and splendid front of the room. And voila, this is what he did. It's, uh, you would think that this is, this is folded like this, but this is a painted curtain like this. And he explained why because there are some practicalities there. 
This kind of horizontal and vertical folding of the fabric combined with added twists and draperies will make a curtain thick and heavy. And at the top of the stage, you have only limited space for the curtain. So you do not have a space there because uh, it, you don't have only one curtain at the top. You have main curtain. You might have um, uh, leave uh, a space for Harlequin curtain. Harlequin curtain is the one that uh, closes the, sp the, the space of the proscenium's because for some shows, uh, proscenium should have be is narrower and for some is larger. And then you might have curtains that uh, are painted for a specific show. Because of such problems, it is more convenient to have a painted curtain which can bend easily, it costs less, and it's easier to install. So he calls this simulated hanging, tenure simulé. Although the curtain of the opera looks convincingly three-dimensional, it's actually two-dimensional and painting by the opera scenographers, August Alfred Roubaix and Philip Caperon. So um, we've, this, this was, of course, it's a Paris opera. So this was such a uh, uh, influential design that we find it all over Europe and Latin America. Uh, 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 you see it's, uh, Suddenly, oops, here. Now we come to our friend Richard, because how would we talk about anything theater without uh, mentioning him? Um, in, in normally in 19th century, the uh, curtain went up and down. Up and down, it was rolled rope. Wagner did not like this. This it's it, in theater. It's called fly curtain. Wagner did not like this, and he, for his uh, 1850 uh, production of Lohengrin in, in Weimar, he proposed a curtain that separates in the middle. And uh, by the time uh, he started uh, building a festival house in Bayreuth, he per perfected this. And this is now in theatrical uh, language called Wagner Vorhang, and it's patented, and, uh, at the, and it has a German patent numbered in 56920. Just uh, and probably Wagner is the only composer that has a patent on 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 uh, a piece of theatrical equipment. The problem is that we do not precisely know what had been designed, the how has been designed the original Bayreuth curtain, because the original sets for the Nibelung set were, were taken down uh, in 1882 and shipped with uh, impresario Angelo Neumann to first to London and Hamburg and Leipzig and ended up in Prague. And they were used until 1927 with the uh, sets the, the curtain also uh, went down and it was sent to all these places and we do not know what, uh, how it looked. Uh, uh, the original lifting mechanism in Bayreuth was used until 1961 and then it was replaced and modernized and Wolfgang Wagner uh, installed in uh, a reconstruction in 1990s, but we do not have original. Uh, so all we know, we know, we can go by uh, notes about it. And the best note about it is by Adolf Appiah, who says, with such sure instincts, Wagner chose a very stiff material and gave even more momentum to the mighty fold lines by making the lower edge even stiffer. Then he had the curtain painted in a soft, dark shade of color that roughly matched the walls of the hall. Again, the harmonic impression is perfect and the eye remains fully satisfied. Wagner was still missing a connection line between the spectators and the stage action. 
At the moment when the curtain is divided, the spectator should not have felt sudden jolt. Rather, his eye should gently slide out into the world of the dream. Wagner therefore made the line across the curtain, a kind of high border. Thin line gives the viewer an impression about the height of persons on the stage. During the orchestral prelude, the viewer has the, the line in mind and unconsciously gets used to the scale of its uh, suggestion. When the curtain opens, the performance appear considerably under the line. What creates among the spectators a subconscious detachment, intensifying the impression of a dreamlike situation. Luckily, we have one picture of the curtain. And you see that this curtain uh, does not have one line that Apia is talking about, but it's all has horizontal lines. Uh, um, and of course, we always need to look at music. And in the uh, Rheingold uh, uh, first act, you see a uh, 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 note where curtain goes up. And then you see up there uh, in woodwinds, second violins and cellos. It's a little bit out of uh, sync because it needed for a curtain mechanism to react. And if you push the button for curtain in the right place, curtain should go up at the same time when the uh, um, second violin and cellos uh, have this glissando. So, and I close now with what is happening now. Museum is progress, which is a beautiful project. In um, Staatsoper in Vienna, Every year starts the season for six weeks with uh, its regular fire curtain. And then at the end of October installs a, a, a curtain that is commissioned by some leading important artists specifically for that season. And you see here, this is, this is interesting because Garnier talks in, in his book uh, that he has considered if Paris Opera should have a mirror in front as a curtain, so uh, entire auditorium would reflect and auditorium would be twice as long as big because it would be reflection in the mirror. But then he decided that this would be too heavy and too hard to move, so he abolished the idea. But uh, Staatsoper curtain in 2001 had precisely that, that idea. It was a photograph. And you were sitting in the in the auditorium, looking same theater, same auditorium over there. And here I show you a few of uh, the Staatsoper curtains uh, for every year. Uh, um, that is up there. Uh, it's fixed with magnets on on the iron curtain. And now we are waiting what is going to be installed next week in uh, uh, here. And uh, this is the end. Thank you, Zdravko, very much for your rich talk. And we have a few minutes for discussion, comments, and questions. Please. Please, Antonio. Thank you very much. Thank you, Strafko, for the very stimulating um, appeal also for, you know, material culture, which sometimes um, um, is neglected and that we actually need to uh, include in our research and I really appreciate that and it's a great talk. Actually I have a question regarding your interpretation about the classic, classicist um, iconography in Italy. You always were talking that this is kind of history um, or looking back to something. Can't we also kind of interpret that 
uh, given the fact that actually the classical monuments and all what was classical Roman was present there. So it was in there. Well, when you go out of, on the street and you see the Colosseum, excuse me, that's reality. So um, how do you actually deal with this kind of um, simultaneity of the non simultaneity because in a certain way when i go out to a street and i see a roman um, um, monument this is part of my reality also in the 1820s in the 1840s of the 1860s so it's not really history or gone away or whatever so it, it actually it is included in my everyday life so that's why i think maybe we could also think from another perspective when looking at the classicist topics uh, in the curtains in the, <coughs> in the early 19th century Yes, uh, that's true, because Feronia uh, that I, I showed uh, the, it was it was a reflection of specifically that archaeological excavation there a few years earlier, so it was direct communication, and all these these theaters had had histo uh, the, the the composition had a historical reconstruction of but it's a fake reconstruction, so it's. Uh, imagination uh, but that reconstruction starts anchors the the beginning of the place and like uh romulus and rain we don't know if if the wolf was really there in the forest so this is how we don't know really if this is uh, uh visual constructions real were really like that and probably not uh, so, but they started, they marked the identity, local identity, local history uh, of the place. And they are very important for the place because uh, that, that's, uh, uh, you know, I don't know if, if uh, what do I say in Croatia, what, what is that event that marks like that, you know, it's probably 19th century curtain that I showed you, but it's, it's not antiquity, it's 19th century. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I wanted to ask about this, the last examples you showed from Vienna Staatsopera. And uh, they show that uh, I think it's like a kind to keep attention of the audience, uh, uh, what else uh, the, the curtain will present uh, next season, next season. So they, they like change the curtain, change the, the image on the curtain. Uh, uh, quite often, but uh, the tendency in the theaters, is it more uh, uh, used uh, to stable curtains, like uh, static curtains, or like this, like in Vienna Stadtsopper? Uh, do you have, uh, do you know more examples? No, like this? no, this uh, is, this is a unique uh, one that I know. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, theaters do specific curtains for specific performance. But that's a different, different thing. And this Vienna, uh, that's why I think it's so beautiful because it turns uh, theater into art gallery. And it's a uh, one, uh, one piece art gallery. And you see this, this one piece and uh, some are really beautiful. Some I did not like, but some are really, really beautiful. There has been published uh, a year ago, a book, a monograph about all artists and all concepts behind each curtain. And it's very, very interesting uh, piece. Beata Boblinskine. Yes. Uh, dear Zdravka, thank you very much for your so excited excursion through the epoch, uh, many epochs and many countries, uh, uh, especially for the excursion um, through the Italian theaters in the past. And I'd like to ask you about the modern tendencies in Italian theaters uh, for decorated curtains today? I don't know there are any, they are just the red, red curtains. Uh, because uh, you see in, in, in La Scala, in uh, this curtain that I showed you came to an end, it deteriorated in uh, about 1860. And they were planning to do a new curtain and there are, have been preserved three sketches for new curtains. 
and there has been a preserved uh, sketch from Torino for the third uh, uh, curtain. Uh, but at that time, curtains uh, were, uh, it was considered that there is a conflict between image on the curtain and the performance that is following because image on the curtain puts you in the wrong mood. And for example, in, in uh, Vienna in 18, 70s, they had two curtains, one with Orpheus that was showing, uh, that was uh, used for opera performances, and one mostly decorative with dancers, nothing really, no, no topic, for uh, comic operas and light shows. So, um, and it was uh, the Ariadne uh, curtain, apparently the subject was uh, conceived because there are so many performances talking about weddings and marriage and love. So this Ariadne and Naxos put you in a mood for another performance of uh, look on the screen, some love story. So the, the until 1860s and 70s, uh, curtains were, uh, some curtains, not, not this historical curtains, they, they have the different purpose, but uh, curtains were introducing audience into the show that is following. And then from Garnier, from Wagner, curtain is just a blend and it should not interfere and conflict with the uh, plot that is following. So that's why curtains today mostly don't have a paint, are not painted. But for some reasons, the only th theater that I know in Zagreb, there are seven curtains. And some were commissioned in 1970s and 19, uh, 1960s and 70s. And I wish somebody in Zagreb would do a, a study why, what happened there that, that theater was spending money commissioning curtains. I don't know. And it's kind of a bizarre situation for me. Totally unusual. Thank you very much. Now, Beata. Uh, thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. And uh, only one remark, um, we have our big composer and painter, Mikolaos Konstantinos Chirlonis, mm -hmm. uh, maybe you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, in his museum in Kaunas, we have also one curtain that he depicted for, for one performance or, or some, something else. And so I think that we must um, pay more attention to this curtain because maybe it represents some myth of the place. And so it is important. Yes, Yes, absolutely. This is, uh, I should go back. I was there, Ruta, they took me two days ago there. And now I have to go back. <laughs> so, Camille. <coughs> Thank you very much. That was really very interesting. Uh, I have a question regarding the fabrics of the curtains. Was there a change in fabric over time, and what was? I don't know. You know, but uh, I mean, in I don't know if in in Baroque what was you know because we have only etchings uh, of it. In in nineteenth century they were painted by painters, so they they used just a heavier. Um, uh, linen, canvas. And it's interesting in a curtain in Salto in um, Uruguay that uh, on the back of the curtain, it's very thick, and on the back of the curtain, uh, they were pasting uh, program bills of performances. So now the curtain at the back has entire archives, a, a history of performances happening there. And it's a big problem for them because they need to restore the curtain. And uh, how do you restore the curtain when you have all these programs pasted at the back and somebody from 1930s and 40s and some are signed and they, they, they don't know what to do. This is the curtain that I showed the, the last one at the end. So, okay, we are already out of time, but I have yes. one question related to your last answer, uh, because speaking of musical heritage, uh, we used to think about reconstruction. Yes, and you uh, mentioned that many historical curtains were lost, 
uh, do you know more you know initiatives to reconstruct historical curtains and to use or to represent somewhere i i know that only from Ita uh, websites of Italian towns, uh, theaters, and every theater that has a curtain is very proud to put this curtain and show it. You know, this one curtain moved from the theater to the city hall. Uh, so if they have a curtain, they are very proud. And in the last, I know that only from, from websites where they, they describe the history of the curtain, that in last 10, 15 years, they were restoring uh, every curtain they could find. And, and most of them you don't see on every show, of course, they are shown over special, special occasions. So thank you very much. And now we have a short coffee break and later we'll continue our commentaries and discussions on visuality of music culture. So welcome to the first session, uh, or is it second session? And uh, let me introduce you Daniela Castaldo from Università del Salento in Lecce. And her paper is The Look of the Early Modern Travelers on the West African Music from 16th to the 18th century. Uh, good morning. and. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to, 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 to thank the organizers to give me the opportunity to present here, to be here for the first time in Vilnius and to present my research. And uh, now I'm switching to a completely different topic. And uh, I will speak uh, about, the, uh, about the music in the uh, travelers uh, of early modern age, uh, the travelers to Africa. And uh, the western coast of Africa, particularly those on the Gulf of Guinea, were systematically explored from the mid 15th century, first by Portuguese, then by the Dutch and English, who were interested in trading in gold, ivory, pepper, and then slaves. Written accounts of these yearly travels aroused great curiosity in the European public, as evinced by the rapid increase in the production of geographical literature and maps from the 16th century. Travel narratives and reports, both those written by the direct observers and those compiled by publishers and scholars on the basis of direct testimony and earlier works, became highly successful publications, printed and reprinted in large numbers and translated into all the major European languages. These chronicles became the main means enabling the Western audiences to approach Africa and to learn not only about the geography, flora and fauna of the different regions explored, but also about the customs and culture of their inhabitants. Among the elements that aroused the traveler's curiosity were also sounds events. In the chronicles, we find more or less a detailed annotation on the organological features and sonorities of musical instruments and sound objects never seen before, on the ways in which musicians played and related to each other, on the rituals and ceremonies where musical and sound events took place. This evidence, although through the filter of the Western point of view and its prejudices about this culture other, are also particularly significant for the modern scholar. Indeed, they make it possible to recover the historical dimension of the sound events concerning the modern descendants of those ancient people, which constitute the object of study of ethnomusicology. Chronicles of travels to Africa rather rarely were accompanied by plates illustrating the text. The iconographic apparatus when present was of great impact and was an added value to the book because in a very effective and immediate way, it helped to create in the reader's imagination the visual model of the description provided by the text. 
and that, that would remain as a cultural and visual stereotype until the result of the 19th century. If, however, the description were more or less directly inspired by the experience of the observer, the engravers making the, uh, the, these plates had not seen directly what was described in the text, and therefore didn't have a specific visual language able to describe the variety of new things and peoples described in the text. So they used the visual language of Western classical and Renaissance tradition that instead they knew very well. And they reproduced scenes showing exotic contents through classical forms, thus very imaginative and far from the reality. In this paper, I would like to discuss some aspects of the relation between the text and the images in some of the earliest travel narrative dealing with Africa. One of the first chronicles of travels to Africa accompanied by illustration was the Relazione del Reame del Congo et delle Circonvicine Contrade by the Italian humanist Filippo Pigafetta. The work, written in Italian, was published in Rome in 1591. It included a detailed description of the places, customs, and habits, as well as the natural resources of the various regions covered, and was accompanied by eight illustrations, probably designed by the Roman printer Natale di Bonifazio. One of these uh, one of these pass one of these um, passages, uh, one of these plates uh, included in this book illustrates the passage in which the army of the inhabitants of the Congo, the Machi Congos, and the musical instruments are used to transmit orders during military action are mentioned. According to the text, the musical instruments used in the army would be basically of three types, drums made from the wood of three trunk with the end covered by leather and beaten with ivory stick, uh, hollow object in the shape of an inverted pyramid made of metal foil, uh, on which they beat with a wooden stick and which would produce a hoarse and horrible and warlike sound, and ivory trumpets with a side mouth made from elephant tusks, whose music was used to incite to uh, soldiers to uh, face danger. In the picture, here I have the picture, the drum and the inverted cone shape instruments are illustrated. The figure in the center holds a bow and is indicated by the inscription Habit of the Soldiers. Habit of the Soldier. He wears a headdress adorned with beard feathers to make the man larger and of fearful semblance and chains hanging across his chest on either side. From the belt are attached bells that rings when the warriors moves or fights and whose sound serves to instill courage during the confrontation against enemies. The character and landscapes represented in these plates, although they accompany text described in distant and, and exotic words, nevertheless display Western characteristics. In fact, the engravers who made these images had never seen the reality they were depicting and thus sought to adapt their Western visual models of reference to the exotic and unknown realities described. Thus, uh, they reproduce these exotic and new contents through classical forms. Here, here, for example, the landscape in the background of the figures uh, with the hills and the town with towers and surrounded by walls. It is similar from a uh, Renaissance, from the, the, those we can find in a Renaissance painting. Similarly, although Pigafetta emphasized that Africans have a black skin, nevertheless, in the images that they are depicted with the European features, with a light skin and with great emphasis given to the anatomical details according to the classical and Renaissance figurative convention that were the reference model of the engravers. Seven years later, the work, this work was translated into Latin and uh, became the first part of a vast collection of travel reports published between 1590 and 1634 by the Belgian engraver Theodore de Brie and by his family, of course. 
The collection consisted of 29 volumes divided into the series India Occidentalis, Le Grand Voyage, mainly concerning the Americas, and the India Orientalis, Le De Petit Voyage, with the travel accounts of Asia and, Af and Africa. The specificity and value of the collection is mainly due to the beautiful and high quality engravings illustrating the travel reports. The 600, 600 images of the Debris collection had a very strong impact on the public because it allowed Europeans to visualize for the first time the travelers' accounts. As for the illustration, Debris has, had never traveled overseas and was neither a geographer nor an erudite humanist. So his engravings were simply copied from the pictures in the original edition or copied from illustration included in other texts, even focusing on different topics. In addition, he used to recopy some details, in some details in context other than the original, following a modus operandi common to the illustrators of this type of text. Here, for example, you have the cover of this edition, the Brie edition, and uh, uh, for example, um, uh, he takes this detail of these warriors with the chains and uh, feather on the on the and uh, on the head and on the, and, and with uh, bells uh, uh, on the belt uh, um, and uh, he recopied uh, in the, the, the cover, here we have the, the, the detail, in, and he recover also this, the, the recopy the same uh, picture in another uh, picture included in the test uh, showing a, a warrior hunting. You see exactly the same. So it was uh, the, this picture or the details of these pictures were copied and recopied in several places, in several um, to, to, to illustrate different passages of the same text. Um, the place accompanies, uh, accompanying this early travel were copied several times and included in different books, even focusing on different topics. This is, is, is interesting. And often they become more important than the text in which they were originally included, acquiring their own autonomy from it. So they, they add uh, uh, their own la uh, life in some way. The images allowed the readers to approach the exotic and, uh, and uh, 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 the exotic uh, unknown and other African world in a more direct and uh, evocative way than words, and contributed to the creation of the European imaginary of Africa and of its inhabitants. And this imaginary created and aroused by, by these pictures. Um, was uh, 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 this, this imaginary for many years would have been full of prejudice and stereotypes, but it lasted for, 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 for many, many years. Um, and it was filtered by the filter of both the viewer, by both the, the traveler and the uh, uh, um, uh, illustrator of this text. The first representation of dark-skinned Africans would appear as iconographic accompany to maps printed in early 17th century in the Dutch area. Here you have, for example, the map by, by, by uh, Willem Blau in 1630. You have uh, the um, um, in which images of Africans from different regions and intent on different activities appear along the sides. The pair of figures representing Congo here um, in the lower left corner identified with the inscription Soldier of Congo, Miles Congensis, is evidently inspired by the Pigafetta debris table. Indeed, we once again find the warrior with the feathered address. Chain on the chest and belt of bells, uh, who is conversing with a woman taking from the debris table two here, illustrating the cost, the, 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 um, the character, um, the character of the women uh, of Congo. The sixth part of the Petit Voyage, Voyage contains an account of another expedition, the expedition by the Dutch navigator and trader Peter de Mares, 
Here is a, uh, I, I go back a moment back. This is uh, the version, the Dutch translation of the Pigafetta count uh, uh, about Congo. And you can see for the first time the, uh, the, 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 the African with the black skin. And you see that this representation is a, um, uh, a variation uh, from, the original, from the original picture we saw at the beginning. This is uh, uh, Peter de Mares. The six parts of the Petit Voyage contains an account of the expedition that the Dutch navigator and trader Peter de Mares made to West Africa between, one, uh, between um, uh, 16 and 1601 in the region known at that time as a Gold Coast and corresponding in part to the present day Ghana. In the Maris account, there are several annotations on the uses of musical instruments of the natives, some of them are accompanied by illustrations. The author reports several sound events taking place, for example, during sacrifices, here, for example, um, during sacrifices to their divinities. Here you have this drum, for example, these people playing drum, or during the um, uh, ceremony of investiture of the no noble people. Here he is the candidate and uh, is, uh, uh, here there are some people uh, playing in this uh, horn and some uh, women beating on sticks with uh, these uh, discs of, uh, of bronze. And uh, the same instruments uh, is played here in occasion of funerals. You can say here the women playing this uh, disc, uh, beating on these beast, discs, and also holding this uh, instrument uh, um, consisting in, do, in two bells connected. Um, so uh, at the end of the, 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 the narration by Peter de Mars, uh, there is uh, the um, description of Benin City. Benin City uh, was uh, the capital of a powerful and, and prosperous kingdom discovered by Portuguese navigator Guao Alfonso de Alvero in 1485. The, auto, this, uh, the town was very, very powerful, very rich, and the author describes the king's court. When the noblemen arrive to the court to honor the king, they are followed by servants and musicians playing drum and horse. This is the, the text by De Mares. The custom and musical instrument mentioned by the Mares about Benin City, such as a horn with a side mouthpiece that we already seen in this uh, representation, bells with a triangular base, and uh, the egogo, an ivory instrument in the shape of an inverted cone, are also represented in some of the scenes illustrated on the metal plaque placed as a decoration of the city's most important building. The metal plaque I'm saying about are this one. These plaques were devoted to commemorate the king, the Oba of Benin, and the court dignitaries and soldiers by representing their military deeds, and thus constitute a very important source for reconstructing the cultural, social, and dynastic history of Benin. Here we have some example of this plaque of, made of bronze put on the, on the top of the most important building in Benin uh, uh, town and two in Benin city to, uh, to, to um, uh, commemorate the deeds of, this, uh, uh, of the king. And of course, here the soldiers play several instruments we already mentioned, like for example, this horn. Here you have the, date, the details. There is the king in the middle and different uh, you see here the detail. And it is interesting to uh, notice that uh, this uh, plaque are uh, coeval uh, as the uh, um, text by the Mares. Uh, so they are really important uh, uh, sources for reconstructing their history. And uh, here you have, for example, this bell with uh, the square, uh, square uh, base and uh, again the uh, trumpet here, uh, this horn. 
And uh, um, this plaque, uh, um, this and other va valuable objects made of metal and ivory, such as the statues depicting human figures, heads and animals, ornaments and different kinds of objects, were first brought to Europe after 1897. Here. In these years, the British, who controlled the region, burned and looted the city of Benin and the royal palace, bringing back to England a thousand of objects for cult and ceremonial purposes, now at the British Museum. And among these objects, here you can see this picture very uh, meaningful, I think. Here are the Benin bronze plaque at the British Museum. Uh, 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 about a thousand of these plaque are uh, now in that the British Museum and in other museums in Europe. And among this object, there are also musical instruments. Here you can find, for example, this uh, uh, kind of horn we, we have spoken uh, before. Uh, it is made of uh, a tusk of uh, elephant a tusk with some in, um, uh, indigenous uh, decoration. And uh, you have also here uh, this uh, bell made of iron we have seen hanging at the neck and the, 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 the belt of the, some warriors. And also these uh, instruments, uh, this uh, uh, egogo uh, made of, uh, is a kind of uh, like a double bell made of ivory. And here you can see the warriors beating with this, with this instrument with the, the sticks. And uh, also it is interesting to see how these uh, instruments in some way remind these uh, instruments uh, represented in this first, uh, one of the first, uh, um, uh, picture by, by Pigafetta. Uh, so we can uh, really, we can have a link between uh, these pictures and the uh, evidence, the material evidence uh, and the visual evidence uh, coeval that we can, uh, that uh, um, uh, we arrived until, until us. Uh, so, uh, um, in conclusion, uh, some uh, consideration about uh, how to deal with these uh, sources. Uh, the illustration included in, in these early chronicles were very important since they helped to create in the reader's imagination the visual model of what the text was describing. A visual modern, model that often was very far from the reality and took inspiration from Western models. Moreover, the engravings were reproduced several times. Later authors copied them repeatedly, not only in the translation of the same text, but also in works dealing with other subjects. For this reason, these pictures cannot be considered primary ethnographic or ethnomusicological sources, even if their historical and musicological value is particularly meaningful. Thank you. Thank you, Daniela. And uh, I think this is a particularly important paper. And uh, I should uh, uh, say that Rima was very good uh, scheduling it at the beginning of our conference to show how our uh, image might not be what we think it is uh, and uh, how maybe we should trust it, maybe we should not, but in either case, it's important historical sources, source. And so it's a, it's a good beginning for the conference to put us in the mind frame for examining uh, visual sources. So are there any questions? Uh, thank you for your presentation. And uh, uh, what I think, looking at all these uh, visual uh, representations, we may imagine what kind of sound produced these instruments like bells, drums, but are there any um, descriptions what kind of music they were producing, like melody or 
maybe singing. Is there any imagination how it is sounded? Not in, not in timbre, but yes, in the world. yes. There are uh, no, of course uh, not melodies. There are not melodies. There are of course uh, not transcription as we would expect. But uh, they are uh, there in this. The text included the very not very often, but often when we deal with the music, the description of the sound. So the, this description, of course. Uh, um, um, have to be compared with some sound known to the readers. So with some, with some object or some beard, for example, known to the Western audience to make the, the message available and comprehensible. And sometimes these instruments, and this is very interesting, these instruments are compared with some Western instruments. For example, as a lute, as a harp, and it is interesting also to see how, uh, looking through the different translations, because, uh, for example, the, the, the text by Pigafetta was translated uh, at first in to Latin and after in German and in Dutch and in, in several languages, several of the most important languages at that time, in U European languages at that time. And it is interesting to see how going through the different uh, uh, um, translations, the translator make the, 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 the comparison with uh, their own instruments. So for example, if you have the French translation, the, the comparison is with a harp, or you go to the, to the uh, Dutch translation and it is as a lute or a, I, I noticed this and it is very interesting because of course they dealt with the model they knew well and of course they are, super, they are far from the original but it was a way to make understandable and comprehensible to the western audience what they were describing. This is what we were talking yesterday where everything starts with our own experience. Antonia. Thank you, Daniela. Very interesting and stimulating. I have a question. Maybe it's totally stupid because it comes out of ignorance. Um, the, the, the first and last picture, which were the same that you showed us, can you tell us and explore a little bit about the background of it? Because um, I'm interested not only on the foreground, which I see, but also on the background. And the second issue is a comment, the Congo woman that you showed to us, sorry for uh, putting it that, in that sloppy and un, uh, un, unpolitically correct way. It reminds me, and maybe I'm totally wrong, on many so-called old women in Dutch paintings. Yeah, and, uh, yes. And, you know, I don't know what, how the relationship there is, but it's that that's only a comment which needs to further uh, be further you meant research. This? Yeah, you mean right. this? Yes. Yeah, and it's used as a um, as a kind of a um, archetype for old women, also in Dutch paintings. But I, I didn't do any research on that. It just struck me when I saw that. But it, it can be possible because this is uh, this is uh, this display. Allora, the first one with uh, the three warriors was in the original uh, in the original edition. So it, it came from from Italy. This Natal Natalio de Natale de Bonifacio. But uh, uh, other uh, pictures were uh, new and were included by Debris. And debris had uh, this uh, background, European background, so it is uh, really possible. And it is interesting also your question, since uh, it's open uh, a new uh, direction of, of research to, to look at the model of, this, uh, of these paintings. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and of course he, he, he had some model also coming from the from the north because he he, he lived for uh, he, he went through all Europe. He traveled to Turkey to whatever. So it is possible that he had this uh, this background, but it is interesting also to go a little bit deeper on this. Thank you. Uh, 
As you are showing this uh, slide now, I, I looking at this uh, picture on the left, who uh, was wondering the colors that are put on this uh, grayscale picture. They were made later, so when? Yes, this is, uh, this is later and it is uh, uh, coming, and this is, for me is very interesting because of the first representation uh, 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 um, of the, 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 the African with the dark skin are, uh, come from uh, the Dutch area. So the, the Dutch uh, translation of uh, Pigafetta, this is a map uh, produced in a, in a, in a, in a Dutch uh, um, country, I, I, I can mean. And, and this is uh, the, first, uh, the first way that they look in a, in a, without filter, if you, no, no filter are all, all, always there, but in some way, at least uh, concerning the, 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 the skin is the first time that they, they represent uh, African uh, as a black. Yes, but, but I had in mind uh, the, the picture on left that has colors green, yellow, and red. Yes. Yes, uh, somehow they are uh, connected to, to African colors or was it by accident? No, I English? think it was by accident, but also this may be, I, did, I didn't, uh, yes, because you see that all are painted uh, because also the map is colorful, but I don't think that there, we can find some relation with, because at that time, uh, I don't think that they, 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 this color were related at, 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 um, uh, at an identity function. I think that it is uh, something uh, decorative, uh, not uh, mean, not uh, especially meaningful. So we should thank Dan Daniela uh, for this good beginning. And we, we move on to the second paper by Camille Rupekaite. You see, this is my exercise in Lithuanian names. I should have asked Rima to give me a tutorial before how you pronounce all these E's above and below and so on. And Camilla's paper is Musical Thread Instruments in Psalm 150 problems in their iconography in Jewish tradition. Thank you very much. Um, I changed the title slightly. I took out the word problems. I think we have too many problems around us, so I left it out. Uh, I concentrate on beauty today. Uh, so the Book of Psalms, or Tehillim in Hebrew, is the main collection of ancient Hebrew religious poetry and plays a central role in Jewish liturgy. It consists of 150 texts, about half of which are ascribed, attributed to King David, the famous musician in ancient Israel. The collection was written down in the sixth century BC during the period of the second temple of Jerusalem and reflects the centralized liturgical practices with music. The later Greek name of the book, Salmoi, indicates that these lyrics were sung to the accompaniment of string instruments. The main Hebrew string instruments, Kinor and Nevel, are mentioned in a number of psalms exhorting to joyfully praise God, or on the occasion of special holidays in combination with other instruments. The last psalm, 150, which is the culmination of the entire psalter, mentions eight musical instruments used for worship in the temple. Names of these instruments are also found in the other books of the Bible and indicate the importance of music, not only in daily and festive rituals of the temple, but also in social ceremonies, folk festivities, and battles. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's take a look at the musical instruments mentioned in the final psalm. Um, in bold, you see the transliterated names, the Hebrew, the Hebrew names for the instruments. And we can see that the translation, which is GPS Hebrew English uh, translation, uh, still it's not very precise because um, where we see, okay, let's read the psalm first. Hallelujah, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him in the sky, his stronghold. Praise him for his mighty acts, praise him for his exceeding greatness. Praise him with blasts of the horn, praise him with the harp and lyre. 
Praise him with a timbrel and dance. Praise him with lute and pipe. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let all that breathe praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Um, <clears throat> so blast of the horn. Horn is a, uh, shofar is a horn of a ram, wild goat, or antelope. It has a multi-layered symbolism of God's voice, supernatural power, divine mercy, freedom, victory, repentance, social justice, and etc. And it's the only one from biblical instruments still used in festive rituals of different Jewish communities today. Neville was a liar, uh, and Kinnor was also a liar. It was the most popular biblical instrument. Tov was a drum. Uh, minim, uh, it's a general plural name for strings. Uh, Ugaf was a pipe. And Silsle, Shama, and Silsle Terwa are symbols of different types. Uh, one is bigger and more pow powerful sound, and another is smaller and conical and of a more gentle sound. So starting with the shofar throughout the other instruments and dance to all that breathe in the final verse, the author of the psalm creates the majestic picture of the joint and living instrument of the praise of the Lord. Due to the limited scope of this paper, I will focus on selected examples of iconography of these instruments in the synagogues in ancient Israel and in the diaspora, as well as on reflection of this psalm in the works of two renowned Jewish artists of the 20th century. When the Temple of Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans in 70 CE, the nature of the rites has changed. With the loss of the only place of worship and with the beginning of the diaspora, institution of the synagogue became the center of local Jewish life and ritual practices. In terms of liturgic, liturgic functions, the synagogue did not replace the destroyed temple. There were no more offerings of sacrifices accompanied by choirs and orchestras of professional musicians. However, decoration of ancient synagogue interior with images of ritual musical instruments and other symbolic motives for the temple, maintaining historical memory was rather common. Images of the shofar with a seven branch lamp stand, uh, menorah, and other ritual objects from the Jerusalem temple um, uh, decorate mosaic floor of ancient synagogues in northern Israel, in Haimar Tiberias, built in the third, fourth century, in Sephoris in Galilee, early fifth century, and Beit Alpha synagogue, sixth century CE. These symbols appear in the panels near the Bima or raised platform from where the Torah is read. As Asaf Friedman puts it, the selection of a relatively small number of repeated motifs and compositions is evidence of their symbolic value. <clears throat> so uh, you can see the horns, uh, two horns in the Haima Tiberias, uh, one horn in the center, in Zaphoris, and uh, one horn uh, above the lion on the, on the left image. Depiction of the most popular biblical string instrument, the kinor, which symbolized joy and the mastery of song, was less common in the ancient synagogues, most probably due to no singing practice in the earliest liturgy of the synagogue. Due to archaeological evidence from the region, as Joachim Brown has summarized, scholars have collected at least 30 different representations of the lyre. The early visual interpretation in the synagogues is influenced by pagan imagery. The Hellenized Jews borrowed Roman architectural structure, figurative art elements, and symbols. Among the earliest images of the Kinor in the synagogue interiors, there is a lyre in the zodiac circle in Sephora synagogue, representing the sign of Gemini and symbolizing, as it seems, harmony and balance. I know it's very, very difficult uh, to find it, but it's uh, on the right. Sephoris was a strongly Hellenized city, and this mosaic uh, on, the, uh, on the left, as, it, as I showed, uh, as Joachim Brown stated, probably the best evidence of the pagan Jewish Christian cultural syncretism that blossomed from Galenistic Roman times to 6th century CE Palestine. Similar example of such syncretism is depiction of King David with a liar in the synagogue mosaic from city of Gaza. 
With one hand, David plucks the strings. You can see his left hand behind the strings. In the other, he holds a plectrum. To the right is an identifying inscription. You see on top, there's, it's written uh, David in Hebrew. Uh, and we, see, we also see some animals on the panel. It's interesting that he's shown with a plectrum because King David was a master of uh, playing the lyre with his hand. Uh, and we have this notion in, in the Hebrew Bible. Images of individual musical instruments, especially the shofar, also occurred in later medieval synagogues, but were not very common. The construction and embellishment of synagogues was regulated by different laws, which were often unfavorable to the Jews. The final, financial situation of local Jewish communities and different traditions of folk art. Interiors of synagogues often were ornamented with inscriptions quoting psalms and other fragments of the Hebrew Bible. Decoration of the synagogue interiors with ensembles of musical instruments mentioned in the Psalm 150 can be found from the 18th century onwards and reflects the complex history of different local interpretations of biblical musical instruments. According to Philip Bowman, I quote, as texts that identify musical attributes, the biblical references to music were and are open to interpretation. And it is for this reason that we are able to understand the meanings of music that they convey as acts of translation, end of quote. Absence of unanimous imagery of biblical music and instruments testify to the living and developing tradition of interpretation and vice versa. Lack of clear historical identification of some instruments has contributed to a variety of the visual images and artistic creativity. The problem has its roots in the very first translations of the Hebrew Bible into other languages, starting with the Greek Septuagint. Names and identity of original musical instruments were lost and resulted in images of instruments of different types. A distinctive visual interpretation of the Psalm 150 is given in the Sephardic Abu Hab synagogue in Safed, Otsfat, a city of mystical Kabbalah movement in Upper Galilee. Uh, it was built by exiles from Spain and named after Spanish rabbi and Kabbalist Isaac Abuha, was rebuilt after the earthquake in the mid 19th century. The dome over the Bima is decorated with musical instruments which have written names and several instruments have double interpretations. The kinor is depicted as harp and lyre, nevel as, as lyre and lute, mm. Tov is depicted as tambourine, uh, Hatsotsra, a trumpet which was not mentioned in the psalm, is depicted um, as a double trumpet. It was a very important ritual instrument in the temple. Shofar as a straight horn. The symbols have a written name. You see the, uh, the images are not very clear, but it, you see the, the names uh, written uh, beside the instruments. So uh, symbols have a written name of uh, the sounding. And it's very interesting thing that we see a pan pipe here. It's a, the slide is very dark, but you can see it on the left slide, and it's a bit, little bit cut. Uh, but uh, I hope you can see the the pipe uh, of ten pipes. Um, actually, from the early translations of the Hebrew Bible, this uh, instrument was not clearly identified. And in the Talmud, Ugaf is commented as hydrolis, uh, water organ. And a number of 18th century scholars have treated Ugaf as panpipe, and we exactly see such interpretation here in the mid 19th century uh, decoration. A mysterious name is given to a depicted flute. Uh, you see the flute on the top on the right uh, slide, and it is written, Yonat Elem Rehokim. And there is no clear meaning of this phrase, uh, which is taken from introduction of the Psalm 56 and could refer to the tuner for singing or an instrument for accompaniment. It is possible to link this image to the Kabbalistic idea of music making as a spiritual exercise and to analogy of human body as musical instrument played by God. Major Jewish mystic, the founder of the ecstatic Kabbalah, Abraham Abolafia writes, I quote, you must know that the body of man is holes, holes and cavities, cavities. From this, you will understand how the Shekinah, Shekinah is the presence of God, dwells in the body which is pierced and contains cavities and which gives birth to speech, end of quote. It is interesting to know that another Psalm 137 is quoted near the image of the harp. 
you see on the right slide, you see the image of the harp and a verse from the psalm, which says, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars, we, sung, we hung our harps for their, our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. The subject of this psalm, not being able to rejoice in exile far from Jerusalem, is quite popular in the creation of synagogues in Eastern and Southern Europe, where substance of these two psalms merge into one visual scene. Various European musical instruments are depicted as hanging on the branches on a Babylonian tree by the river against the landscape with the city and towers. Uh, here you see a wonderful image uh, of the wooden synagogue in uh, Przeboż in Poland, um, which was unfortunately destroyed as the majority of uh, the synagogues or if the buildings, some buildings are remained, but interiors, of course, are not destroyed, are destroyed due to the Second World War. So in the background, we see a city with a tower and a river. And in the foreground, we see musical instruments hanging from the uh, tree branches. Uh, the image is very old, but you can see the, a peculiar decorated French horn from the left, two different trumpets, a dulcimer, a basso cello, a wind instrument similar to oboe, a violin. Such images symbolically connect the flourishing age of the temple and the sorrowful individualized experience of the exile or diaspora. Musical instruments in reference to the psalm were depicted uh, in a number of Eastern European synagogues uh, in Baroque synagogue of Landshut uh, of the second half of 18th century on the corners of the Eastern wall. You see violin, trumpets, pipes. And uh, in the great synagogue in Dambrova Tarnowska, again, it's a second half of the 19th century, uh, both synagogues were restored uh, 10 years ago, and uh, there are cultural centers and a museum there, and you can see the images of the instrument in the uh, corner uh, of the building on the eastern uh, side. And the drum and cymbals, different uh, wind instruments, there is um, also um, um, Trombone, violin, guitar, two shofars, flutes, drum, and cymbals. Several more examples. Uh, on the right, there is the Great Brick Synagogue in, of Lodava, L Lublin region, uh, which is covered with bas relief images of musical instruments. There was a beautiful old wooden ark with even 16 musical images, but it was lost due to fire in 1934. And in the restore arc, we see on the left side, drum, triangle, cymbals, clarinet, flute, and in the right panel, violin, shofar, uh, and that's it, I think. Um, also in the beautiful uh, Zolkva synagogue in Ukraine, the ah. region from the end of the 17th century, on the wall near the Holy Ark, there, is a, there was a violin, shofar, drum, cymbals, mandolin, or our colleague from Ukraine can say maybe it's a kobza, mandolin or kobza, <laughs> Ukrainian instrument, are depicted. Many interiors of the synagogues, not even the photographs, have not remained due to the Holocaust, as I've mentioned. So a number of local interpretations of biblical musical images have been lost forever. Um, there are data according to the witnesses' memoirs, for example, about the great synagogue in Kovel, also Ukraine. The vault was painted by a non-Jewish artist from Odessa with depiction of musical instruments as named in Psalm 150. Illustrations of the psalm were common in a number of other Polish, Ukrainian, Romanian, Moldovan synagogues. So another example, uh, it's already the beginning of the 20th century. Great Synagogue in Gura Homoruloi, Romania, Moldova, and the name of the painter is also known. So some names of the painters have been remained. I move on to Lithuania. The motive of musical instruments was used in the interior decoration of Lithuanian synagogues. For example, in the dome over the Torah Ark in the Great Synagogue in Mariampole, southern Lithuania. Two groups of various musical instruments were depicted. Violins, drums, mandolins, lyres, trumpets, pipes, shofars, horns, cymbals, and dulcimer. 
we see the so-called original ones mentioned in the psalm, shofar, lyre, folk pipe, professional instruments of the 19th century, trumpets, French horns, violins, clarinets, and the ones used in klezmer music bands, mandolins, dulcimer. Uh, of course, this interior is not remained as well. Uh, another interesting example is, uh, was the old Jagare brick synagogue in Northern Lithuania, where the wooden supports of the women's gallery are decorated with traditional Lithuanian carved patterns and the partition is painted with musical, and I think you cannot see it fully, uh, it's a bit uh, hidden by the panel, but uh, there is lyre, trumpets, harp, mandolin, horn, and of course it's also not remained. In terms of musical practice in the 19th century, the depicted instruments were popular in Lithuanian and Klezmer music bands. In the 19th century, Lithuanian translations of the Bible, the names of sitar, Salterian violin, Lithuanian folk instrument, kankles, pipe, drum, dulcimer are common and indicate the use of these instruments in the local music making. Uh, mandolin was very common as a home music instrument and mandolin ensembles was popular in smaller towns. And on the left, you see a Jewish orchestra from Obolinkas from 1932. So Jewish musical groups were very common in, in smaller towns as well. And um, I would like to show a very, very specific image, not uh, of the instrument mentioned in the Psalm 150, but the image of the Kinor, which is the only remade synagogue decoration with musical image in Lithuania till today. Everything uh, else is destroyed. So this is the only which is remaining, the, the image of Kinor of the Lyre. The imagination of Jewish artists in the region was captivated by the stories of the Bible and painted walls of synagogues, ritual objects decorated with crowns, animals, and birds, musical instruments, plant ornaments, decoration of religious books. This has inspired many Litva talents to seek professional art knowledge. Being raised in religious families, they invoked traditional Jewish symbols, which they used for seeking national revival. Among such artists were Mark Chagall, Jacques Lipschitz, Ben Shan, who, according to Ida Huberman, created a synthesis between the Jewish and the universal, both in imagery and symbols. Vitebsk-born Mark Chagall, in his youth, dreamt of becoming a professional singer, violinist, or dancer. Chagall's family belonged to Hasidic movement, which considered music, singing, and dancing to be very important in connection to God. So theme of music permits his works. Besides fiddlers, he features a number of different musical instruments, cellos, mandolins, harps, shofars, flutes, pipes, etc. Um, Chagall represents, as researchers of Julian and Batirishna has put it, a vivid intercultural phenomenon. In addition to images of the Jewish world, Chagall's paintings are inspired by theme, themes from the Bible. His stained glass window for the Psalm 150 uh, was created for Ch Chichester Anglican Cathedral UK in 1978 when the artist was 91. The single north facing window contains musical instruments mentioned in the psalm from the lyre played by King David at the top. You see the figure uh, King, Do King David on the hmm, ass or, or a ram with a lyre. Special importance is given to this figure. To the shofar, upper left, symbols, center to the left, trumpet, center right, keyboards, lower right, violin, bottom right and down left, pipe, bottom right. It's not very easy to see, but you can practice. Um, we see several figures uh, of animals uh, and also a figure with a book and have two figures holding a candlestick. So menorah, one of the main symbols of the temple also appears here in the Chagall's work. And uh, you can see that musical instruments are depicted in a rather abstract way. Red color, quite unusual for Chagall. He was mostly green or blue. And dance movements dominate, expressing the atmosphere of intense praise, exultation and vitality. Quite different expression of the Psalm 150 belongs to Jewish American painter and graphic artist Ben Shan, who was born into an Orthodox Jewish family in Konas. 
His family had experienced religious and political persecution from Tsarist regime, and he managed to escape uh, to New York in 1906. As a teenager, Ben Shan worked for a lithographer, where he learned both lithography and lettering, which followed him throughout his career. Hallelujah Suite Psalm 150 was conceived when Ben Shan was invited to create a mosaic mural for a Jewish community center in Rockville, Maryland. However, the plans for the mural never went beyond the drawing stage because of Shan's death in 1969. Lithographs taken from the mural drawings were published posthumously in 1970 and illustrates in picture and calligraphy Psalm 150. According to the wife of the artist, Brenda Bryson Shan, now I quote, during the last years of Ben's life, there was a certain resurgence of religious imagery in his work. It seemed to me that since he had rather emphatically cast off his religious ties and traditions during his youth, he could now return to them freely and with a fresh eye. And without this sense of a moral burden and entrapment that they once held for him, he rediscovered myth and story and the Holy Spirit that once had offended him, but that now held tremendous charm, even amusement, and that he could now depict with a light touch and with affectionate tenderness." End of quote. Hallelujah Suite, Psalm 150, reflects Ben Shan's interest, not only in ancient music, music instruments, but first of all, in personalities of musicians. 24 drawings of different music, musicians, young and old, with the instruments of various types, present plastic, illustrative, though stylized impressions, which somewhat remind ancient Greek musical images. Great attention is paid to performers' hands. They are enlarged and expressive, emphasizing the importance to the process of the birth of music. Benchan's instruments surpasses those mentioned in the psalm. He drew organ, psaltery, sistrum, double flute, shofar, kithara, violin, crowd. The crowd is a boat, Welsh lyre. Trumpet, twin reeds, lute, lyre, chambels, jubilee trumpet, loud sounding cymbals, clanging cymbals, double oboe, tambourine. In his cycle, one can sense message of universality of music. However, the Jewish features of the musicians and calligraphy suggest that Ben Shan is looking back on his nation's relationship to the text and to the tradition. To sum up, images of biblical musical instruments from the early depictions in the synagogue mosaics in ancient Israel and later in European synagogues were influenced by surrounding cultures and the imagery, textual sources, translations of the Hebrew Bible into local languages and regional music making traditions. Characteristic merging of the images of Psalms 137 and 150 symbolically connect two very important periods of Jewish history, age of the temple, and experience of the exile, depicting variety of musical instruments of local communities. In some cases, abundant musical images in Eastern European synagogues exceeded the number of musical instruments mentioned in the psalm. More than a dozen musical instruments could be depicted. In their artistic interpretation of the psalm, renowned Litvak artists Mark Chagall and Ben Shan, each in their own way, at the end of their lives, reconnect to the Jewish tradition and religious experiences of their childhood homes. At the same time, the pictic intimate relationship between musicians and their instruments. They convey the atmosphere of immediate music making and worship. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Daniela. Thank you for your, your presentation, very, very interesting. And I would like to, to ask something about the, one of the first uh, images you, sh you showed uh, about this uh, King David in a mosaic from one synagogue. Probably you already mentioned, but I, I missed something because you, you were um, speaking about this King David uh, playing with the plectrum and it is unusual since uh, he, he usually is mentioned to, to play with the fingers, but I I think probably there is a super, um, there is a, um, um, a model, the model of Orpheus. 
Yes, I mean, yes. It, is, it is, and, and of course, usually is shown with this big plectrum, and probably also this is a king, because I think he had the crown, so it was a King David, but there is a, this, they, they, it shares, shares this model, the model of Orpheus, and it is very, very, very common this in, in this moment, the, the so-called late antiquity. It was sixth century, more or less. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes, exactly. It, it was, as I mentioned, this image was strongly Hellenized, and it's not the only image, of course. There is the King David as Orpheus in Dura Europos synagogue yes. in Syria, which I have not mentioned due to lack of time. Uh, but absolutely, yes, this merging of different... Uh, yes, and also sometimes uh, David, but with animals, it is very yes. interesting, this, uh, this um, yes, yes. Uh, association. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Camilla. I am Agni Mojuliena, and I admire your presentation for some reasons. And one of them is your very personal approach to this topic. I mean that you did this work not looking only at the screen of the computer, but you visited many places by yourself and took photos and involved some family members, as I saw. So I would like to ask what is the source of this topic, why you have chosen this? Was it maybe this psalm or some visual inspirations you saw visiting that places? Uh, thank you. This, I cannot say that was the only source because actually uh, I returned to the topic after many years, I would say. Um, I was writing on musical instruments in the Bible and um, their translations into the Lithuanian uh, Bible translations since the very end of the 16th century. And naturally, when I had the opportunities for traveling, I, I uh, took some photos and was interested in the imagery. And I did not mention it here, but also there's a very interesting imagery of these biblical musical instruments in Lithuanian churches in the Christian um, context, where we can see a lot of King David with the harp and um, also due to translation, actually I started uh, when I started research from translations. And uh, then of course, um, noticed that there are so many images and there were many images of musical instruments and I, due to lack of time, I could not mention uh, the more about merging of cultures, like in these ancient synagogues, um, uh, there is a very interesting thing as a zodiac sign, and not only in ancient, also in Polish synagogues, we have the zodiac circle with, for Jews from their religious perspective well, should not be there, but again, this mix of, of cultures. Um, so I would say very different uh, perspectives of interests. Thank you. I think we should close here. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we move to the last paper for the morning by Beate Baublinskiene. And the paper is on the features of Gregorian manuscripts from Vilnius. Thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure to participate in this conference. So, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, musical score and notation in general can be considered as a means of visualizing music, but its purpose has changed over the course of history. And we could say, um, uh, sorry, sorry, Greg News, how to uh, move? Like this or? 
Okay. So uh, we could say that in medieval manuscripts, music has the equivalent in image and sound in color. Here uh, is a picture from the Museum of Tinets Benedictine Monastery in Krakow. We see the paint and colors. Uh, here we see all instruments for making a book. Sheets, or sheets of parchment, feathers, and other instruments. And uh, another picture is a scriptorium, a picture from uh, 15th century, a century that I will, uh, from century that uh, about which I will speak uh, in case of uh, Vilnius manuscripts. Uh, so, in fact, we can see that a medieval liturgical books, musical books, covers the art of music, art of calligraphy, and art of illumination. Um, earliest Gregorian adiastomatic manuscripts from uh, uh, 9 and 10th century. Um, we are conceived to remind well-known melodies and pieces of chant by means of quite exact agogic and rhythmic in terms of free rhetoric rhythm, pneumatic notation, and without indication of exact pitches. Um, nevertheless, it would be the big mistake to consider the pneumatic notation this, uh, as, as primitive, as simple, undeveloped. Uh, Pierre Boulez, for example, in his book Orientations, has marked that, oh, oh no, no quotation, okay, that a Gregorian melody is uh, unquestionably more complex than a tonal melody, since its structural pointing is much more subtle. We cannot speak of a progress from a monody to polyphony, only of a shifting of interest that enriches one element and impoverishes another. For medieval singers, subtle rhythmic nuances was a matter of first importance and medieval neumes were the instruments for fixing them. And uh, when we speak about subtle rhythmic nuances, um, so it, it means that uh, it means free rhetoric rhythm because Gregorian melody is modeled on the text, first of all. Uh, some scholars describes, uh, describe neumes as a visualization of gesture of Gregorian's holo conductor or cantor. After medieval Ordinus Romani, Ordinus Romani is a collection of documents for various liturgical services. So after medieval Ordinus Romani, Schola Cantorum in Roma had its main cantor or conductor, director, we could say also a teacher, who led the singing of the group. This person was called Prior Schola Magister Hori Primitarius Archicantor. As wrote uh, the Polish conductor and Gregorianist Michal Slavetsky in his article about conducting of Gregorian chant, Magister Hori used various types of gestures and movements as instruments for teaching and transmitting some melodic formulas until they are remembered by all the group, by, by all cantors. Uh, according to another Gregorianist and conductor, Alexander Schweitzer, neumes are conductor's gestures written with ink on parchment. He has in mind, first of all, the Sengal manuscripts. And here we see one picture from, uh, from one of the Sengal manuscripts, because they, due to the changing shape of the neumes, seems to most closely correspond to this concept. Uh, the concept of Sengal neumes are heronomic signs, mm, as heronomic signs, emphasized uh, already uh, Dom Eugène Cardin, the godfather of Gregorian semiology, we, um, we could uh, say about him. In 1954, uh, he invented the notion of Gregorian semiology for paleographical research that began in the uh, first half of the 20th century. And uh, this uh, paleographical research was of the oldest European musical manuscript. In his groundbreaking book, Gregorian Semiology, 
first published as Semiologia Gregoriana by the Pontifical Institute of Sacred Music in Rome in 1968, uh, Cardin wrote, if the hand of scribe or copist as well as hand of conductor stops on a note, it indicates the importance of the note, the rhythmical or rhetorical importance of the note. So the, the musical notation can depict uh, the movement of conductor. Uh, may, um, maybe it's, it's not very, very good. Uh, you cannot very good <laughs> see this news, but um, so. Uh, the picture uh, from the right, the picture uh, this um, from the right shows the title page of the Antifonale uh, number uh, number um, uh, 300, uh, 390 and 91 from St. Gallen. We see the figure of Pope Gregory the Great and the Holy Spirit as a dove rests on his shoulder and whispers in his ear some melody and he draws pneumatic signs in the ear so he conducts and copist who is this case who in this case is a monk of St. Gallen a blessed hardker a scribe of this, of this particular book writes on parchment what he sees so news in adiastematic manuscripts are signs of conducting of Magister Cori, who most likely conducted by the right hand, only by the right hand, because in the left hand, he was holding a book. So uh, a bit later came into the play the diastematic manuscripts written in square uh, notation in a four line staff with the clef. By the uh, 13th century, such practice became prevalent. <laughs> Maybe we can see oh, such. Uh, the earliest Gregorian manuscripts uh, preserved in Vilnius in the Wrublewski Library of the Lithuanian Academy of Sciences date back to the 14th-15th centuries and are diastematic. Written in square notation and Gothic minuscule, they belonged to the Vilnius Bernardins, so Bernardins are observant Franciscans. Uh, after the information provided by Wroblewski Library, these books were used and belonged to Vilnius Bernardin Monastery. When, when Monastery won closed in 1864, after January uprising in Poland and Lithuania, books were brought to the Vilnius Public Library. In 1915, it was taken to Russia together with uh, other treasures of the library and stored at USSR National Lenin Library in Moscow. After Second World War, it was given back to Lithuania and handed to manuscript department of the library of the Lithuanian Academy of Sciences. It was ascribed to the collection according uh, to the conditional title, the remains of the manuscript archive of Vilnius Public Library. And this is the collection, all collection of this manuscript, seven books. Uh, and some maybe historical context about Bernardins. Bernardins, the observant branch of Franciscans or the order of friars minors, came to Vilnius from Krakow in uh, 1469, when they also were quite, uh, uh, we are in Krakow, they also were quite a young community. Um, in Krakow, in fourteen. Uh, um, uh, 53, St. John of Capistrano founded a monastery of St. Bernardino of Siena. After this name of St. Bernardino, uh, observants we are called Bernardins in Poland and in Lithuania. It means in territories of today's Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, Ukraine, and Belarus. In other parts of Europe, there are Franciscan, observant Franciscans. 
uh, in that time, when they came to Krakow, Bernardins belonged to the Austrian Czech Polish Vicariat. In uh, uh, 1467 was formed the Polish Vicariat. So the monastery in Vilnius founded two years later belonged to it. In uh, 1517, after papal bull of Leon the X, observants received the order status. In this year was formed Polish province to which belonged areas of Poland, Lithuania, and Ruthenia. In 1530, the Lithuanian province were formed. It existed until uh, 1576, and later from uh, 1729 uh, um, to 1843. And as I have mentioned, in 1864, the monastery in Vilnius was dissolved. Uh, I have analyzed one piece from the manuscript of uh, um, F2203. It is gradual, this, uh, this manuscript. And I have analyzed Introitus, Gaudiamus, uh, that is dedicated to the Feast of Assumption of Mary, and some, some characteristics of the manuscript of this manuscript. This manuscript uh, is look, uh, look, look such, uh, in such way. So uh, it is the big manuscript. Uh, it was uh, made for, not for cantor, but for scholar, for, for, for group of people to sing. And is, yeah, is, 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 is big. So, um, after musicologist Victoria Goncharova, the manuscript is of Italian uh, provenance. Maybe it, uh, it uh, came to Vilnius as a gift for, for Bernardins. It, it is written in square notation in four line in the parts attached later up to the uh, four, um, 18th century on a five line. Uh, there are used keys C and F Text is written in Gothic minuscule. Uh, folios added in the 15th century and later most probably was written in Vilnius Monastery. And at the beginning of the uh, 17th century, the book could travel also to Bernardin Monastery in Grodno because there is a, a remark on the margin uh, in one of the folios about Vilnius Bishop Benedictus Voina, who led a cornerstone of the Church of Finding Holy Cross in Grodno. And there we can see a specific shape of notes. Uh, upper notes are narrower than lower. Maybe it indicates that narrower notes must be sing faster, not, not very heavy, and bigger notes, this, uh, in, uh, bigger notes are more important rhythmically and maybe uh, they, we can sing more slowly these notes. Also, there are transverse lines placed on a four line, this, this transverse line lines. Such lines indicates in musical books of Bernardins and of the intonation of Cantor. So there are indica in, in indications for interpretation. And I compared the Vilnius variant of the Introitus Gaudiamus for assumption of, uh, of Mary with uh, variants from oldest adiastomatic adi manuscripts from Sangol and Lon semi-adiastomatic manuscript from Benevento, as well as with the new editions of melodic restitution uh, that are published in such books as Graduale Triplex, Graduale Novum, Liber Gradualis, and with variants of Gaudiamus in the Nave Vilnius manuscript. So the, there, is, um, there is a comparative table. It looks such. So, and uh, uh, here is Antifona, and here is Epsalm. So what are results of analysis? 
And here I would indicate one interesting uh, aspect feature that maybe is, is uh, important for this, uh, for this theme, for, for the subject, music and uh, visualization. Um, there are some, uh, some uh, places, uh, uh, some places uh, where Vilnius manuscript uh, uh, variant in Vilnius manuscript is uh, more different, slightly different than in, in uh, old uh, manuscript. But uh, one interesting aspect is that uh, in, in Vilnius, in this uh, manuscript from 14th century, in some places, uh, we see a reduction, a reduction of notes. For example, uh, here um, we see uh, the variant from uh, variant. It is a melodic um, restitution from old manuscripts, oldest manuscripts, Gaudiamus, and we see Gaudiamus omnes, this omnes, omnes, and in Vilnius manuscript is Gaudiamus omnes, this omnes we, is left only one note on omnes, omnes, so this a small, a small note um, is, um, is called liquescent note for, for M, and maybe it was reduced in this Vilnius manuscript from uh, 14th century, but maybe in, in, in other place also we have this liquescent note, for example, in, in the second line of Vilnius manuscript. For example, this is place. And in um, in in uh, in Vilnius maybe is so uh, there is no this sec uh, we can we we um, we don't see second knot, but we see uh, uh, in in this in Vilnius variant. Uh, not a quadrata, quadrat note, one note, but very interesting shape, with very interesting shape uh, that is um, a little oblique and has tails of both sides. So maybe in Vilnius manuscript, it is also, uh, it also means a liquescent note. Uh, and, and it is or it is not uh, so um, it needs to 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 analyze more deeply but uh, but it shows that uh, some uh, correspondences uh, of notation of the square notation of 14th century and uh, between this notation and uh, this adiastomatic notation of all this manuscript, there are some correspondent, uh, corres uh, correspondent, um, so. Um, yes. And uh, other important aspect of Gregorian manuscripts from the point of view of relation between music and visual culture are illuminations. The manner, colors, visual motifs provide another perspective of the musical text. Here is, uh, uh, is uh, some example of Rotulus, uh, manuscripts used for the chanting of the exul exulted during the Easter night. In Easter night is 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 singing such 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 piece how, how to say not piece but um, the prior, and uh, these um, pictures are made uh, uh, in Bari in Italy, and it is from Museum uh, Cathedral Museum, uh, and so we can see very very. Uh, very beautiful pictures and in Vilnius we had not set pictures but uh, in this case uh, of introitus of Gaudiamus here we can see uh, uh, Gaudiamus uh, first and second pictures are Gaudiamus from uh, from uh, um, manuscript one uh, one hundred three, and it is the Gaudiamus for uh, for Assumption of Mary. 
third uh, uh, picture is uh, uh, Gaudiamus for all signs. And uh, uh, fourth picture also is Gaudiamus from another Vilnius manuscript. So uh, when we see on these illuminations of these um, first, um, first letters of these um, yeah, of, of uh, pieces of music, we can see uh, that uh, um, feast uh, uh, of uh, Assumption of Mary was very important for Bernardines, of course. Uh, because uh, these uh, this first letters are very, very uh, nice uh, illuminated, very nice decorated. And uh, it's decorated not only the first letter of Antiphon, Gaudiamus, but also in the second picture, the first letter of uh, Psalm, Ructavit Cormeum. Uh, and also in the in, in, in antiphon in the first picture in, in the text of antiphona, we can see um, uh, the wo word Maria, the first letter of Maria is also a, a little a little decorated. So uh, and we know that um, uh, for Bernardin's devotion uh, to Virgin Mary was important part of, of their spirituality. Uh, and now, maybe we can, I, I maybe, uh -huh, okay, no, no, no musical examples. Uh, so, and uh, uh, what could could uh, could I, uh, what uh, could be the um, some um, what uh, could we say about this uh, relation between music and uh, and visualization? Uh, and we see that in this uh, um, medieval manuscripts and uh, in in Vilnius medieval manuscripts, of course, the relation is. Uh, uh, is very important and uh, one aspect, uh, how to say, um, emphasized another aspect. And uh, here in the, this uh, in these pieces, uh, we can see that uh, uh, it is relation not only between music and uh, visualization, music and picture, but also with some theological um, meanings. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions? You know, I, I was thinking, what is the, the evidence that these manuscripts were uh, produced in Vilnius? Was there a scriptorium here? Yes, in uh, in Vilnius Monastery uh, uh, was scriptorium, uh, scriptorium, and in five, um, uh, in uh, so there are uh, seven um, seven manuscripts, and uh, six manuscripts are um, are very um, similar one, one to another. Yes, and in in two, uh, I think manuscript uh, there is a sign of scriptor mm -hmm. Ambrosius from Clodava. The, that uh, so uh, it is sci science. Uh, he he scripts um, uh, laus tibi Christe, uh, liber explicit iste Ambrosius frater fratres yes. And uh, in two books are the sign, mm -hmm. and uh, another book shows uh, very similar features of of uh, script. Yes. Yeah, that's what I was thinking because the the initials look uh, look kind of related but it's uh, yes it's dangerous to make an assumption from one slide yes and this one one manuscript uh, one manuscript from this six manuscript uh, was not not um, uh, written in vilnius uh, and uh, in fact this manuscripts uh, are not very well um, analyzed mm -hmm. uh, we have only one uh, article of uh, Musicologist Victoria Goncharova. I, I don't I don't know here because the article is from nineties. Uh, also, um, contextually, these manuscripts are mentioned in uh, in uh, uh, 
PhD thesis of uh, Lithuanian musicologist uh, Jonas Vilmas, but so, but properly, so to say, deeply, these manuscripts are not analyzed. So, so that keeps you busy. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? If not, we meet uh, at two o'clock and now have a lunch. Thank you. So good afternoon, maybe now. We are starting our second session of uh, Baltic Musicological Conference, Music and Visual Culture. And now I would like to present uh, Saskia Pellegrini, who um, represents the School of the Arts of Singapore. And he uh, will present uh, his topic, Sound unheard, the visual fantas the visual fantasmata. So please. Um, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Sasha. I'm living in Singapore. It's been said. Um, I'm assuming that um, yeah, Rima received my video presentation. I uh, she mentioned me that she would have play back the video from there. Is that correct to say that? So we, we will show now. Uh, yes, okay, fantastic. Okay, sorry. So my, I introduced myself just very briefly. Um, so yes, I'm Sasha. My background is in music composition, uh, but my research is in phenomenology. Uh, most of my work as an artist as well as in intermedia and interdisciplinarity. Uh, that's about it. I think we can go with the presentation. Thank you. I hope you enjoy. With this presentation, I will attempt to establish a connection between the visual and the auditory experience in the realm of visual art and music. I will propose observations about Vasily Kandinsky's Impression 3 and Arnold Schoenberg's Composition 3 Klavierstück, Opera 11. This comparison will usher in evaluation of what transpires between the visual and the musical gesture. I will argue that translations which occur between the mediums of music and visual art, between hearing and sight, between acoustic and visual phenomena, generate new perspectives, uncharted maps, sondographies, new morphologies. This presentation, therefore, investigates the liminal space of these unheard and unseen signs, the locus of these transformations and genetic recombinations the emplacement or displacement of sounds and visual gesture, if and how sound is silenced or enhanced by its visual facsimile, if and how, conversely, the visual sign is obliterated or magnified by its oral facsimile. Before proceeding, I need to clarify that I'm using words such as translation and communication while fully aware that these borrowed terms allude to a linguistic concern in conceptual domain. And this seems to imply a close structural affinity between text, music, and visual. I am considering the use of these words in their linguistic metaphorical context, aware of the dissimilarities between language, music, and visual art. Therefore, I'm not signaling a flattening of the rules and morphological characteristic of language onto the characteristic of music and its notation, or otherwise of visual art and its set of principles. I'm only indicating that, within the metaphorical implications given by linguistics, translations and communication occur within music and visual art, following relational pathways which I will try to delineate in what follows. 
While introducing the artistic exchange between painter Vasily Kandiskin and composer Arno Schoenberg, based on the existing documents available, letters, pictures and documents, I will bring into play a few more correlations between music and visual art, which appear in the works of composers Cornelius Cardio and artist Harry Bertoia. In his book Point and Line to Plane, Vasily Kandinsky, by comparing lines and dots arranged on a plan to a Beethoven score, informs us of the direct and intimate relation between sound and space. Kandinsky extrapolates a few bars from Beethoven's Fifth Symphony and proceeds with a graphical translation of the original noted sounds on a stave. Translation with a translation metaphor within a metaphor, paraphrasing linguist Yen Ren Chao. In this game of decoding mirrors, sound is evanescent, destitute of its physical, tangible presence. Moreover, by tracing an equivalence between a series of descending and softened musical notes on the stave and the corresponding numbers of dots decreasing in size drawn on a plane, Kandinsky seems to allude to a multitude of interpretations and ideas. It is almost as if he alludes to a platonic notion. Here, what is questioned is not solely the consistencies and intelligibility of a notational system, but rather the presence of sounds within the limited space of a piece of paper. How this presence is evaluated, transformed, encoded and decoded by the composer and the performer, let alone an audience. How close or far is the sign on the paper, the symbols employing the music notation from the sound itself? How much interpretation of the sign is arbitrary, potentially leading to an interpretation different from the composer's intent? No matter how specific the notation might be, there is inevitably a gap between the gesture of tracing symbols on paper and the gesture of making sounds with a musical instrument. This gap, this interstice, is the place of interpretation, the uncharted place of exchange between the physical and conceptual outcome of the sounds and visual material. In his painting Impression 3, Kandinsky refers directly to his experience of listening to Schoenberg's three Klavierstück during a concert held in Munich, Germany, in 1911. Here, Kandinsky's work is not the outcome of some sort of visual artifice of linear representation of a multilinear, multiplanar, spherical audition of sounds. The painting does not represent, rather it complements and amplifies the palette of musical colors through gestural strokes on a canvas and color pigments. Kandinsky operates at a transformative rather than a representational level. A first parenthesis. I regard the spatial temporal intermezzo of a communication within the medium of sound and visual as the place of action of the notion that Japanese philosopher Kitano Nishida calls intuitive knowledge. In his intuition and reflection in self consciousness, Nishida argues that experience and the rumination regarding experiences are not chronologically differentiated. Hence, the time of the sensor's experience is synchronous and equal to the time of thinking and evaluating the experience, while the former is still evolving. This is what he called the intuition of the experience. Intuition, Nishida argues, is a form of knowledge. In the post-Cartesian Western philosophical tradition, intuition is not historically regarded as the logos of knowledge. I argue, following Nishida's notion, that this form of knowledge is closer to the form of communication that occurs between gestures in diverse mediums, and this is the lieu of osmotic interpenetration within and between. I open a second parenthesis here to elucidate important characteristics of the two mediums, and how these characteristics suggest a relation to Nishida's notion of intuitive knowledge. There is an ephemerality of the sonic gesture which is strikingly different from the brush strokes of a painting. Sound vibration is a tactile experience but an intangible one, which vanishes from our perceptual horizon the very moment that the sound is heard. 
Painting remains tactile in its physical and tangible form. Colors and strokes are just raw outcomes congeal into concrete matter. I can touch the painting. I can experience the different textures and the sensuous feedback provoked by touch, smell and sight of it. Sound and music is tactile in principle, a vibration passing through the body's skin and captured by the eardrum, but it remains impalpable, unseen. The temporality of the paintings is congealed within the last stroke of the work of the painter. It is pinned to an instant in time, sharing with photography a certain ghostly remembrance of time past. The temporality of music is bound to our presence in the present moment. Sound that vanishes and disappears the very moment the notes are heard and distinguished. Music can only be recollected from an experience which is always past, never present. A painting is present to itself. It is, so to speak, static, fixed, while music is in this regard dynamic continuously disappearing from our conscious horizon into cogitations of a near past instant. The question of temporality seems relevant because the special aspect of painting deals with the planar perspectivations of the sense of sight. Therefore, the tempo of the painter's strokes deal with the space that unfolds around the direction of the brush's gesture. In music, an omnidirectionality of the acoustic experience poses the question of a temporality that unfolds synchronously with the experience of listening and performing. In painting, the experience of making is asynchronous with the experience of seeing a painting complete. I am aware of the presence of peculiar form of painting, action painting for example, that tends to depart from this distinction. However, by tracing the trajectory that connects Kandinsky's impression tree and Schoenberg's three clavier my intent is to observe general principles of the relationships within these mediums, rather than exceptions to these principles, and to evaluate the nature and the characteristics of the communicative flair between the two artists taken as an example here. In his theory of colors, Kandinsky defines three types of painting which he calls impressions, improvisations and compositions. Impressions, according to him, are based on an external reality that serves as a starting point. Improvisation and composition instead depict images emerging from the unconscious. The painting impression tree, following Kandinsky's definition, draws inspiration from the concert space of Schoenberg three Kleberstück event. Thus, I notice that the musical gestures follow in its temporality by a drawing gesture, sounds that anticipate and coalesces in colors. With the fermata, I momentarily suspend this investigation into the relationship between Kandinsky and Schoenberg by introducing a work that seems to follow the opposite direction of meaning transmission to that which operates between Impression Tree and the Triclavistuk. Cornelius Cardio Trutis which moves from the drone gesture to musical ones. When composer Cornelius Cardius fills hundreds of pages of his work treatise with sophisticated geometric shapes just opposed with empty musical staves, it communicates to a coalescence of oral with the visual, of the drone gesture with the musical gesture. Music notation is full of these optical deceits. Sound is pinned down on a piece of paper, more recently on a laptop screen, in the manner of symbol, a line, a dot, text, numbers and geometrical shapes. The score of treatise dramatically poses the question of the relationship between sound, geometric shapes and symbolic representation of musical gestures. By leaving empty the musical stave at the bottom of the score, cardio seems to require the performer to find the sounds and the music somewhere else. The combination of geometric shape, which constitute the 193 pages of the score, demands much more than interpretation from a performer. It requests a recomposition of unheard musical material, an elaboration ex nihilo, a musical feature in a score containing solely special relationships. While never actually heard on paper, sounds find its representation in geometrical lines, a series of dots traced on a planar space. 
By delineating or separating segments, contiguities, the musical gestures transform into visual, kinesthetic ones. The sound unseen is the cipher with a visual act, congealed, translated, modified according to an ocular perspective, a gestural elan vital. Cornelius Cardius' proximity to Ludwig Wittgenstein's Tractatus Logico-Philosophicus is well known, and well known also that the realization of the score of the trees is close to Wittgenstein's logical propositions introduced in his Tractatus. I will not delve into this relation due to the, due the limited time at our disposal, but I will hint at a metalinguistic aspect of Cardio's elaboration of the score, which allows me to look back at Kandinsky's Impression 3, while anticipating Harry Bertoria's some sculptures, the so-called Sonambian sculptures. Earlier on, I have introduced the relationship between music and visual art as a form of communication, acting upon a translation which allows modification, transformation, and recombination of morphological matrices. I have also introduced Nishida's intuitive knowledge that correlates spatio-temporal perspective processes to the actual paper's investigation on the multifarious association of sound and visual. I'm now ready to introduce a last example from the work of Harry de Ortoia and his Sonambian sculptures. It appears to me that these beconin resonating structures, made primarily of metal rods and concrete, result in a syncretic undifferentiation of the temporality of sounds and visual. The sound produced by these structures collapses the differentiation of the visual and auditory experience into a form of perceptual participations that appears concurrent with the poetics of its noetic. By condensing the sensorial experience and the ruminations about the unfolding experience into an instant of time, Bertoia's work seems to allude to reflections about Kitaro Nishida's intuitive knowledge. Here, in fact, the proximity to the Japanese philosopher notion is of interest. In Bertoria's Sonambian sculptures, perceptual knowledge seems to congeal along the pathway of the unfolding experience connecting acoustic and visual communication synchronously in the form of an intuitive flair, a bachelardian memento. I can look at Kandinsky's painting Impression 3 or listen to Schoenberg three Klavierstück separately or eventually ignoring one of the two. I will be hardly be able to listen to Bertoia's sonic output without the need to observe the physical structure in action, the texture of the metal roads, the geometries drawn in the air by the road swinging, the architectural design shaping the space of the structure, and vice versa. The sculptural structure cannot exist without its sonic counterpart. Here, acoustic and visual feedback are given simultaneously. The interwined relationship between hearing and sight is demanded more than suggested. I observe in passing that with Bertoia's Sonambe sculpture, the quest for the musical score is elegantly bypassed with a work which demands listening rather than reading, odiation instead of any deciphering per symbolic conventions. In addition, I notice that Bertoia's Sonambian concept seems to relate closely to the notion of emplacement of anthropologist David House. House emphasizes the occurrence of emplacement as a pivotal term of analysis in relation to the senses. He argues that while embodiment alludes to an introspective integration of mind and body, emplacement instead suggests an intertwined relationship of the body-mind-environment. In the context of this investigation, it seems relevant to observe that Bertoia's work has a unique stance in relation to their space. Rather than existing in limbo, the Sonambian sculptures modify the spatial temporal environment in which they act. Unlike a score that I can read and perform almost regardless of the space I'm in, unlike a painting that I can look at in a museum, a gallery, or on the internet, which by adding in the latter circumstance poses questions about the quality of surfaces or the limited, predetermined ratios of the boxes through which we view the painting, in its frame, within a photograph, or on the screen of an electronic device, Bertoia's Sonambi sculpture resonate within the space, shape its temporality, define the architectural design, the human bodies within. 
The work of the American artist acts as an expansion of the body's emplacement, a space that breathes and lives within the sounds and movement of the Sanambian sculptures. My trajectory started with the early 20th century Kandinsky's Impression Tree, elicited by Schoenberg's Three Cladestok. This led me to Cardio's mid 20th century treatise, sparked by Wittgenstein's Tractatus Logico Philosophicus. And I ended with Bertoia's Sanambia sculptures located in about the same period of time as the treatise. While I understand that my examples are limited, somewhat idiosyncratic and capricious, my intention is to provide flight paths, rhizomatic entry for further investigation, the lesion entrails to provoke questions about the relationship of music and visual art. Questions that can be hardly answered in total, but nevertheless can, and perhaps should be examined and discussed, exploring pathways of inquiry in relation to this polymorphous area of research. In conclusion, I hope my brief intrusion into the interwined relationship between music and visual art can be a springboard generating deeper inquiry in regards to the liminal spaces revealed by this rather broad preliminary examination. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Maybe you would like to. Oh. Sorry, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Maybe you would like to add something to your presentation. Uh, uh, well, no, not really. I would be curious if anyone has some, some question about it. Uh, if for me, the presentation was interesting. You request me to reflect upon this aspect of visual and, and musical uh, relations. And I find myself having more and more questions than answer to this. Uh, but therefore, I, as the, the shortness and possibility of, of presenting this as a it's a starting point. So I would be very curious to know what are the feedback about this, um, my first examination of, of this. Yeah. If there is any feedback. <laughs> so maybe someone has a question. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, most interesting presentation. Uh, you were talking about Schoenberg and uh, Kandinsky. I just wanted to ask, do you have some, uh, some artists in mind which, who maybe uh, practiced uh, both music and, and painting or other kind of visual art? Would uh, that uh, do some, some other um, uh, well, uh, conclusions uh, for your research? Um, well, the, the first name that comes to mind is uh, John Cage, who was working on many fields, not only in music, and perhaps was more a philosopher than just simply musicians. Uh, myself, I was about to say before, I, I forgot that uh, most of the material that you see in the video, beside the few examples of the scores and the painting of Kandinsky, the rest of it is my personal work, uh, which is visual work, in fact. And so myself, I work across disciplines. Uh, I find that the definitely what you're asking is about uh, practitioners that have an interest of an expertise eventually in many art forms. I find that, for example, the work of Bertoia, which I want to show you with the Sonambian sculpture, is in fact a work in between because his architecture, his sculpture, his sound, his sonification of ambient. So it's also deal with the problem of space, the problem of urbanism. In a way, Bertoia works on many levels of interwined level of, uh, of uh, expressions. Um, that's, let me think about also um, uh, other artists. I was considering also one of the things I consider in my presentation, but then I drop it because there was not enough time, the, co the rela correlation between uh, Morton Feldman, the American composer, and uh, the work of uh, um, uh, Mark Rothko, uh, 
which was another interesting connection. Um, but many others, obviously, and many others they may don't know, <laughs> they are over there working in this kind of uh, interwine, interdisciplinary or intermediate work, which is, in fact, I think is interesting because in, in a certain extent, it also require a connection which is conceptual and not only uh, conceptual, which, which has not only to deal with the praxis of a specific discipline, but understanding kind of correlations across disciplines. I'm not sure that this my answer uh, answer your your question, but I hope it yes, it, indeed. It, it, <laughs> Yeah, but I just wanted to well to to add that for us Lithuanians, the connections between music and visual art is very important because one of our key figures uh, uh, of key figures of our culture is Mikolaos uh, Konstantinos who was both painter and composer, and uh, maybe it would be interesting for you to to get some some information about him and use your method methodology to somehow to investigate his works. So that's why it was the reason of my uh, my right. uh, my question. Right. Um, I also believe, as as Schoenberg himself was also painting, uh, I also believe that many uh, person that somehow are having a specific interest in a discipline, some at some point they bleed into other disciplines which are correlated to them, uh, because the senses they don't work in in in, in for ex by exclusion, but generally they work together. Uh, so thanks for that. I, I will look into this. I, I didn't know uh, the, the the composer painter. So yes, it would be mostly interesting to to look at it. Thanks. I just ask any any of the organizers of our conference, and we will provide you all yes. information just for your Fantastic. for your knowledge for the future, maybe for your future research. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you. Yes, and Trima, one question. Hello, Saskia. It's uh, Rima Povilanina. We have a Hi. message oh, yeah. of time. Hi, Rima. Yes, Rima nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Thank you for the presentation. And also, I want to add to my colleague Helmutas uh, that he was talking about Lithuanian uh, uh, artist Chirlonis. So, uh, probably in the world, he is more famous as a painter, as an artist, not as a composer. So, and uh, Adding to this, I want to ask you about um, listening to your presentation. In one, in one place, you mentioned that, um, like a comparison or like a differences between painting and music, that painting stays and music disappears. But also, then you later uh, say that um, music is also the. Um, uh, written on the paper with symbols, so maybe maybe it's not at all it disappears, only some disappears, and uh, what about the score which stays uh, for the future? It, so it's not only that we, we, we have to say that music is a temporary uh, art, it stays in, the, in its material, in, in written score, or not? Um. Well, I think uh, I was looking at two different things. What are you looking at is uh, the, the remaining of the material, the musical material through a sort of uh, translation, recombination of the musical heard in paper, or eventually the opposite way if a composer is writing his own music and he can, or hear music, is can listen or hear or the music in his, in his head, on his her head. Uh, I think the process of keeping music on a paper, on a score, is quite different from the perceptual aspect of listening to music, which is unique in its, in a sense. It's not any more unique because now we have recording, we can listen to music uh, endlessly, and the same recording which sounds exactly the same endless times, million times, but eventually, even by repeating this experience of listening to the same recording, the experience is never the same because whenever we listen to something, the experience past inform our experience coming. Uh, therefore, in a way, perceptually, the music never remains exactly as it is. And what you're talking about, the, the uh, tangibility of music remaining in the score is true, uh, but it's just part of it, because in fact, the let's say, the um, uh, gestural aspect of making music is not existing anymore or will be transformed. So what I see is a score, is a transformation of, of the first 
uh, gesture of, of making music, which was a conceptual gesture, eventually a gesture that comes from a, a internal audition of the composer. Um, therefore, yes, what you say is, it, I, I felt is, is um, definitely true. Uh, some music remain historically because it's been put on a paper, but also we know very well by listening um, different performer making exactly the same piece, the interpretation of a piece change is sometimes completely change the way we perceive the music which was on the score. And there are many reasons for that. And I believe that one of them is definitely not only the historical event or the, the solution that the performer decided to have on the on the score, but also the fact that that is score by necessity have a have a gap, the gap that I was mentioning in my presentation. Uh, so my answer to your question is is a yes and no. <laughs> I believe that what you say is correct in the sense that the, some of the music remain is like a photograph, a photograph of the past. The person in the in the photograph is there, but is not there anymore, or is not there anymore exactly in the same shape. If I take a photo of ourselves in that room now, in one hour from now we are older, one hour more. Therefore, we are not the same person. For the music is quite the same in my perspective. Thank you very much. And thank you for your very interesting presentation. And now I would like to invite here uh, Rebecca Pericleos uh, to present a topic, Childhood, Community and Memory, Benjamin's Britain's Moonrise Kingdom. Rebecca uh, Pericleos is a doctoral student of musicology at King's College London. Here, research interests focus on intersections between music, memory, and protest, drawing on theories from literary studies, politics, media, and socio sociology. Uh, Rebecca also is an experimental violinist uh, who has performed at various cultural venues. So, please. Thank you. <clears throat> I would also like to thank the organizers for putting together such an amazing conference with such a breadth of and scope in the program and some very thoughtful touches as well. Okay. So today I will be talking about the use of Benjamin Britten's music in the film Moonrise Kingdom by Wes Anderson in analyzing how the music is used I hope to reveal that even though the director has been labeled as an auteur, his films are a self-protective plea for community. Moonrise Kingdom follows the story of two troubled 12-year-old children that fall in love and decide to run away. Sam is an orphan unable to integrate with the foster families he has been passed around to, while Susie is desperate to break free from her own. The narrative unfolds over three days on the fictional island of New Penzance in 1965, where a catastrophic storm is slowly approaching the island. As the hurricane intensifies, the community of the island takes refuge in the church, where this year's production of Noah's Flood is canceled due to weather conditions. Life imitates art and the flood wreaks havoc on the island. I'm Sarah. She's a daughter. Yeah. Yes, sir. What kind of bird are you? Dear Susie, here's my plan. Dear Sam, my answer is yes. Dear Susie, one. Dear Sam, where? Dear Susie. About 400 yards due north from your house to the dirt path which has not got any name on it. Turn right and follow to the end. I will meet you in the meadow. Does he win there? Cutie cricket is in the coop. That's a loaded question. I'm definitely tied to the little guy, the skinny one, the boy with the patch on his eye to come with me in the station wagon. He does watercolors, mostly landscapes, but a few nudes. If we find him, I'm not going to be the one who got to bring a weapon. 
Beleza. After the storm has passed, a new stronger community has formed on the island. In attempting to create their own private utopia, albeit temporary and doomed to fail, Sam and Susie's adventure reveals that the dichotomy between the inexhaustible optimism of youth and the crippling disappointment and responsibility of adulthood. Their disappearance mobilizes the community on the island in a unified effort to find them, and thus sets the motion of the rendering and the subsequent repairing of their immediate society. The film is a biblical allegory. Moonrise Kingdom brings the isolated together into a community that will have to learn to act as an ark if its inhabitants are to make the voyage through life. Benjamin Britten's Noah's Flood is a theatrical work based on the Old Testament myth of Noah's Ark, and it was composed primarily with child performers in mind. It is the anchoring musical work of the film. It is the occasion of Sam and Susie's first meeting and the climactic finale of the film. Britain uses three strands of memory to weave together a communal ritual of self-rediscovery. He evokes childhood through the playful staging and accessible instrumentation, national memory through familiar Anglican hymn singing, and cultural memory through the framework of the archetypal flood. Britain consciously integrated familiar melodies to allow for active audience participation as well as the sounds of everyday objects and specified that the production should be staged in churches or large halls, but not in a theater, highlighting the democratic nature of his work. In this way, Noah's Flood is a conscious attempt to provide greater opportunities for amateur performance and young participants. While it carries listeners through a narrative of peril and destruction, the outcome is renewal, and with it, the promise of continuity, peace, and community. Anderson also places the vitality of community in the center of his narrative. His overall cinematic style juxtaposes innocence and darkness, unveiling the frailty and despair of the human condition through childlike subjectivity and naivete. Like a living canvas, his films make painterly use of vibrant colored palettes that soak and wash objects, textures, fabrics, buildings, and environments. Symmetrical shots and miniature settings presents the viewer with a childlike perspective on emotionally complex and mature themes. Dysfunctional families, lost glory, socially unacceptable relationships, communication, forbidden love, parenthood, death, loss, nostalgia, childhood, and the struggle of growing up. The visual structure of the film follows Anderson's ultra stylized arcness, intricately realized storybook settings, deadpan dialogue that obscures melancholy and comedy, life sized dollhouses, and use of color palettes that reminds us that artifice is central to the enjoyment of art. The landscapes themselves have a childish defiance of gravity, evident at the strangely strangely tall poles at the tidal canals and when the scouts build their tree house impossibly high. Anderson's settings look like stage sets, carefully arranged. His style is self-reflective, drawing attention to the very act of looking through perfectly centered shots and symmetrical composition. Anderson asks us to look at the edges as much as the center. His thematic obsession with the marginal and the disaffected suggests that this is where real drama and real life occurs. Moonrise Kingdom, as well as Noah's Flood, confronts us with the question of where and how we draw or unwittingly run up against these boundaries between our fictions, our significantly fictive selves and forms of social life and the material and non-human worlds against and through which they unfold. Wielding the familiar and unfamiliar together, both works are chief theatrical re-enchantment through an expansion of community across temporal, musical, and cultural boundaries. Anderson's films, regardless of how exotically they might be conceived, are always in one form or another a homage to his own analog childhood, while also a subtle revolt against the digital age. 
Moonrise Kingdom, for example, brings together many of the director's personal memories. As Anderson himself has stated, it's a memory of a fantasy, the autobiography of something that didn't happen. And he also mentions in one of his interviews that when he was a child himself, he found this pamphlet on top of the fridge in his kitchen, coping with a very troubled child. And although he had siblings, he knew very well who the troubled child was. Anderson encountered Britain's music, known as flat specifically, when he himself was as a child and a part of its amateur cast. He comments regarding Moonrise Kingdom, the play of Noah's Flood that is performing it. My older brother and I were actually in a production of that when I was 10 or 11. And that music is something I've always remembered and made a very strong impression of me. His use of Britain's music manifests far before the established uses of a soundtrack. Similarly, Britain drew consistently from his personal memory of childhood and early compositions. Britain's relationship with his early works informs his later composition in a manner that few composers illustrate or even admit to, and thus reveals a more complex attachment to his childhood than mere nostalgia. For example, themes of several early pieces he composed as a child are recycled into his simple symphony, whose playful pizzicato features prominently in Moonrise Kingdom. He was even happy for some of his juvenile works to be published, unlike most composers who dismiss their earlier works as unreflective of their eventual ability. Indeed, Britain's compositional timeline seems to be in flux. Rather than demonstrating a linear progress from childhood immaturity to fully grown compositional greatness, Britain traveled back and forth through the early works he composed as a child, often to ease the development of the ones he wrote as an adult. The development between childhood and maturity is also disturbed in Moonrise Kingdom. Anderson portrays the relationship between 12-year-old Sam and Susie as the healthiest, most sincere and selfless in the film, while the adults around them commit adultery, lie, and are generally unhappy with themselves and others. By presenting children with a grown-up maturity and articulateness, Anderson reveals that the binary that keeps children at distance is sometimes illusionary and self-serving. In the world of Moonrise Kingdom, nobody ever matures completely, signaled by Captain Sharp's Island Police Cup, boy shorts, and Susie's father general demeanor. This is not necessarily because growing up is presented as difficult to do, but because it suggests an artificial sense of progress where childhood and adulthood are wholly distinctive and separate periods of human existence. The resolution is that of re-enchantment. Anderson blares the line between fantasy and reality to sustain an illusionary optimism and sentimentality post disenchantment. Perhaps nowhere else is this more evident than in Britain's own self and life. Britain had a far from unproblematic fascination with childhood. His sense of prolonged nostalgia for the spontaneity and innocence of youth is manifested in various ways throughout his adult life. From choosing nursery food to constant games and competitiveness, Britain is documented as a modern day Peter Pan, wishing to stay a child forever. His desire to be around children and his delight in the company of young boys was the topic of much gossip at the time. His friendships with young children would not have been tolerated today. In their influential accounts of Western modernity, Nietzsche and Weber describe it as a progressive disenchantment of the world, beginning with the death of God, and modern efforts to re-enchant the world are often framed by loss. Wendy must return from Neverland and subsequently grows up into an adult. Alice comes back from Wonderland to many more lazy afternoons. Anderson, too, evokes the fading of enchantment. The action of the film occurs at the onset of autumn and Susie's family home is at summer's end. When Sam and Susie are first captured and separated, we hear Benjamin Britten's cuckoo song from Friday Afternoons, a collection of songs composed for children. The song is a reiteration of the summer's end motif. The cuckoo born in spring enjoys the summer but must eventually fly. However, at the end of the film, Britain's cuckoo song reappears. As Sam is exiting Susie's room through her window and via a ladder, Anderson's camera slides to reveal the picture that Sam has been painting. Sam has recreated in the way of modern fairy tales something that is gone. The beach inlet that Sam and Susie had said come during their escape, which was later destroyed by the storm. 
Anderson's narratives feature disheartened parental figures and children who are as gifted as they are troubled. Where the adults behave like stubborn children, the children display an adult-like sensibility and sincerity, exemplifying Anderson's trademark structural irony. While Moonrise Kingdom exhibits Anderson's highly artificial directorial style, the emotional content he elicits is not. Simon Suzy's dynamic is not particularly deep, but is sincere and genuine. Their elopement is signaling the importance of community through alternative familial structures while critiquing various institutions like marriage and family. Anderson treats their love with mock gravity, but there is moral weight in the way they embrace each other's eccentricities. Didactical compositions for children are used extensively throughout Moonrise Kingdom, such as Benjamin Britten's Young, Young Person's Guide to the Orchestra. The dissection of the orchestra into its different families mirrors the compartmentalized isolation of the bishop family into their rooms, each doing their own activities. Thus, by isolating individual sections of the orchestra, the music reflects the disconnection of the family unit, which must eventually come together to produce a symphonic whole. By using grown-up music designed for children, Anderson strengthens the film's child-friendly ethos. Britain is widely respected in the pantheon of 20th century composers. However, the qualities of his music are perhaps relatively subtle to find enough life outside the concert hall. His music tends to walk a delicate tightrope between nationalism, tradition, and contemporary modernism. It is perhaps the reason why his music is rarely used in cinema. He seems to float in the middle of the pastoral and modernist extremes. Perhaps it is precisely this in-betweenness in that appeals to the young characters in Moonrise Kingdom. Arguably, Sam and Susie are in between childhood and adolescence and experience a complex range of emotions and hormonal changes, like dark and destructive bursts of aggressive behavior. Susie carries a record of Benjamin Britten, among others, in her escapade with Sam, and her younger brothers play the record at home. Just like Anderson's exploration of early adolescence, unpleasant emotions are not simplified for the sake of sentimentality. There is a dark majestic beauty embedded in Britain's composition. Both artists created many works about children that nonetheless share the same complexity and sincerity as more ostensibly grown up work, thus emphasizing the emotional capabilities of children as well as their creative power. Thus, while the music is intended to crack open and simplify the adult world of orchestral music to children, it serves to expose children to loaded adult emotions that conflate beauty and melancholy. Britain's variations are suitable for Sam and Susie as a signifier for their own relationship and their surroundings. Their outlook might be simple, but their innocence does not weaken their capacity for depression or euphoria. Moonrise Kingdom satirizes the authority we have traditionally given established institutions and systems, such as the theater, family, marriage, school, the law, social services, police, and the church. When Sam and Susie first run away, his fellow scouts are deputized to catch the fugitives and proceed to do so in a vigilante-like fashion. The scene sheds lights on the internal conflict between the individual and the mob. The theme was central to Britain's life and work, particularly his opera, Peter Grimes. His own summation of the work concludes, a subject very close to my heart, the struggle of the individual against the masses. The more vicious the society, the more vicious the individual. Writing in 1941, in an unexpected, unexpected turn at the end, Britain suggests the attempt to create a national music is only one symptom of a serious and universal malaise of our time the refusal to accept the destruction of community by the machine. The destruction of community by the machine is subtly but poignantly presented in Moonrise Kingdom. To demonstrate, one of the events that changed the world forever was the launching of the first commercial communication satellite known as Early Bird in April, 1965. The film is riddled with references to birds. By staging the collapse of communication within the community, Anderson aptly illustrates how America and the world was reaching out into space while unable to communicate with those living in the same house. For example, 
Susie's mother, Mrs. Bishop, uses a bullhorn to communicate with her husband and kids at home, calling them to dinner, even if, as Mr. Bishop says, they are right here. Captain Sharp uses a walkie-talkie to reach out to Sam when he's climbing the church steeple, while the social services lady appears in split screen through person-to-person -person connected calls. Scoutmaster Ward records his everyday log of camp even though on a tape recorded, as well as his thoughts and personal notes. Anderson reminds us that the bonds and habits we form with technology are not easily overcome or broken. Just like Scoutmaster Ward, Susie carries her brother's record player around both times the escape, even if it is quite inconvenient. The record player is a form of entertainment that Susie thoroughly enjoys, but it's also part of her baggage of self-identity because the record she chooses to play express for her what she cannot yet put into words. Thus, by enlarging and staging Britain's concern about the destruction of community by the machine, Anderson provides a wise commentary on technology that seems to suggest that the machine's status is neither good or bad, but it is determined by how we use it, for what end and why. For the young protagonists of Moonrise Kingdom, the inner transformation of the self they experience would not have been wholly realized in the absence of the communities and relationships they formed. The centrality of community in Anderson's film reflects the significance of his own filmic crew, which functions as another form of community through which Anderson can realize his personhood and thus his authorial vision. Anderson and Britain recognize that authentic being or personhood is found only in communion, which is to say in radical interrelationship with others through participation in a particular community of characters. This resonates both with the characters of Moonrise Kingdom, though a devastating storm tears through the island that holds the community, all the characters at home by the closing curtain, safe and whole. Art can manage this and return ourselves and children to it, partly to help us and them to weather history and partly to understand our own place in the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. A uh, very interesting presentation about um, cinema and music and maybe some questions. Thanks a lot. Um, I have many questions. One is, can you just clarify when are you talking about Anderson? When are you talking about Benjamin Britten? And when are you talking about Anderson's perception of ben Benjamin Britten? Yeah, it would be really difficult to distinguish the three because the movie uses Benjamin Britten's music both as a structural direction of how to unveil the story of the film, also part of the diegesis of the film's soundtrack, but also as an external commentary on it. So there are a lot of times in the film where you would have a phonograph playing uh, Britten's music within the diegesis, but then it would switch to a fully orchestral sound, which would switch between diegetic and soundtrack. So the point I was trying to make was that it would be very distinctly, it, it would uh, break down the way that Anderson used Britain as inspiration if I was to wholly separate when and what was applied. The inspiration was found both in his life, both in the music, but also how each treated theatrical processes of renewal to carry their narratives across both the film's own plot, but also the film's own soundtrack. Thank you. More questions, maybe? Some comments? Any feedback I would hugely appreciate. <laughs> No, for me, for example, it was very interesting um, uh, comment maybe of Benjamin Britten about uh, creating national music. Uh, he, he said that uh, uh, when is, uh, we have attempt to create national music is a symptom for, uh, for, uh, for that, that we are not accept illusion that uh, 
community uh, is uh, one unit community is not possible for me it is interesting because uh, now i am I have written one, one article about national music and about Lithuanian music. And yes, in our music uh, in 20th century, we had very, very strong, um, how to say, will to, to create national music. Yes, and uh, there are uh, different uh, points of view. Of view. Uh, it, it is possible to create or it is not possible to create. So. Uh, a, a, a little comment to this. I think particularly in the case of Benjamin Britten, if we consider that um, he was, well, he was a homosexual at a time where that was not necessarily widely accepted, but his music was also uh, straddling the line between the modernist tendencies of the time and the more cliche pastorals that we have in England's national music. So I think his attempt, uh, when he was talking about the distraction of community by the machine, perhaps we can interpret that as a foreshadowing of further globalization that was to come, like the mo modernist elites of the time were already breaking away with uh, established norms and cultural traditions. And I think Britain uh, interpreted a loss in that. And while he wanted to hold on onto a very sentimental British sensibility, I think he understood that in order for that to survive and create a national music that is both timeless and current, that you would have to renew what it means to the people of the community you're currently occupying and I think that that's what he was trying to do with his music I think he was trying to create a national music that uh, rather than hold on to our perceived notions of national identity making it um, current in a way that is meaningful to include the more modern communities and societies that we're starting to form under our own understanding of a national identity thank you more questions comments no? Yes. Thank you very much for your presentation. I have a question to um, related to your uh, presentation. I mean that I don't know this move for me it would be difficult to ask something specifically, but I just have one commentary that in that time in that time in the 60s and 70s, Britain was very popular in Lithuania and in Soviet Union. And one of our colleague, uh, uh, Deodata Storagis, was even writing the monograph he later published in the same period. And uh, probably there is no link, but I have to say that in Soviet Union, they also had very special discourse on childhood which was greatly influenced by official ideology. And to some artists, and especially in cinema, it was also some island to escape their official ideology. It was, you know, this double uh, mm -hmm. configuration that it was from one, one side, it was constructed by official ideology, and from another, it was some escape, possibility to escape this. So just... Do you have any insights as to why you think Britain resonated with uh, Lithuania under the Soviet Union? Uh, you know, it's difficult to say, but I, I think that in Soviet Union, uh, Britain was quite comfortable for many musicians and composers because uh, his style was something you know, not highbrow and not lowbrow, something in between, between modern and, and national and something. And, and it was, I think this was also very important. Thank you. Thank you. So more questions so thank you very much thank, thank you. you and now i would like to invite lauma melena bartkevica from latvia uh, to present topic banyuta resurrected from national romanticism to contemporary performativity Lauma uh, Melena Bertkevice holds a PhD in arts from the University of Latvia, is a researcher at the Jazeps Vitals 
Latvian Academy of Music. She is a music and theater critic. Yeah. Uh, she is also a head of the Latvian national section at the International Theater Critics Association. Um, editor of the musicology journal Musicas Academias Raksti and co-editor of Latvian theater website Kroders LV. Uh, and she and also she is an active yes music and theater critic and so please Hello. Uh, I'm glad to be here. And uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank the organizers about this wide focus of the conference, uh, bringing together visual arts, music, and film. And I will also contribute in this intertwining of genres, which seems to become more and more topical today. And uh, my topic uh, is Banyuta Resurrected from National Romanticism to Contemporary Performativity. And it concerns the opera written in 1920 and recently presented in a completely new form. A uh, hundred years after the premiere of uh, Alfred Skalnich National Romanticism opera Banyuta comes a new premiere of opera film, uh, which is an international project melting opera, musical performance, the conditionality of performing arts and contemporary performativity embodied in film aesthetics and film form movie, though it is not an ordinary movie nor ordinary opera, somehow deconstructed and transformed into a new contemporary artwork Banyuta resurrects uh, in a form that methodologically doesn't fit uh, to any conventional box for analysis. Uh, it finds new audiences and new perception contexts, as well as creates new challenges for the researchers, being a new approach to score stage and screen, uh, which perfectly matches with the title of this conference. To frame a bit methodologically my presentation, I will use a relatively recent essay by German theater scholar Erika fischer lichter uh, where she wrote uh, the following, um, quote, for a long time, art studies departments have led solitary lives, be it musicology or theater studies, art history, literature, or film studies, each discipline clearly defined itself against the others through its specific subject, respective methodology and theoretical approaches. Uh, the last decades, however, we have seen a tendency to blur the line between these traditional art disciplines based on fundamental new developments within the arts. Two developments in particular stand out in this respect. And here you can see bolded on your screen that she mentions the increasing dissolution of boundaries between different art forms for instance, between film, theater, dance performance, and so on. And the second would be the aesthetization of everyday life. Opera film Banyuta, featured 2021, is a particular case among Latvian recent music theater productions. Uh, first of all, it is the only example among contemporary music theater productions that is based on previously written classical opera. Here is some general overview about the opera Banyuta, uh, the short retell of plot, and also uh, the introduction of the problematics that is reflected in the movie about two finals. There is also a version about three finals, but the second edition uh, slightly modifies the first one, the tragic final. Meanwhile, the one written in the 1940 completely changes the dramaturgy and the final of the opera. And also the musical characteristics, as you might 
uh, now is like like in the interwar period, which is like classical opera combined, like Wagner combined with Russian epic national Africa's uh, choir, scenes of folk celebrations accompanied by songs and dances and which also has a role afterwards in the Soviet Union. Uh, the source opera Banyuta for long used to be widely considered to be the first Latvian original opera or so-called national opera. This fact actually has been recently corrected by my colleague present here, Professor Jan Skudinch. Actually, there have been examples before and uh, what are we actually understanding with national opera today? The creative team refers to this status of the first national opera titling their product the first ever Latvian opera film with slightly ironic intonation. Initially, it was planned to be an interactive performance, which, uh, and this is conditions of COVID that transformed this product into film due to the COVID-19 restrictions since the team is international and they uh, weren't able to meet and rehearse. And uh, when the restrictions entered into force, they continued the work exploring all possible distant working methods, filming their ideas, interchanging them, discussing the scripts on Zoom and similar. But uh, now I will go back to the roots and uh, to give an overview about the, oh, uh, an, an overview of Banyuta, uh, which is based on Latvian, Lithuanian, Prussian, let's say, ancient Baltic legends. And uh, opera has a notable performing history throughout the 20th century as a representation of Latvian national identity witnessed both in score and stagings uh, featuring folk culture elements, starting from folk song melodies, use of choir, midsummer celebration representations that reflect the ancient traditions, stylized national costumes, uh, the main pro protagonist usually wearing the artificial braids and pathetic crowns. Here are some uh, pictures from, as you can see, from 1921 and 1953. And also a few pictures from the stagings to feel the mood as Banyuta was usually uh, staged and as it is somehow the traditional version like 20s and 50s and 79. The style of aesthetics, as you might notice, seemed to repeat, whether during the first independence of Latvia and during Soviet occupation. Uh, approaching the centenary of this opera, it somehow attracted the attention both of researchers, musicians, and wider public, though until 2020, it has not been staged since uh, 1979. Uh, there has been some open air performances in 1999 and also concert performance that year. And this also somehow involved this community like local choirs and uh, dancers and uh, uh, celebrating this midsummer event, which is in the still being a representation somehow of this national culture. Uh, the overview of the traditional productions. Uh, in a, a comment in parenthesis, there is the tragic final with a classical double suicide of the main protagonist, Spanyut and Vegetis, and afterwards, after 1940, it is the so-called optimistic final, which ends up that the people liberates uh, the couple from the oath that Spanyut has to kill Vegetis, and, uh, and so it's kind of an optimistic event. Uh, a few years ago, my colleague Jan Skudinch published an extensive article called Banyu to the first opera in Latvian and its libretto as a historical narrative in the context of staging history. In the conclusions, he poses the following question. Is the opera Banyu to now just a historical fact? And uh, concludes that potentially, it is still potentially intriguing elements for the creation of the new staging. Article is in English and available in the link you can see below. Uh, today, we've got an answer. Banyut is a source and a platform for a new interdisciplinary artwork in the coordinates of contemporary music, theater, and film. Uh, here is a short synopsis. There are uh, slight changes uh, in comparison to previous uh, libretto. However, the structure 
uh, deconstructed and being conserved uh, in, it is at the same time conserved and reconstructed. In terms of uh, form, opera film can be considered a postmodern interpretation of classical work. However, due to the approaches used by the creative team, it aims to become a brand new artwork of the 21st century. It merges opera, music theater, performance, artistic deconstruction and recontextualizations, finally transforming the traditional national romanticist story into social criticism, non-sentimental psychoanalytic reflection and paradoxical humor. Uh, the team that realized the project is international. Mm, director Franziska Kronfurt, uh, involving music theater troupe Hauen and Stechen from Hamburg. Uh, the story of Banyuta is put in lights of traumatism of war, violence and personal relationship. Latvian dramaturg Evarts Malnauks and composer Jakobs Niemens interpret the source material, let's say uh, the score by Alfred Kalnich and the libretto by Arthur Skrominch, adding new contexts and content. Banyuta in the film is interpreted by three performers, German actress Angela Braun and Latvian singers Laura Gretzka and Sniedze Kanyepe. Uh, Banyuta takes part in partisan battles, bringing with her the collective, collective experience of women, women who have suffered through the wars of the 20th century Eastern Europe. And uh, I must admit that uh, it, is, it wasn't uh, predicted like that, but today with the spreading war over Ukraine, the subject seems to become more, even more relevant than it was planned before. The plot adds feministic and post-colonial discourse to the previously purely romanticist piece. The content is enriched by the texts by Svetlana Alexievich, uh, namely the unwomanly face of war, by the lines of the Latvian poet Inga Gaila. Some solo songs uh, by Alfred Skalnich are introduced in the score. Some uh, scenes contain Latvian folk songs, a cappella. Uh, also silent film aesthetics and other materials create a multi-layered story extending the narrow national representation context to global scenes and relevance. In addition, every participating person, including musicians, if there is a piano quintet, uh, is a performer. They act, sing, play, and for a researcher embody the interart principle formulated by Erika fischer lechte And here I would like to show you, uh, since I do not have rights to show the full or fragments of film, we will limit ourselves to the film trailer and please consider what, that the trailer has every possible thing the trailer might have and it is not the full representation of film just to, to give you a short impression.
Uh, irony and grotesque, as you might have noticed, are used as means of expression to uncover the absurdity of any single meaning attributed to any character, action, or deed. The combined aesthetics, genres, and methods where one can track opera, popular culture, folklore, feature movie, including spaghetti movie, and music theater provides a unique artistic experience, opening up new horizons in dealing with cultural heritage today. Besides, the two finals I have mentioned before are played in turn uh, as meta theater, referring to famous opera cliches, like in the fragment where they are lying down at the bank of the river. It is uh, the representation of the double suicide, where there is reference to Romeo and Juliet. They drink poison, both of them in turn. And afterwards, they play the second, uh, second uh, final, where uh, Banyute asks the brigadier for, of, the, of the collective community what he thinks about it. Uh, and he says, people tell what is your voice? Shall, sh should they live or should they die? So they play in turn making this meta theater uh, within the film. Uh, the opera score uh, is enriched by several songs by Alfred Kalnich. Uh, to give a context, uh, he, the composer has written about uh, 250 songs for voice and piano. Uh, however, only few of the most popular are used in the film, uh, and they are put in the context, uh, either uh, contrasting the plot or like somehow strengthening the plot. And also, for instance, there is a song Alfred Skalanin has written in USA, therefore the lyrics are originally in English. It is called The Mysterious Cat. And it is the scene where the king, the father of Daumans, Valgud, is, uh, is getting mad. And he's singing this, uh, reciting actually, the song, uh, Mysterious Cat. The composer, Jakob Niemans, who is one of the, like I would say, young mid-generation theater composers and a very, very good arranger, has both combined orig his original music and made arrangements of operatic score for instrumental quintet carefully respecting the original composition. Of course, it's not the same. It's not full orchestra. There are no strings and so, but there is this respect from composer to composer that for the transformation of the material is not a mocking or like nothing negative. Uh, I will show you a short example where the German actress, Gina Lisa Maywald sings a fragment of an aria from the opera in German using the existing libretto translation. Uh. Probably the most daring issue is the end of the film, using the overture of the opera and adding to it a new song melody uh, written by Jakobs Niemans and sang by Banyute, thus showing the symbolic path from the past through the present and to the future, representing actually the whole idea of the project and showing and introducing the third finale. Ending with the overture opens a new gate to Banyute crossing the borders between genres, centuries, and countries, challenging the museum value of this opera, questioning prejudices, and opening, opening new horizons in contemporary performing arts. Here is the final, final scene of the film, where you will distinguish clearly the overture by Alfred Skarnic and the melody which is put onto, onto it. And the text is about uh, Imagine that you are a child looking 
from the darkness of past. This August, Banyutu finally was performed in presence as a theater opera performance, contemporary music theater, as an interactive performance, I must admit. Uh, there was two, uh, two evenings in Riga and five evenings in Berlin in Theater am Delphi. Uh, and the fact that actually, finally, uh, the film, which was considered to be a final product, but turned out to be like interim product, uh, led to questioning the differences between the two, between the des described film and the live production in terms of immersion and reception of contemporary music theater. Uh, the resurrected Banyute is again in the spotlight of research. The music in combination with visual and performing arts melt to an instantly present synergy emanating in transcendental spatial and time coordinates and enables the aesthetic experience that Erika Fischer-Lichte calls interart and resumes that artistic practice is what must serve as a starting point for art studies and they were today to develop interart aesthetics. And so far, uh, I find that interart aesthetics seems to be one of the most appropriate terms to deal with the contemporary hybrid forms of music theater featuring new performativity. But this already will be our task for the future. And I'll be happy to answer your questions in case you have some. Thank you. Thank you very much. And maybe some questions. Yes. Helmutas Shabasavichus. Thank you very much for your presentation. I just wanted to ask about, you, you showed us the list of the productions of this opera, and the last one was in the open air 1999, as far as I remember. Uh, this production, uh, how ended this production? It was optimistic uh, ending, or <laughs> this, this uh, well, first ending, uh, when, when all these heroes, both the, of these heroes were killed? Uh I must say that uh, maybe my colleague Jan Skudinch can help. I tend to think that it was optimistic version performed in the open air in Zuasan, which is a countryside uh, cottage owned by uh, stage director Guntis Gailitis. And uh, he's also very enthusiastic about conserving this Banyute tradition and everything. And uh, uh, actually, he is also organizing this collective midsummer celebrations, which has nothing to do with Banyuta, but still he's kind of uh, this community building person in that uh, particular. But as far as I know, and please correct me if I'm wrong, it was an optimistic finale where they are deliberated from the oath that Banyuta has to kill Vijut. So they still conserve somehow this uh, second edition. Second, second yes. But uh, here, as uh, you see, uh, the team didn't make this choice. They didn't choose one or other. They actually have three finals. They show the planned one, the original one, then they show how it transformed. As I mentioned, this, this method theatrical, uh, method theatrical approach to this, which I find really valuable also in the context of this particular. And program. my second question concerns 
the, the film opera you were talking about, uh, you mentioned that it was shown internationally in Berlin. Uh, do you know uh, the, how critics reacted, international critics reacted to, to this production? Uh, I must say it was rather recently, I think it was first or second week of September, and so far I haven't had the, like, uh, I haven't uh, direct uh, reviews read, but as I have heard, it uh, it is, I mean, they find it interesting, since it's not very well known plot, and also approach is quite original. Uh, the problem might be that actually this project uh, as I as, as have heard from producers, the problem is that uh, it is not a film, like film film, so it doesn't qualify, for instance, for film festivals. It is not opera, so it doesn't qualify for opera shows. It is something in between, which I find particularly interesting as a researcher, that uh, this intertwining of genres and these contemporary forms really need some probably I don't know, different approach or something, but uh, I must say that also the live performance changed a lot. I was already into the paper and if I, and I attended the performance uh, at the end of the August, but uh, then I should rewrite my paper again because it's a completely different story. And when you have seen the film, it's one story, but when you see this interactive performance where actually the audience is involved, like for instance, in those wed wedding traditions, the audience is making, I don't know how it's called, like gates when the couple passes uh, mm -hmm. underneath. So uh, it is like three-dimensional three immersive production in terms, and it is, absolutely different experience that opera genre traditionally can offer to the audience. And second and la third and last <laughs> one. Uh, well, uh, I understood that it's the production is very recent and maybe there will be some more critics, uh, but uh, criti criticism, but when it when the film was shown in Latvia, how was the reaction of the audience and the of the Latvian critics? Uh, well, it is a complicated question because I think that uh, uh, actually so far the film has been shown very few times, so very limited number of audiences has seen it. Uh, I attended the premiere and then I watched one more time, I have seen like three or four times, and it, <laughs> it, and it, it depends really because of course for uh, those people who might have this very traditional uh, image of Banyute, as, as I said, with the pathetic breath and artificial braids, it is some kind of shocking experience that you can deconstruct and you can some kind of make all these bricks absolutely uh, different. But in a way, uh, I must say that there is a deep dig uh, the deep digging behind it and uh, every um, even if you find something provocative or even if you find something inappropriate or whatever everything has some kind of justification and that's why particularly in relation to music which is i think still opera is somehow a genre where music and libretto are these and the indivisible parts, although they might have transformed somehow. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask about uh, soundtracks, so, so, so called. Uh, it is only music by Alfred Kalnich, only, only this music? There is also some passages written by Jakobs Niemans, the composer who is playing like bass clarinet in, in the- Antique. But, but the, the, the style of music, what is the contemporary classical jazz or, or what this new right uh, music? Uh, <laughs> well, it's hard to classify. Normally it is kind of, it is, it is the biggest part, I would say like 80 to 85% is Alfred Skalnich. There are some arrangements and there are some passages like for instance, when the mise en scène ch are changing, there are some introductions, but really Jacobs is trying to respect very much this original style. But of course, it is some kind of modern crossover. It's not like Alfred Kalnic would have written in the 20th, 100 years ago. So but it, it, it melts very smoothly in without any kind of, um, I would say, 
contrast. Right, okay, so this, uh, how to say, aspect of contemporary today life is only in visual part of film and in, in musical, in, in music is uh, music of, of Alfred. Well, Kahn, this so is pretty so. original example in terms of opera because in opera normally, well, I don't, I'm not speaking about Marta or, or there are some directors who have deconstructed somehow operas, operatic scores, but this is not the case, although there is this presence of deconstruction. Yes, yes, and Yanis uh, Kudinsch. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, thank you, uh, thank you very much, Lauma. And firstly, uh, I, I answer to the comment, uh, Helmutas. Yes, it is, of course, right information, a last uh, classical staging of Opera Banyuta 23 years ago, ago, Alfresco staging uh, demonstrated optimistic <laughs> final. But uh, one, uh, one correction, during the Soviet occupation time, only uh, one time in 1979, uh, opera was staged with uh, so-called original tragic uh, tragic final only one mm -hmm. but uh, but of course do, do, during soviet uh, occupation time um, dominated uh, optimistic <laughs> optimistic uh, final uh, uh, which was created according to socialist realism principles uh, 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 etc uh, but my comment and rhetorical question uh, is such um, the author of opera film, not opera, but opera film, libretto, please uh, correct me, allow me if I, <laughs> if I uh, mistake, uh, uh, author of libretto of, uh, of the opera film uh, is uh, Latvian uh, director Ewart Malnalts. This, and, uh, and before premiere of opera film uh, in the public discussion, uh, discussions in Latvia, he uh, say that uh, he um, see this approach, uh, uh, this approach uh, in which is realized in uh, this opera film uh, is the only one uh, way for, for opera genre uh, today in, uh, and in the future. Uh, maybe Lauma, you, uh, you come, <laughs> you, you, uh, you uh, comment this situation and it is a question for, for everyone, of course. Well, uh, probably Banyuta would not be the example uh, because it is um, still features some kind of original approach to the material and very particular contexts, which is both local and uh, local made to global, I would say. Uh, to the comment that it is the only way to keep the opera genre going, in terms of Banyuta, I would say yes. Because, I mean, probably one can find that uh, some tasteful version of national romanticism nowadays, but it is very, very risky uh, to somehow, uh, I doubt that uh, nowadays the traditional version would reach the function it had before. Let's put it so. As for opera genre in general, Mm, it is the same as in the dramatic theater. Since the director's turn in the 70s, when like the predominance of conductor uh, was replaced by predominance of stage director, many things in opera world have changed. And there have, have been twists and turns, and sometimes the musical part again prevails, and sometimes the direct director prevails. Uh, in a way, there are good examples and bad examples, but still stage directors are who decide on how the opera genre will keep going. And it, does, it doesn't exclude some classical interpretations. It doesn't exclude some uh, very, mm, like at least museum values what we have in opera mm -hmm. genre, but still uh, the staging is the changeable part of operatic structure. Yes. So the staging is what keeps it going. Yes, and to, to, to conclude maybe this, uh, this discussion, I would like to admit to say that I, I, I very like the Latvian musical theater for such, uh, uh, for, for such brave, uh, for braveness, for such um, uh, experimental maybe stagings. And, and I, I don't know if it 
possible it would be possible in Lithuania, for example, to to film to to make some film based on our national opera in 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 such style. I don't know, but maybe it would be possible in this Lithuanian music and theater academy because we have also cinema department. So. Very, thank you very much. I just wanted to comment that Panyata, in terms of like this uh, crucial things, it's like Pilanai or something. If you think in this context yes. about Pilanai, yes. so it's, it, it brings you in probably so how the, it so might function or not. Maybe we will try to, to, to do something, something okay, like this. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and now I would like to, to invite for online presentation, Mr. Leon Stefania from University of Ljubljana, Slovenia. Uh, Leon Stefania is a professor of musicology at the Faculty of Arts in Ljubljana and uh, uh, he will present uh, topic, notes on visuality in Slovenian music, structural archetypes, universals and imageries in music. So thank you, please. Hello, uh, th thank you so much. Uh, I'm honored again to be with you, although uh, this time only through Zoom presentation. So hopefully you got my uh, videotaped uh, presentation and well, I would just- uh, Yes, we have. Kindly ask you to uh, roll it. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. I'm sorry for not being able to come live to Vilnius. Uh, I would like to share with you uh, three chapters of my uh, research. Uh, I will start with the archetypes of musical form. Uh, then I will proceed with the uh, musical form as a concept in Slovenian music theory uh, within the last almost uh, one and a half century. And uh, I would like to uh, end uh, with the musical form and, and its imagery today in uh, Slovenian music. Uh, so, uh, to start with, uh, one of the first Formenlehre textbooks was written by Josef Rippel in the mid 18th century, 18th century. He indicated that especially the student composer should have a number of metaphors to grasp what is important in music. I quote, because the minuet, and he actually founds his own theory on minuet, uh, as you probably know, uh, strives for a cadence or calmness, just like the hungry man strives for dinner after the finished work or, oh, you must not laugh because this and a thousand other comparisons must be made, especially by a beginner, if he doesn't, uh, he does not want the composition to be filled with empty, boring and paper notes. Uh, the visuality of music is imminent to the history of instrumental music. When Edward Hanslick uh, spoke about music's inherent capacities, he spoke through homologies with visual objects. I quote, music then uh, as compared uh, to the arabesque is a picture Yet picture uh, the subject of which we cannot define in words or include in any category of thought. End of the quote. Because I quote, uh, music pleases for its own sake, like an arabesque, a column or some spontaneous product of nature, a leaf or a flower. End quote. Similarly, one may understand uh, two concepts of interpretations of musical form and uh, musical structure uh, as offered by Vladimir Karbusitsky and Helmut Lachenmann as abstractions of music to elemental shapes of or a kind of a universalist archetypes to which any story 
or any picture may be attached. Uh, here are, uh, this is uh, the uh, formal summary of music by uh, Karbusitsky. So he has those five uh, archetypes of uh, musical form. I will not dwell on this, so you can just uh, browse it for yourself uh, in the video. Uh, and uh, further on, uh, the uh, uh, concepts uh, by Helmut Lachenmann are given. And uh, he offers five structural, not formal, but structural archetypes in the modern, not only the modern music, actually, he speaks about the uh, archetypes of structure in music. Uh, all those concepts or archetypes are, of course, quite intriguing. Uh, and homologies, analogies, and comparisons may serve different purposes in music communication as well as explication of music. However, they all point to different levels of music's visuality, or better, of a theoretical transfer between different media. As Andreas Holzer has summed up the possibilities of describing music through parallels uh, with other media, musical form has been described through the following, I quote, incomplete list of analogies, unquote. So uh, the analogies he uh, lists in his book, in his great book, are uh, the analogy with language, uh, analogy with organism, analogy with architectural principles, analogy with principles of logic, form as a process versus form as a result, form uh, as created by the view of a subject, form as a structuring of time and form as a multivalent text. In other words, uh, musical forms and structures do not exist outside of historical and theoretical discourses of describing uh, also other phenomena comparable to music or attached to it. This brings uh, along the question of uh, the scope of those uh, analogies, homologies, metaphors, etc. Vladislav Tatarkievich, a historian of aesthetics, uh, wrote about form as an aesthetician in his chapter History of One Term and Five Concepts. I will not go into his concepts, but uh, the uh, main point uh, is quite important for uh, musicology as well. I think, uh, I quote, Latin forma replaced two Greek words, morphe and eidos. The first applied primarily to visible forms, the second to conceptual forms. This double heritage has contributed considerably to the diversity of meanings of form. To consider the range of this double heritage, I address two perspectives of usage of form in Slovenian music. First, I analyze the concept of form uh, from a theoretical point of view, as it was used, I mean, the term form uh, in uh, 102 Slovenian textbooks and writings on music theory. Secondly, uh, I would like to end the uh, presentation with this, the usage of form uh, in uh, musical poetics or criticism uh, is seen through uh, the eyes of contemporary composers. Uh, to correlate those theoretical approaches. The corpus of 102 textbooks uh, of music theory and uh, other writings of music theory in Slovenian language was already scrutinized by Elena Grazio in 2016. 
She prepared the corpus uh, of historical and modern Slovenian textbooks, as well as other writings on music theory between 1867 to 2011. She did linguistic analysis uh, of, uh, she focused on several concepts of music theory, but the musical form was not one of them. Uh, using her corpus, uh, I found that the different forms of the word form in music theory texts has been used differently by different authors. The usage of the lemma form is summarized in the word cloud of collocations, as you can see it here. So I should uh, immediately add, this is uh, only a portion of uh, that cloud, uh, as you see uh, further uh, down, uh, I'm jumping from the usage of uh, word form as a noun to the uh, other uh, forms, especially the verbs. But uh, here uh, you can see, uh, well, the uh, entire range you could see in the first scheme. Without entering into the historical conundrum and diachrony, I will address the concept of form uh, only from a perspective of, of its synchronic meaning. There are about uh, 600, 650 collocations that are met in the corpus. The usage of form as a noun reveals that authors use strictly professional concepts known in the history of form and era. The syntagms found are lead form, sonata form, musical form, compound form, two, three parts, and basic form, rhythmic form for the dance uh, uh, forms, uh, to name but the most used ones. Uh, so, uh, you see on the left side of the slide uh, the entire range of concepts used uh, in this uh, terminological analysis. Uh, so, which verbs connect to the form? Uh, the question indicates rather a vast range of meanings. So, uh, you can see here uh, on this slide, uh, collocations to the noun form uh, prepositioned uh, as below in this uh, rosa or pink uh, part of the circle, uh, and succeeding the noun uh, as in the above uh, part of the circle uh, colored green. Uh, of course, uh, those concepts uh, in the word cloud are uh, but a few. Uh, you can find them uh, all, at least the majority, majority of them, in the further uh, slides. So this is uh, the verb collocations to the noun form uh, prepositioned to the uh, uh, word, and uh, those that are succeeding the noun uh, in this next slide. So uh, it is the range of meanings brought about by the verbs that indicates how the collocations of form with regard to music expand their meanings. As the time allows only brief comment on form as a concept in music without going through other usages of the lemma form, Form is obviously an universal concept that has hardly any special content. It is attached either to different parts of a musical structure, such as musical notation, so the shapes of the notes, neumes, to the chords or rhythmic structures, also melodic uh, structures, uh, a function uh, of a voice like uh, Florido's form of a melody or genre concept, a sonata form or lead form, indication of the length or a shape of parts, so part of a whole or 12 bar or 16 bar unity, binary, ternary, starts, ends, suite, uh, and so on. So, uh, um, 
or uh, simply to the way of uh, preserving music, to maintain music in a written form, for uh, instance. Or form is semantically used as a fluid concept, complementary to the music's content, or in English, uh, actually more often, uh, meaning. Uh, Form is uh, semantically, uh, uh, semantically used as a fluid concept, uh, as it, I, I said, uh, also complementary to the music's content, usebina, uh, in Slovenian, which is on the right, left side of your uh, slide, uh, colored red. Uh, and pomen, meaning is colored green on the uh, right side of this slide. Formulations such as, I quote, all the various teachings only give us a guide for the form, for the shells. Yet the core can only be created by a gifted fantasy, unquote. May be offered as pars pro toto for a variety of around 200 collocations connected to content. The following range of meanings illustrate the quandary that analytics faces while uh, defining music's content and meaning. Content on the left side, uh, or usebina, collocates uh, with semanticity, with formalness, artificiality, objectivity, ideas, themes, the meaning on the other side, or pomen, the green part of this slide, addresses issues of contemporaneity narrowness and wideness, functionality, reality, and symbolism. It is difficult to say anything regarding the range of meanings of musical form here. Uh, there, as psychologists would say, uh, we can see a sea of meanings. In it, only two are kept as an illustration for what musical form represents to contemporary Slovenian composers. I'm uh, coming to the last part of my uh, talk. So uh, those two examples are uh, taken uh, from about uh, 120 composers, uh, members of the Slovenian uh, Society of Composers. There are a lot of more of uh, creators, of course, of music today, uh, but I would just like to focus on those two. I think they kind of uh, give the idea uh, how wide the concept of form and the image of uh, the forms uh, are used in Slovenian music. Loise Lebic, one of the older composers born in 1934, uh, writes that uh, musical form is uh, framing when uh, something from one world finds itself into another, which in terms of meaning indeed allows, even requires the listener to seek for deeper layers, as it were, for which the listener also perceives and gets in his music certain recognizable layers or uh, signs. Everything, he says, meaning, beauty, expression, message, truth, and other similar, more or less appropriate labels that we pronounce in connection uh, to music can be revealed in the sound world only through the musical form. Uh, music is, according to Lebic, a kind of uh, transfer of concepts through the medium of sound. The range of this concept transfer is vast, it's huge actually. For instance, uh, one of the uh, young Slovenian composers offers his creative motto as an architecture of playfulness. And this is, uh, I think, uh, what we have as an extreme of uh, defining the 
musical form or music as a form of expression today. To be creative is to be the architect of one's own playfulness. And playing has at its essence the exploration of limitless possibilities. Without entering into the possible historical uh, analogies of uh, music and architecture, which has uh, quite a long history, as you know, uh, I would just skip it to my uh, closing remarks. In this sense, composer is becoming an artisan of sounds, sound artist in a sense of what may be called sonism, to coin an analogy with uh, letterism. The imagery of musical forms and contents is limitless, at least theoretically, of course. And above all, the limitless architecture of playfulness. So this is a kind of ludism, which is without any limits, it's boundless. Uh, and the solutions of framing of concepts from one world into another one, as Lebich claims. So turns the story back towards the musical universals and their imageries. Thank you very much for uh, listening and uh, hopefully see you soon somewhere. Bye. Maybe you would like to add something now, live, in live art? Well, uh, I think I just said everything uh, what was necessary, uh, I guess. Uh, but hopefully there are some reactions, some questions, some remarks, some notes. Yes, so please, some questions. Maybe you have some questions. Dear audience, Ruta Stenevichute. First of all, hello, Leon. It's a pity you could join us here yes. in Vilnius, and uh, we could have, you know, much probably longer discussion. And I just have two questions related to the title of your paper, in which you mentioned archetypes. And also you referred to the Vladimir Karbusitsky, quite known classification, and also Lachenmann. And my first question would be, if these, uh, also we could remember also, for example, Francois Bernard Marsh, mm -hmm. also theory about archetypes and genotypes and so on in music. Uh, my first question would be if uh, these non-Slovenian theories and approaches uh, or classifications had any reception in Slovenian musicological and, and, and musical discourse. And secondly, if you could find or uh, any analogies between, for example, Lachenmann, Klang Tupen, yes, it was something in this types of, of, of sound and uh, Slovenian musical practice, I mean, contemporary music practice. Yes, thank you. Well, uh, as far as the usage of all those theories uh, is concerned. Uh, I must say that we are colleague of mine, uh, we are still writing an article about archetypes in music, about the concept of archetypes. And we have uh, a lot of difficulties actually. Uh, although there are uh, many more theories than I mentioned here, you know, uh, mentioned Marx. So there are many people who have addressed the issue of, of, of archetypes in music. And uh, those uh, genetics, uh, the, the parallels with genetics are quite important, as you probably know, uh, with this uh, program of uh, musical genes. Uh, so uh, this is, I think, 
quite important issue within the uh, e-musicology or uh, this musicology with big data analysis and corpuses and corpora. Uh, because all our applications, so from Spotify to uh, YouTube, uh, they use uh, certain general analytical approaches that define what are uh, the styles, what are genes in music or genre, etc. So this is a kind of a hot stuff today. Uh, unfortunately, in Slovenia, uh, it is. Uh, very scarce, very limited notion about those uh, topics. Uh, I mean, we could talk about this, uh, of course, quite uh, a bit. Uh, what regards, with regard to your question about the uh, usage of those uh, theories, uh, I don't think uh, people are very aware uh, how strong we are adapted to, to those archetypes and generic questions or generic thinking in music. And I cannot point to any composer who would say, okay, yes, we are doing this. Although uh, we have a lot of practices, especially in electronic music, in electronic music, I think this uh, thinking in patterns, thinking in a kind of uh, uh, very formal terms with loops, uh, it is about 50 and more years, uh, very actual and quite interesting topic. Uh, although without, as far as I know, or I can tell from my point of view, uh, there are no composers or sound artists that would thematize the topic. So this is what I could say at the moment. Thank you. And more questions or reactions? Uh, so please. Hi, Leon. Thank you for, as usual, simulating salts. I have a question that I go very basic. Um, with this idea or this concept or, um, yeah, um, yeah, this concept of um, this generic and so on and so forth, do you agree with me that in a certain way it is just substituted another problem that we have um, when we talk about um, musical terms in general that are all metaphorical and secondly my question is um, or actually my comment to the last um, slide that um, uh, you showed us and gave us um, a definition of sonoism aren't we if we really follow that idea or theory I should say aren't we then just kind of falling in total relativism Yes, Antonio, thank you for, uh, for the comment. Uh, I would certainly agree uh, with your last claim that we are uh, somehow running in a total relativism. Although I cannot say that everything is relative. Uh, so I would uh, rather think of the current situation as of... Uh, uh, well, as several philosophers have praised it, like uh, a state of co-worlds or co-realities. So we have several parallel worlds in which we live. And this is quite uh, simply seen through those, uh, we could say, streams of old music, new music, popular music, blah, blah, music. So we have a lot of different uh, fragmentations. And uh, usually people don't communicate to each other uh, if they meet around somewhere. So this is a kind of, a, a, again, a 
system theoretical issue, I would say. Uh, not a lot of worlds do communicate among each other. So in this sense, the relativism uh, even doesn't exist because we still believe everybody of us. So, oh, we are in the right spot. So this is the uh, valuable thing to stick on. Uh, and on the other side, uh, about the metaphors uh, you, you mentioned, so if this is a problem or not, uh, the more I, I, I'm trying to cope with corporal analysis, uh, the more I find uh, interesting things about usage of the language. Uh, it is perhaps a telling detail. I, I didn't mention this in the presentation, but uh, the, the, the newest textbooks and music theory writings in Slovenia mention uh, the dichotomy between the form and the content. I think uh, with the newer uh, writings, uh, the writings since the 1960s onwards, the older textbooks, they never talk about content of music. And this is a kind of interesting thing. So uh, how uh, one concept becomes relevant to uh, musicians uh, without knowing why. So I don't have the answer. Why only the newer textbooks, newer Slovenian textbooks? I don't know uh, how is it with the German textbooks or Italian or French. This could be kind of an interesting thing to, to, to find out. Uh, but uh, it is something which just emerges, comes with the time. And uh, I could hardly think of uh, the vocabulary about this meta analysis of music uh, in other terms than in terms of usage of the uh, language. So usage of uh, different concepts. And this is, yeah, well, as you know, so one thing can be uh, quite uh, well used, uh, but it can be very problematic, of course, as anything. Thank you, thank you very much. And I would like to thank, uh, to thank uh, all participants of this session and all, all of you. And now we have 20 minutes for coffee break. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. So our conference day is continuing and we have very interesting topics for the rest of the today's conference. And um, I would like to invite Katevan Chitadze from Georgia, Pilisi State Conservatoire, uh, to the online presentation. She will be presenting the language of graphic symbols in Mikhail Shulyashvili's music. Floor is yours, Katevan. Thank you very much. Uh, Mikhail Shugliashvili is a Georgian avant-garde composer. Interest towards his body of work has been increasing not only in country Georgia, but also outside its borders. Because of his use of mathematical reasoning in music, some of the researchers have addressed him as a Georgian Xenonis. However, in a way, he reminds us of Edgar Juarez as well, using the resources of acoustical instruments, he creates entirely original music, very often similar to electronic material with its every single element that breathes uh, within its space and time and uh, is created, developed and concluded in front of the listener. While looking for new timbers uh, on various instruments, the composer applies quite interesting techniques of articulation and interchange, 
between instruments very often goes beyond the traditional notation and is displayed on a compiling graphic pictures. Uh, the, uh, the number of uh, compositions uh, by Michael Juliashvili is not very long. Most of them were written between 1970 and 1980. Starting 1980, he composed mostly for animation and motion picture movies. He was also a very successful teacher. In the uh, 60s um, and the uh, um, 70s in the 20th century uh, is the period in Georgian music when the Soviet clutches slowly start weakening and the vacuum opens up and the composer are exposed to new European and American tendencies. Despite the limits of the system, they are able to look for their own place in the modern world. Among the composers of this time, Michel Juliashvili undoubtedly stood out uh, with his talent, original musical language and composition method. However, uh, the contemporaries did not co completely understand him. Nowadays, the interest towards his music has incre increased, but I think that Shulia Shuli's time is yet to come and today's presentation is one um, little step on this road. Uh, the renowned uh, Georgian musicologist um, Lia Tolidze writes in the New Groove Dictionary. His musical thinking was influenced in part by scientific positivism uh, and also by information to theory and structuralism in a manner related to some of Stockhausen's experiments. He tried to unite these parameters um, into acoustic impulses and subjectist initial cell of the group uh, of spatial displacement. Later, these methods enriched um, by the inclination uh, characteristic of minimalist music toward the exposure of the semantic meaning of structure. His music consists of the extended intonating of separate intervals and chords, which themselves comprise uh, the single row of overtones. Uh, he presupposes to listeners' concentration on the micro details of the sound processes. While working on the materials about Julia Shvili, it was very important for me to listen to his audio recording that he sent to his student, Reza Ignace from Tbilisi to Hamburg in the 90s. In addition to some guidance in the recording, he describes his own composition method. In fact, you built the dramaturgy uh, of the um, piece, piece uh, not uh, as a pure harmonic dramaturgy, but as the dramaturgy of the mass of the sound. Like with Xenakis, he has his own theory. Here, not a single sound matters by itself, neither does the harmony simple set. It is the mass of the sounds of, a, of certain timbres and registers. This way we get not only the timbral structure, uh, but dramaturgy of the sound mass. The principles of this dramaturgy can be applied in tonal music. Here, in fact, uh, tonal music loses itself and becomes a framework. The same way Cantos Firmus has, uh, was lost in real sound and it was only a fundament or blueprint on which uh, a completely new category of music was created. The dramaturgy of the sound uh, mess uh, in Shogliashvili's scores can be often seen with one glance. The way it's, uh, for example, in Polychronia. However, uh, the elements which very often uh, convey very interesting different sound contribute to the assembly of the sound mess. In this case, I would single out sextet pastoral and big chromatic fantasy among uh, the pieces published by composer. Sextet, which was written in 1973-1976, uh, um, 
uh, stands out with the distinctive and diverse graphic symbols. The composer creates, uh, creates unusually uh, diverse palette of soundness and interesting dramaturgy using string quartet and two pianos. The composition is based on alternating sounds with various density and intensity. The constructive elements often unify the section. In outer section, there are two intervals, minor second and perfect fourth. In the middle sections, Triton takes the same role. Character-wise are uh, uh, two meditative and toccata-based elements taking tours. In toccata-like sections, the composer often uses different rhythmic and pitch progressions, while the meditative parts bring associations of the second Viennese school, especially Weber's pointillism and symmetry. The use of the timbers of the string quartet in the sextet is very interesting. In addition to the traditional ways of performing, uh, we see the new techniques of 20th century, which are displayed uh, through graphic symbols. Part of the symbols are the triangle note head and the ones very often used in Europe, especially by Penderecki, the founder of sonorism, and signify the lowest and highest um, notes in the range. There are some exceptions where Shugliashvili indicates certain pitches next to the triangles. This symbol for playing behind the bridge is also associated with the Polish founder of sonorism. Next to Penderecki symbols, we see one created by Shugliashvili, uh, which is assumed to, to signify knocking the body of the instruments, knocking or maybe hitting. Uh, while uh, working on this paper, I talk with the members of the State String Quartet who worked on the piece uh, with the composer in 1976 and had very successful performance. However, they could not recall such details. I, want, I would like to present some audio examples. It's a little bit from Sextet. Uh, following uh, the string instruments, there is a lot of symbolic variety in piano parts as well. We have modified notation for clusters determined by the intentions of the composer. There are rhombus-like note heads which are defined by Kurt Stone as diamond note heads for special playing modes or tune productions such as health valve, brass, tablature for uh, string harmonics, facetta voice, silent depression of keys and piano, etc. The composer uses combination uh, symbols of percussion, uh, uh, of percussion and string instruments to produce different sounds through knocking uh, the body of the piano. Uh, in the mid parts um, uh, of the sextet, sextet uh, there are improvisational sections where the composer indicates 
octaves and graphically hints the pitch within which the pianist should improvise. Uh, the pieces for through pianos written by the composer are very interesting examples of using the timbral resources of piano. It's to be noted uh, that three grand pianos is the composer's favorite combination. He has written three pieces uh, uh, for such collaboration. Two out of them uh, have attracted our attention because of used symbols. Uh, these are pastoral and big chromatic fantasy. About the pastoral, uh, the composer writes, it, uh, it has uh, the form of triptych. Uh, each part of uh, pastoral a figure brought out, which is built on intonation of Ionian mode. Each piano part is the row of mechanical sequence forming the distinctive sounds only through the ensemble polyphony. There, uh, uh, three pastoral moods are conveyed spread through time and acoustic space. The way uh, the composer divides pastoral in three parts can be seen visually as well. At the same time, on micro level, each of them has its own concept and their integral principles remind us of logic uh, behind the overtones. The first section is based on octave movements creating D flat Ionian mode by holding the fifths and the grand pauses so common in his work, the composer prepares the second section, where two other intervals, the fifths and third, come in, uh, which in the way imitates tonal chords. This section is the most intense with its soundness. In the background, we hear the signs of tonal harmony, feeling the battle between the pull and the balance, created but altered by, by alternating tonic dominant sound indications and long and short length notes conveyed accordingly with notation symbols. The middle part has lots of repetitions and its development remind us of the principles of, of the repetitive minimalism spiral, slow development. In the third part, um, the focus is on the next interval of the overtone ser series, the second. The composer uses the rhythmic and pitch progressions based on the canon imitation principles. As a result, uh, he creates unusual diversity of the sound based on the same material. Similar uh, to the resources of three piano, although using uh, much varied methods, uh, the composer creates different masses of sound in big chromatic fantasy. Uh, which is the Shugliashvili's most monumental and multifaceted work inspired by chromatic fantasy in D minor by Johannes Sebastian Bach. Chroma, the smallest element of temporal tuning, is shown in various contexts and dimensions. The culmination itself is the combination of Shugliashvili's music with Bach's chromatic fantasy, first talized and then cited. The duration of the piece is one hour. Its dramaturgy, construction, and the logic of the sequence of the parts, as well as the relation of the sound masses, are separate topics, but I think it's important uh, to briefly introduce them, because these principles uh, can be applicable to the dramaturgy of the other pieces. To switch between the parts is often distinguished by silence. It's the sound masses of different intensity and silence, which also change depending on the context. The sound masses follow the wave logic. Uh, they gradually increase uh, the intensity, reach the climax and uh, then decrease. As for the micro level, the composer mainly uses repetition and canon imitation methods. Shugliashvili reaches unusual acoustic effects in chromatic fantasy using different methods. For example, in the first section, the canon imitation in Prima creates the famous effect 
effect uh, known in audio engineering as a chorus. In the same section, like pastoral, he uses his own markings for indicating notes with different intensity and duration. It's interesting that only this notation symbol got the interest of our attention of uh, Tatiana Nagorskaya, who in 1992 published in Tbilisi the book Contemporary Music Notation. As for Kurtztown, he writes about such notation. A fair number of composers have been unwilling to forego white note heads altogether, since the psychological effect of white relatively long versus black shorter or Q size very fast is unenable and can be very useful. We see the same marking in the chord vertical of big chromatic fantasy, uh, where the silent cluster held by the assistant in the low register gives a full different uh, sound to the chords played in upper register. Uh, interesting sonority is um, reached in the middle section by knocking on the body of the piano, which indicated by different notation symbols uh, and remarked by the composer quasi batteria. As rhythmic progression uh, is used in development uh, uh, in a, of, of a section written with numbers in the manuscript, one times one, two times two, three times three, etc. X-shaped notes are uh, diverse in the pitch. There were um, assigned different uh, pitches uh, by the triano, trio Gorzaya, Cittadze, Kastadze for the performance in Zurich in 2013. Oh, we can listen a um, little bit from this performance. The, there are the symbols, uh, X-shaped notes. 
Uh, however, in general, uh, symbols like this uh, stand for pitches without certain frequency. X-shaped um, uh, no, note heads uh, for indeterminate pitches, noisy speaking voice, uh, voice and unvoiced sounds released for certain health notes or organ for sounds of air blown through, through instrument, um, uh, writes um, Kurt Zaun. Uh, Shogliashvili wrote then without any key on different lines for different parts. Thus, uh, Shogliashvili's musical language encompasses uh, both common and individual symbols, which can be interpreted in many ways because of the absence of the composer exact instructions. Uh, this can be a challenge, uh, challenge for the performer in a way, uh, but for the piece itself, it's a uh, certitude for its constant changeable life. I think that uh, as Shogliashvili's musical language, uh, the most of the used symbols were somehow a compromise because the resources available to the composer, meaning the lack, lack of computer, he worked on the uh, on it intensively only for a few months uh, in the end of his life, uh, did not give him opportunity to completely carry out his ideas. His own words conf confirm this. All of my pieces are constructed on original technological ideas based on the numerical relation principles. I have been working in this system since 1973. Today, I think that uh, technology with its nature relates to computer music. Uh, perhaps uh, for this reason, many of my pieces have not been performed and none have been published. In addition, in addition uh, since my student years, I have been working on adequate graphic expression of musical form and other theoretical topics that can only be solved and implemented through computer technology. Nobody knows so Chugliashvili's music would have been if he lived in Georgia now, when having a computer is no longer a problem. Uh, so the path uh, he led in the last quarter of the 20th century and the pieces created by him undoubtedly carry great value, not for only Georgians. And I will repeat myself, the time for his recognition still lies ahead. Thank you very much and special thanks for these people for helping me preparing this paper. Thank you. Thank you, Katavan. Now I invite the audience for comments and questions. Are there any questions? Thank you very much for your presentation. I just wanted to ask a very sim simple question. Is um, this composer still performed in Georgia nowadays? Uh, uh, thank you very much for these questions. Uh, yes, he, he now he's performed, uh, especially maybe in music schools also, his pieces for piano uh, are performed. And uh, uh, he's performed also in uh, uh, other countries, for example, in Switzerland. Um, and um, time to time, he, he is more, more and more popular. Uh, sorry, I cannot hear. The question was whether Shogliashvili has the pieces for theater, some scenic stage works. Uh, no, he has only for the music for animation films uh, and uh, motion picture films, uh, movies, uh, not, not for theater. Not for theater. And he was a very successful teacher of uh, music theory and composition. And after uh, 90 AD, he was uh, just teaching till the end of his life. Uh, hi, thank you for the talk. Um, okay. the, 
it seems very interesting in his, let's call it notation system, so be simplified, seems very interesting. Do you know if uh, like his uh, pupils, his students continue on with his notation system, if anyone follow, follow up on his footstop or did it just die out with, well, his death, unfortunately? <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, thank you very much. Unfortunately, I, I talked with his students and uh, they can cannot help, help uh, uh, because uh, no, nobody um, continues this uh, symbols, uh, this notation. It's just on, on this course and we don't know exactly what they mean. It's a problem, but, but sometimes it's not a problem and it's changeable life of, of the pieces. Yes, Yanis. Uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for your uh, report. And my question is such, uh, um, do you want perspective, analyze uh, music of uh, uh, this, com uh, this composer in connection with uh, a theory of so-called concept art or concept music? I ask uh, because uh, uh, during last decade in Latvia was prepared and defended doctoral dissertation about Latvian composers, uh, more vanguard or post-vanguard oriented composers uh, whose uh, consciousness or unconsciousness realized this concept or uh, this theory or, or concept of concept music, uh, uh, specific titles uh, of compositions uh, which uh, characterized uh, symbols or concept uh, which is realized in the musical structure. Uh, thank you very much. It's very interesting focus uh, for me. Uh, it was just first step in this direction uh, with working with his music, and I think I will continue working and uh, maybe on this focus also. Thank you very much. Just a very brief uh, question I would like to give to Katavan. Uh, as we know, Shukliashvili was living in a country that was without exit. And this context that he was actually banned in Soviet Union, that's very important. So my question is um, where he was taking this inspiration, especially when it comes to the mathematics and music, uh, timber, um, notation, and et cetera, because in 70s, it was not that good for unofficial musicians. Yeah, thank you very much. It was little bit open. Yeah, this is relation, but not so. Uh, I think uh, he had uh, mm, he had con contact and he had information about Western music, about Xenakis and Stockhausen, etc. And from this um, from this music, he had this inspiration. I think uh, this this way. Thank you. If there are no uh, further questions or notes, we can move now to another participant. And it takes me great pleasure to thank you, Katevan. Thank you. Uh, it takes me great pleasure to invite participant from Ukraine, Alona Berehova, who will uh, uh, present the very interesting topic about instrumental theater as a new concept of musical communication in Ukrainian women composers' creativity. Hello, Alyona, and the floor is yours. Hello, dear colleagues. Thank you for the opportunity to present Ukrainian music at this important international scientific conference. My topic is instrumental theater as a new concept of musical communication in Ukrainian women composers' creativity. Instrumental theater is a relatively new phenomenon in Ukrainian music of the late 20th and early 21st centuries. Following such composers as Maurizio Kagel, Luciano Berio, Vladimir Kotonsky, Avet Terteran, and many others, who opened new horizons of musical art through visualization and developed different types of instrumental theater in their work, Ukrainian composers also carry out creative searches in this direction. It is worth mentioning such names as Ivan Karabits, Volodymyr Runchak, 
Сергій Зажитько, Іван Небесний, Сергій Яронський, Максим Шуренков and others. Ukrainian women composers Людмила Юріна, Юлія Гомельська, Кармела Цепколенко, Анна Корсун, Вікторія Полева contribute to the development of visual elements in instrumental music. There are different methodological approaches to the study of modern performing arts. We choose the classification by the number of participants as the methodological basis for the analysis of instrumental theatre samples for this presentation. This classification includes instrumental one-man performance, chamber instrumental performance and mass performance. Let's also try to find out how the functions of objects in musical communication system, composer, musical work, performer, listener, change in the instrumental theater of the 20th, 21st centuries using the examples of the work of female composers of Ukraine and Ukrainian diaspora. The distinctive features of the instrumental one-man performance are the lack of complicated plots and conflicts, and often content in general. The efforts of authors to create characteristics of invented characters, to reveal one or several opposite emotional states, or to draw one small time scene with close development are noticeable. The performer should be both a virtuoso soloist and an actor. The author's instructions and comments are of great importance for a performer. Yulia Gomelska's work Da Buba Pa for violin solo can serve as a vivid example of an instrumental one-man performance. The dramaturgy is built as a dialogue between the soloist and his instrument. As for the title, the quasi-jazz song Da Buba Pa, voiced in improvisational manner, does not contain any specific meaning, but becomes an additional figurative and verbal color with a certain shade of tension and secret energy. The verbal component develops from individual exclamation of pa to whole monologues. Musically, the piece can be considered a kind of anthology of the technical capabilities of the violin and modern compositional techniques. There are intonation segments of limited aleatorics, hidden polyphony sonority, partly pointillism, motive model compositional technique. I offer a fragment of Yulia Gomelska's work Da Buba Pa performed by a Swiss violinist Gabriel Brandner. <laughs> The principle of theatricalization is also the basis of the piece Solo Solissimo No. 1 for solo violin by composer Carmela Tsepkolenko. The author dramatizes the very entrance of the musician to the stage. The beginning of the work is a classic pantomime scene 
the slow movement of the performer with careful steps across the stage in the direction of the instrument, soundless, whispering something similar to a prior, separate exclamations, soundless imitation of playing on the instrument. Performative action is similar to dialogue with oneself. Ukrainian violinist Miroslava Kotorovich performs a fragment of solo solissimo number one in the next video example. Anna Corson experiments not only with the sound concepts of the works, but also with the visual image of the soloist, in particular elements of concert clothing. In the work Aqua Sonare for piano, the author suggests the performer pianist to play with gloves, putting on gloves at the beginning of the play and taking them off at the end is a part of the visual component of the instrumental solo performance. In music, we find allusions with interpretations of water in the works of Claude Debussy and other composers of the past. Spanish pianist Ricardo Discalzo performs Aqua Sonare by Anna Corson, the initial fragment.
the chamber instrumental performance allows to match the characteristics of a number of characters in the relationship more closely. In samples of this genre, there is a high level of events which is based on the contrast or conflict of images. Ludmila Yurina's piece Caricature for flute, clarinet, piano, violin and cello is a theatrical mini-scene of a satirical nature. The satirical content of the music is enhanced by the acting. The composer introduces two actors to the cast who perform pantomime roles of an artist and a model. I offer a fragment of the performance of this work at the festival Kharkiv Music Fest 2018 by the musicians of the ensemble of a new music Ricochet. <laughs> Mass performance is the highest form of expression in instrumental theatre. A feature of mass performance is the possibility of building a multi-structural compositional drama through the embodiment of a complete plot with the involvement of other arts or a plot invented by the composer himself. An example of an instrumental mass performance can be Transformer for an ensemble of soloists and a symphony orchestra by Victoria Poliva. The genre of the work is defined by the author as mysterious drama, which reflects the act of creating the world and man out of chaos. The first part, Walks in the Void, is a sonorous and aleatory composition. Towards the end of the first part, fragments of classical style melodies begin to appear in the sonorous aleatory chaos. Real music that seems to break through some hum, whispers, noises, rustling. There are the most interesting means of theatricalization in this part. The action unfolds around a potter's wheel and a large clay ball with which the actor performer works. The second part of the work, Langsam, is beautiful music in the classical style, which has allusions to the orchestral works of Bach, Mahler and Silvestre. Finally, the third part of mm, this work is Easter Stihira for soprano and women's choir with electronic recording overlay. A coherent, harmonious sound eventually begins to be washed out from the inside by a sonorous spot noises hum, which is similar to sound interference on radio waves. The hum begins to drone out the singing and after a while everything quiets down. The analysis of the visual and sound layers used in the work Transformer helps to understand that the idea of the duality of being as the creation of the world, the birth of beauty and harmony from chaos, and the subsequent absorption of beauty, its dissolution in the sounds of the universe is symbolically embodied here. 
Now a fragment of the first part of Transformer. reviewed samples of instrumental theatre in contemporary Ukrainian music. They are different in content, lyrical, satirical, mystical and dramatic. Due to the depth of the content of the works and the variety of means used in them, the compositions can be called small instrumental operas. These works confirmed the hypothesis that the functions of objects of musical communication in the system, composer, musical work, performer, listener, are changing in the instrumental theatre. On the third section of this system, composer, there is an extension of the powers of the composer, giving him the functions of the director, Living composers have a tendency to direct and control the staging process. All considered opuses are characterized by the fixation of the smallest nuances of performance in the scores. Sometimes composers combine their functions with the role of performer. For example, Victoria Poliva successfully performed the piano part in her own work Transformer. On the second section of the system, musical work, the acoustic and visual components of the musical composition undergo major changes. Theatricalization of the instrumental genre takes place due to many factors. First of all, the expansion of ideas about timbre and sound, we're thinking of the attitude to the musical instrument and the body of the performer, the search for new ways of playing and performance techniques. The increased attention of the authors to non-musical factors is also important. I mean light and color design of the scene, use of props, lightning, costumes, multimedia tools, etc. Functions of performer undergo major changes in the system of musical communication. Musician instrumentalist often has unusual functions, such as a singer, actor or speaker. Specific features include moving performance in the space of the stage, changing traditional concert clothes, removing the boundaries between the stage and the audience, Sometimes the performance lineup is expanded due to the introduction of actors and performers. A separate area of innovation in modern instrumental music is the expansion of the limits of performing gestures. Changes also took place at the level of the final section of musical communication, listener. 
This was a consequence of the removal of conventional boundaries between the stage and the audience hall, revision of the traditional location of musicians on the stage and listeners in the concert hall, and activation of the listeners' attention, his involvement in the musical action, partial allocation functions of the performer. Therefore, the change in the paradigms of writing, performance, and perception of music, the dominance of the spectacular factor over the actual musical one in many works, the increasingly greater visualization and theatricalization in the musical process became evidence of the modification of the functions of objects in the system of musical communication and transformation of modern musical thinking. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alena. I think that a lot of questions and comments might come up from the audience, so I invite the audience for questions. Yes, please. Uh, hello, Olena. I'm glad to see you. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, and uh, first of all, uh, I'd like uh, agree, absolutely agree with you, uh, that um, the most strong connection of music and visual arts uh, we can see uh, just uh, in uh, the creativity of Ukrainian uh, women's, women. Uh, but uh, you said before that uh, instrumental theater is uh, a very popular genre in general in, in music uh, of 20th uh, and 21st century in general. Uh, so maybe my question is uh, between the gender <laughs> politics and the art artistic uh, thinking. Uh, what is the type of uh, the instrumental theater uh, is dominated in the creativity of men uh, composers, uh, according to your classification? Thank you for your question. Uh, I cannot uh, say that uh, we should uh, divide the creativity by gender principle. I think that in art we um, should not uh, say about um, gender classification. Uh, the men and uh, the women can be talented and uh, can produce uh, some uh, musical works. Uh, and uh, can be recognized as a musician, as a composer in, in his own country and uh, abroad. Uh, so I um, uh, pay, paid my attention to the creativity of Ukrainian women composers because um, historically they, um, um, how to say, they um, uh, are not uh, very, you know, uh, their creativity are not uh, very important in, in uh, Ukrainian music. Historically, um, we uh, can uh, say um, about that fact that uh, in uh, our um, music academies, music colleges and uh, music schools, in a, a whole educational system, our um, people uh, deal with uh, history of music uh, by men composers, mostly. Uh, only some um, female um, works we can um, propose uh, for our students at these educational uh, institutions. Uh, for example, Lesa Dichko, um, I, I don't know um, another popular personality in Ukrainian musical culture as uh, Lesa Dichko, but we have a lot of younger generation of female composers uh, who has um, uh, 
uh, good career uh, who were recognized uh, by foreign colleagues, for example, who had uh, successful um, internship programs and uh, successful residence in European countries and uh, and USA, for example. And um, my mission is to make uh, these um, female composers most uh, be recognized in the world. Thank you. Any questions? Any more comments? Okay, if there are no questions, then I would like to thank you once again and wish you success. And now from Ukraine, we are moving to Estonia, to Tallinn, where uh, Heli Ryman, uh, the um, uh, researcher at the Institute of History, Archaeology and Art History at Tallinn University and visiting res researcher at University of Arts Helsinki, is about to present um, uh, her uh, paper. Just a moment. I have to find the name of, yes. Making visual talk, the case of Tallinn, uh, 67 Jets Festival and Documentary Screening. Oh, you are here. You are not in Tallinn, but in Vilnius. Oh, Hi. <laughs> I already traveled to Tallinn. No, I, I want to say that um, I'm, I'm really very happy to be here after those uh, Corona restrictions. I've been here very many times in, in Vilnius and Molvest. Very, very glad to be here. <laughs> Um, my, my talk is based on my uh, most uh, recent, uh, uh, quite extensive, um, it was actually a postdoctoral project, which I started in uh, 2016, and um, uh, I terminated with, um, uh, with a book, which I published uh, last a year, uh, one year ago. Um, and as I said in the abstract, that um, I managed to collect really a huge amount of material, um, uh, visual material, which uh, I could not uh, use in the book because uh, book format, uh, first of all, it was limited. The amount of words was uh, uh, very, very limited and, um, and the all visual material was uh, somehow left. And, um, um, but I did, I, um, um, because I, I had uh, some uh, documentaries, I, I had a lot of pictures, photographs, I decided to uh, somehow to uh, use the material and, uh, and um, make art out of, uh, out of the material, not uh, leave the material just like it is. And um, my talk is uh, very practice based. I'm trying to have a, have not very, oh, how does it function? Okay, I'm going to use the mouth. Um, first, I present a little bit of uh, theory. Can you read it? <laughs> um, I'm, a, I'm a music historian by, um, by my, um, uh, if, I, if I need to this, uh, 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 define my disciplinary, disciplinary field. Um, and I was, uh, for, the, for today's uh, presentation, I was trying to uh, find some uh, theory and you know, theorists uh, who had um, um, contemplated on the, on the idea how to use visuals in, in history. And uh, I found one article, uh, Perlmutter, uh, David Perlmutter from 1994. Uh, uh, where he uh, discusses how to um, first how to first he compares um, uh, visual material and textual materials, and the, uh, and he he also provides some ideas how to analyze 
uh, visuals. Um, what he claims um, uh, is that um, we are attached to a logocentric imperative where words are used as a preferred source material and models of expression in Western historical scholarship. Uh, images have been rarely used analytically and critically as a source material data or evidence, despite their importance in history and possibly the utility <clears throat> to the historian. <clears throat> um, and what he also uh, um, says that um, uh, words and images uh, um, organ images organize information in, in different ways. Uh, word texts contain natural units of meaning, such as letters, words, sentences, or, or, or paragraphs. Words in a written language are usually encountered or uh, read in a, a strictly predictable, regular, and linear fashion and direction. Uh, he makes separation between the forms and object within an image. Within within an image, uh, uh, are often defined uh, by subtle uh, gradations like analogically, rather than easily uh, pierced out of uh, discrete units uh, digitally. A visual document is available for interpretation by the viewer immediately. Uh, another critical difference between words and image arises from the uh, traditional conception that images are simple forms of communications, where, whereas words are complex. Um, uh, he uh, proposes um, uh, um, several aspects how how we can analyze if we, if you have some visual materials, whatever we have photographs or or documentary uh, film materials. Uh, first, he um, um, first he says we can approach uh, uh, visuals uh, or analyzing visuals. Uh, we can find in visuals the the production meaning. So it's how. Uh, by what physical production processes was the image created, who was the creator, who produced the image, what uh, organizational, normative or bureaucratic procedures and protocols influence the production. Or we can have a, a content identification uh, meaning like uh, object identification. It, it determines what uh, living uh, and material object are shown in the image. Uh, next, we can have a spatial identi identification. It asks uh, two questions. Where was the image made and where are the content uh, shown, uh, to, uh, shown to exist? Uh, we can have temporal identification. It uh, uh, involves answering two questions. When was the image made and what uh, temporal setting is represented and existing, with, existing within the image? Or uh, we can have functional meaning, like the identification of function is critical to understanding an image maker's uh, intentions. Uh, expressional meaning, what emotions are represented, or we can have a, a figurative a meaning, uh, which means what uh, the image, uh, image's context, content, form, or style suggest about other things perhaps not even visible in the frame or discussed in the associated words. Or uh, finally, we can have a societal or period meaning. What is the meaning of an image in relation to the times and the society in which it was created? Uh, it can denote uh, to some dominant stylistic trend, social ability or taste in form of cultural life. The literature, clothing, architecture, or the visual arts, or, or even uh, politics. But now I, I turn to my own uh, my own project. Um, um, the subject of uh, of my uh, project was um, Tallinn sixty seven Jazz Festival. Uh, it took place in. Uh, from May 11th to 14 in 1967 at Kalev Sports Hall. Um, first of all, you can ask um, why such an event deserved <laughs> a, a, a research project of six, uh, six years. Um, I'm not... Uh, 
going to open immediately all the aspects that, because I have a visual material which very clearly explains everything. And I think it will be probably more interesting for you to listen to the, how, uh, the, how the, those who participated went uh, uh, discuss it. But um, it was uh, in, the, in the context of Soviet jazz history, uh, it was important because it was the first uh, international, big international jazz festival in the Soviet Union. It was really a, a big one in the context of uh, Soviet, uh, uh, Soviet conditions, uh, like two, uh, 26 ensembles uh, from uh, both the Soviet Union abroad joined uh, this uh, celebration. And uh, of course, uh, uh, we can ask at why it became legendary and why, uh, what inspired me to um, start this project. Uh, those, were, those were every kind of myth circulating around the, the event. And the biggest myth or the, the big, biggest legend circulated around the event was the, the scandalous scandalous visit of the uh, American um, saxophonist, the Charles Lloyd, who was uh, in a very uh, top of his career uh, during this time. He was uh, uh, like um, uh, awarded best uh, jazz um, musician of the year in 1967. So if such, such kind of uh, star happened to be in Soviet Union, it was really sensational uh, this time. And now I will uh, present some um, uh, present the um, the visual materials and um, and show how the uh, visuals and the, the textual material um, uh, relate to each other. How the some facts can be uh, uh, can find proof or disproof uh, by uh, by visual materials. Uh, I managed to uh, uh, talk to one photographer, uh, Jan Remus, who was there. Uh, was uh, the photographer of Tallinn television. And um, what he first said that um, the entire stage was uh, uh, crowned with, uh, by the uh, photographers and, and uh, with, with cameramen. So the, why, the one reason why festival was also sensational was that um, there were around 150 or 200 uh, uh, journalists there. So again, uh, maybe nowadays it's normal, but according to Soviet uh, norms, it was uh, very, uh, very exceptional. And uh, Jan Remus, he, he told me how, uh, how the uh, cameramen rushed uh, to the stage and how they, uh, how they uh, tried to find the best position it was very difficult to find a good position for for pictures or, or filming because uh, you know everybody <laughs> was rushing and <laughs> running to find a uh, find a good place and you you can uh, in the first picture there you can see how how they were like um, um, at this at, uh, standing at the stage and capturing here are some other uh, phot photographs of how um, the photographers uh, uh, for, uh, were uh, haunting the musicians. Um, here is a one example of how images can prove or uh, disprove uh, facts. Uh, the picture itself here is uh, about uh, uh, Polish drummer, uh, Czeslaw Patkowski conducting a master class. Um, during uh, during the during the morning times, the festival had a master classes in the from ten to twelve. And, but why the picture is a particularly uh, interesting for me um, uh, from one interviewee, uh, I heard of a fact that um, uh, that um, um, I, uh, first of all, I knew that uh, there was an uh, art exhibition also during the festival, and uh, the, fe the art exhibition was supposed to take place in, in this Mustiata um, Maya, which was like the second uh, important hall in the, during the festival. And uh, the interviewee, he said, or the informant, he said that, yeah, the, uh, there was a 
militia men came and they forbidden uh, all the <laughs> all the um, art exhibition. But I, I found, <laughs> but his uh, uh, facts actually found that this, uh, this is a proof because you, you see the uh, pictures, <laughs> the art, uh, uh, artistic works there. So um, this was somehow uh, <laughs> gave me evidence that it, there was exhibition anyway, maybe the, the man who gave me information, just his memory failed or, or he, he tried to be maybe, uh, no, give a big, uh, excite, some excitement to, to, to write some more excitement about the event itself. And there, is an, an, there are other pictures, um, uh, one of the, uh, uh, myth uh, circul circulated around the Charles Lloyd and his quartet's visit uh, was uh, about um, uh, how the uh, quartet members played uh, uh, basketball with the uh, uh, Soviet guys. This is uh, exactly how the myth is um, <laughs> often presented. Um, the, um, the, the thing was that the Charles Lloyd Quartet was not allowed on stage on first day, so they, they got uh, permission uh, on final day. And uh, the, as, the myth go, as the myth goes on, um, they, they did not have anything to do and they, they uh, find a place to play basketball. Uh, so you can see them, uh, them playing, but the, why the, the picture down there is, is, is especially important. Uh, there was, a, again, uh, kind of story circulating around that um, uh, Charles Lloyd and their quartet um, entered uh, to the uh, basketball square by the hole in the fence first first day. But when they uh, uh, went um, there, they, they wanted to go to play basketball on second day. The, there was no fence anymore, and they could not go there. <laughs> so, but uh, but I'm I'm very happy. Uh, I am. Um, I found a photograph uh, with a with a uh, hole in the fence, so it gave proof that yeah, they, they really <laughs> there was really fence uh, hole in the fence where the group uh, entered. It was one American photographer who uh, provided me that this um, photograph. Um, uh, another um, <laughs> strange, uh, I don't know, is it the myth or? Uh, or um, whatever, uh, there are there were discussions around or many different kind of numbers. Uh, how many people were in the in the Kalev Sports Hall? So I found the numbers uh, from three thousand to sixteen thousand. <laughs> so I, I really still don't know how many people could be there. Probably around uh, three thousand, but you know you can you can see how the, the facts uh, are <laughs> changing. So the, the 16, uh, 16, um, uh, hundred um, uh, uh, this number was provided by one uh, Swedish uh, musician who, who was uh, who was there, and uh, the the these numbers were printed in in her book. But it's it's anyway very very <laughs> strange our facts. Uh, change. Um, then I found um, uh, very interesting photographs on the parade. Uh, I, I could not find any any um, other material on the uh, on the on this event, which took place on the first uh, first day. Uh, this is a uh, Leningrad Dixieland uh, leading the um, uh, the um, the event. Uh, then one thing, but what, what I noticed uh, uh, in the photographs uh, that um, jazz was very serious <laughs> music. I could not actually. Those are the only three faces or three pictures where I can <laughs> I can see smiling faces because everybody was so seriously <laughs> involved with the music. So by the pictures, I I I. I I somehow thought, yeah, it was very, very ser <laughs> serious uh, thing to, to play jazz. And the people were all uh, dressed up. Uh, men were, had, had ties and, and uh, black um, suits. So uh, it was kind of, um, if, if, you, if I didn't know that it was a jazz <laughs> music, 
you could say that it was a classical music <laughs> event or something. But uh, uh, two Finns, Ritva Mustan and Matti Koskiala, th those were the only photographs where I, I could uh, I could found the smiling uh, faces or or uh, or uh, uh, expressions of emotions. Uh, then one of the sensations of the event uh, was the uh, performance of pantomime ensemble of uh, Grigory Gurevich from Leningrad. I have a, a video except uh, uh, so we can uh, see how, how they danced. Uh, Willis Conover, um, American jazz broadcaster, said that um, uh, pantomime ensemble, Leningrad pantomime was the only jazz pantomime in the world. <laughs> it was the first <laughs> jazz pantomime uh, per performance. Uh, the, here you can see, this is also um, a very, uh, I was very lucky to found uh, those photographs in uh, in uh, New York Public Library uh, uh, about uh, the last uh, event, last banquet in um, in a restaurant, um, Gevard. You can see here Charles Lloyd and uh, Keith Jarrett is here, <laughs> and uh, Ron uh, Ron McClure. Um, uh, and another uh, kind of uh, uh, funny uh, fact. Uh, uh, I interviewed here a couple of times uh, Oleg uh, Molokoyedo, and in his interview, um, uh, he said that um, the interview except there were three thousand people in sports hall, and every everyone was smoking during the concert. It was allowed at this time. You could breathe. You couldn't breathe. The air was grey and foggy with smoke, but it was a sign of freedom for us. To smoke in, in the color sports hall during a concert, it was a very sp special sign of freedom. Um, uh, fortunately, uh, I found this, uh, some uh, photographs. Uh, you can see <laughs> people, uh, people uh, smoking, uh, especially like um, it was kind of uh, fashionable for, for women, probably at this time. Um, then uh, there were uh, several informants mentioned the big microphones and uh, and the, the problem that uh, photographers could not have a, a good pictures uh, like um, um, mm, uh, close up shot to make close up shots because the microphones were, were too too big uh, covering the, the faces of the of the musicians and uh, here you can see. Um, uh, Estonian singer El, El Sima. Uh, so you can you can really see that the the, the microphones were uh, big. And this photograph seemed to me it's a kind of interesting uh, combination, uh, uh, like jazz. Uh, this is Oleg Lundström's orchestra uh, from Moscow, and, and you can see the Estonian ladies in <laughs> in national. Uh, uh, cloth. Uh, for me, it was kind of interesting um, contrast or, or combination. Uh, then um, the festival had a uh, um, very, um, uh, very interesting. Also, um, how the um, the festival was um, presented in media, like uh, there was a. Estonian artist Valeri Smirnov, who made uh, a special uh, poster, and uh, then uh, the emblem of uh, of the festival, like those three towers, um, the artist uh, uh, it got um, uh, inspiration from the old uh, town. Uh, there is a three three sisters such a, a building. Uh, next uh, films. Uh, now I can show you a first uh, video video clip. Um, this is from Randy uh, Hultin's uh, uh, home video. Um, Randy Hultin was Norwegian uh, um, uh, journalist, jazz journalist who visited the Italian 67 Jazz Festival. And uh, he, um, uh, he made 
was 15 minutes long as far as I rem remember, but um, this particular except uh, or uh, video is uh, taken from uh, the exhibition which I uh, which I made uh, on the film. So it gives you an idea or kind of overview of the festival. Estonian, uh, English subtitles. It's easy in Estonia, but you can read the subtitles. <laughs> I think uh, it's, it's funny for those who remember Soviet uh, times to, <laughs> to see. aastal kutsuti mind osalema Nõukogude liidu esimesele rahvusvahelisele Chess Festivalile Tallinnas. Festival jõudis mulle sügava ja kestva mulje. Eriti seetõttu, et mul polnud eelnevalt ainugi mida ma seal kuulen. Tallinnasse oli kokku tulnud palju andekri muusikuid ning minu neli pikka arvustus taagplaadutile tõiti ja saadeti Nõukogude liidu kultuuriministrile, kes neid kuuldavasti rõõmuga lukes. Festival avati just kui spordiüritus pidulite fanfaari helidega. Pärast seda mängis Leningradi Tiksiland Ensemble trompetimendija Koroljovi Hattuse. Ja tõepoolest kõlanud loob When the Saints Go Marching In esituses ei olnud puudu autentsest kõlast. Seda tipptasemel ehtsalt svingivad orkestrit võis avame loodet mängimas kuulda igal festivali päeva. Sooja vastuvõttu väljendati alati jalgade trampimise ja ovatsioonidega. Tallinna meile oli teravas kontrastis mõningate Lääne Jazz Festivalide Lärmaka mõnuga. 6000 kuulaega konsertsaalis võis vaegu kuulda isegi jalgadega vastu põravad rütmilöömist. Kõik konsertid toimusid linna spordilaidis. Üllatav oli, kui hästi orienteerusid nõukogude jazzmuusikud Ameerika jazzis. Me järjeldasime seda muusikast, mille mängiti ja muusikute mõtte avalustest, mis jõudsid meeli, kas tõigi kaudu või vahetult nende kuud, kes valmisid inglise keel. Kõige Ameerikaliku vastu valitsis eelmine mängus. Kohal oli ka Willis Conover, kes pälvis rohkelt tähelepanu. This is Willis Conover. Willis Connery populaarsus Tallinnas oli piitlitega samal tasemel. Kõik näisid teadud tema mahedat hää. Ta egas autogramme konsertitel tänaval hotellis, nii et ta naine hakkas juba muretsema, et mehe populaarsus ka sodile pea. Festivali ajal oli jazz osa Tallinna edust ööpäev läbi. Kell 10 kui 12 toimus spetsiaalne jazzi kool vanemas klubihoones vanemas. Siia olid mitmed orkestrid kutsutud alma lisakonsertte ja vahetama mõtteid nõukogude muusikutega. Kõige paremad ansamblid kutsuti eraldi raadio- ja televisioonisallistustele. Salvestati ka konsertite ajad. Lisaks toimusid muusikute ja ajakirjanike kohtumised. Jam session, foto ja kunstinäitus ning festivalil osalisid Soome, Rootsi ja Poola ning esimest korda Tallinna ajavaus ka Ameerika muusikud. Kohal oli tunnud ka Charles Lloydi maailma kuuluskartet. Nende manager George Avakian oli 1962. aastal käinud Penny Goodmaniga kaasas tema Nõukogude liidu turnee. Aastane festivali, kui Lloyd oli Moldes, reisis Avakian Nõukogude liitu, et kuulata maa Tallinna külastamine suhtes. Kõik läks hästi ja bänd oli reisivärmis, kui saabus Telegram teatega, et nad ei tohi tulla. Siiski tuli Tallinna korraldus toimkonnalt ka teine Telegram, kus kinitati, et nad on väga tervinud. Quartet saabus Tallinna läbi Helsingi, kus anti samuti konsert. 
Kui taas tekisid kahtlused, kas nad ikka võivad muukogude liitu sisenda? Kui muusikud aga lõpuks riiki lubati ja nad kohale jõudsid, saad ju teada, et nende nime tuleb programmis isegi mainitud. Kvartett viidi kõigepealt tühja telestuudisse. Olin tunnistajaks festivali korraldajate vabustusele, kui Lloyd keeldus tuudes mängides. Tulime siia esinema nõukogude inimestele, mitte tühjale telekaameritega ruumile, kähtus Lloyd ja nõudiselt ta tagasi hotelli seilutatakse. Peatusin kvartettiga samas hotellis, kus me igal õhtul ise oma meelt nautasime. Keith mängis me loolikat ja Jack Trumme ning George ja mina viskasime nalja. Hotellil või ukse taga valvas alati üks suur ja turske, torssis olek muda mene naine. Jääd vahel. Film selgelt polnud ta harjunud hilis õhtust ja jämmidega hotellil toas. Pärast pikki läbirääkimisi otsustati, et Loi vänab õhtul kontserti. Ta saabus koos muusikute ja pillidega kokkulepitu taelu spordihandi, kuid saadeti tagasi hotelli. Keegi ei teadnud, miks. Möödus veel üks päev ilma esinemiselt. Rohkete arutelude tulemusele otsustati viimeks, et Loi juhatab sisse festivali lõppkontserti. Kvartet pidi esinema veerad tundi, kuid see aeg polnud nende jaoks isegi soojimineks piisad. Mul on vaja vähemalt 45 minutit, ütles Loi. Ma ei saa viirist minut järel pool minuta. Lõpuks mängisidki nad kolm veerad tundi. Pärast mitme päeva pikkust üha kasvud, pinged mõjusid nad lavandavad lahatus. Nende esitus oli parem kui see, mida olime kuulnud aasta varem ostvast. Ning kahtlamata oli uus passimängija Ron McClure toonud kaasa uue kruuvi. Keith Jarrett mängis kõige puhtamat harfi klaverikeelde ja ansambel esimest ekstaatilisemalt kui jaales parem. Loid ja tema kaasmuusikud on pälvinud kõik ja soole vastu võttu, aga mitte kunagi sellist nagu Tallinnas. Inimesed on hullusid, õhus oli elevust ja ma filmisin kogu kontserti ilma, et nõukogude võimuisindajad oleksid nüüd takistanud. Ameerika bändi oli kuulama tuldud koguni Hiina piiri ääres. Kuuldavus levis suusõnaliselt ja keegi ei pidanud pettima. Loidi kvartetile pidi järgnema üks õnnetu vene trio, aga laval astudes seisis bänd silmitsi viie tuhand inimesega, kes karjusid, me taame Loidi, me taame Loidi. Kolm ametniku moega meist tuli lavale rahvast rahustama, seltsime, et ma olen vaikust, olge mõistlikud, kuid skandeelimine me taame loidi jätkus nagu rütmiline protestilama. Lõpuks pidid ametnikud lavalt lahkuma ja esinema saaleti hoopis Tallinna sümfooniorkester koos viivuli ja vibrafonisolistiga, kes esitasid hollywoodilikult üles puhvitud stiilis laura. See oli põnev raudse eesliide tagune tšässüritus koos muusikutega, kes ei hoolinud ida ja näene vastandusest, kui asi kuulutas muusikut. Tõusad ma slaid. I will be... Very brief uh, now because I want I want to finally uh, show you the this is 12 12 minutes uh, film uh, which I which we made with one uh, animator one one woman. Uh, I just to, to add that um, I also found uh, some uh, film material uh, from. Uh, uh, Moscow films, Moscow film studio made a short a short film. Then Est Estonian television made a film, and then Leningrad television uh, made a film. Uh, three interviews taken in Tallinn. Um, the last uh, except you film except you you saw was um, uh, from my exhibition Jazz Idealism 1967, which. Uh, was um, open last year in, in Tallinn. It was based on the interviews which I I made um, during the uh, my, my research. 
here here are some uh, photographs on the exhibition itself. Uh, it, it consisted of ten short videos. The 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 one you you saw. Uh, finally, I will assure you, as I said, as I said, um, the um, a short uh, video or um, maybe film, uh, which which tried to illustrate uh, the the central ideas or idea of my of my book, uh, how myths are born. Open the Google. Maybe the. Ah, oh, now it, it's the right one with subtitles.
Kõige rohkem niite, mingite festivalid ülastanud Ameerika Saksast ma Eestis saas valmis. 1967. aastal oli valis oma kuulsuse tipus Jassi Häälevand ja ta on tiit, arvas, ma olin aata Jassi mees ja album Forest Flower, mis Jassi Rai vohta enne olevatud kaudu. Tehes temast tõelisu Jassi Popstaari. väga karismantiline tegelema. Ta vannastas riietuda mitti ajastule kohalu, lugeda inde filosoofiat ja mis on saatud on kootikule tarvitada. Tema mänetsijal Georgia Lagan mängi muusikus igalt või müügi kõrgus on toobe. Kuna aga Ameerika konservatiivsed jässi kriitikud Voidi et Tekiist laadi muusikast esialgus uuteid pidanud, siis tuli avaki on välja kavala plaanida, alustada Voidi promoomist hoopis Euroopast. Et veel üks kilt Voidi kuulsuse märre lisada otsustas avaki on, et tuleb makspuulis maksab nõukogude liitu pääseda. Oodame. Kui loid koos oma ansambliga lõpuks turistidena Helsingi kaudu laevaga Tallinnasse saabus ja teisel päeval esinema valmistus, siis ilmus ootamatult välja kuja moe ka ametlikus, kus keelas loidil lavale minemas. Ja ta väg kiire tundib seda lajasidanitele ja kui loid avaldus on ühta nahalik ja diskrimineerimises nõukogude maa. Sellega tabas ta ii teadust, et kuna õndas nõukogude liitu tema enda rebaga. Ja see taktika töötas, sest uudisest kirjutas otse kohe Ameerika sensatsioonimuline meedia. Kuna avetlikud, aga ei suutnud seda välja kannatada, nii et Loid lubati viimasel päeval lavale. Üks Loidiga sõõtud muutides räägib sellest, kuidas igapäevad Ameerika muusikud esinemist oodates nõukogude lastega korv palju mängisid. Charlotte komponeeris esinemist oodates pala, nimade teis on Mike Brady. Muusikud olevat platsile nii vaust, raata ja suletud on. Peab korvist maksa ei ära. Veel levivad müügid erakordselt ikas kaheksa minutit ja kolmkümmel sekundil kestnud aplausist. Nii pikka plaus võis nõukogude maal kõlada ainult partei kongressile. Et publikud maha rõustada saadsid hirmulud korravalvud publiku pärast voidi esinemist poole tunne selle pausele. Loidi festivalile jõudmise eest sai karistada Tallinna linna kultuuri osakonna jõudataja ja festivali linnakoolne organisaator Henry Studis. Ma töötasin partei linna komiteeks partei linnakomitee instruktorina. Kelle siis ka kultuuritööga võigi kultuuritöö poliitilise suunituse ja selle näitliku agitatsioonida. Nüüd kõnevalad, et suts kandi pärast loidi insidenti vangi või saadeti sõberisse. 
No vangi teda kindlasti ei pandud ja sügevist sõidutamise ajad olid 60. vangi mööd. Aga tõepoolest suks saadeti teisele tööle, nii nagu tol ajal oli kombeks öelda parteilise vallandamise kohta. Keegi oli vaja suudi lavastada ja suks ei aitanud, mis salgiljastas voidile nii lõpumalt. Kõigi see tegelikult olnud ametlik kutse, vaid ainult kinnitus, et ta meeliklased võivad väljaspool programmi koos nüüd keskida. Kutsil aga ei jäänud mille muu nimedi ja seda tööle vabrik tõsimane direktori. Väga oluline roll müütida tekkimisel oli meedia, kohal olevat olnud rekordimiselt 200 ajakirjaniku. Kui palju nüüd tegelikult oli, seda keegi ei tea. Valter ajapäärit on muuses pärituks anekootik lugu, mis räägib sellest, kuidas Preesium olevat Seremetimo lennuvalja oli raamis šahti vastu võttes ja ajakirjanike mitte lähes küsinud, et kus on ajakirjanik. Ta saanud aga vastuseks, et kõik ajakirjanikud on Tallinna esitanud. Aga loomulikult see pole tõsi lugu, kus šah käis Moskvas kaks aastat parem. Nüüdik tekkisid ka see tõttu, et festivali juhtus tolle ajastu kohta palju eba harjuku. Näiteks oli nõuka aja juba tavalise ja välisma inimese nägemine väljaspool normaalsuse piire. Ja kui ilmus välja on loigisuune staar, siis oli tegemist sensaks soolima. Aga üldiselt oli nõuka aeg täis vastuolusid. Väga tabavalt on selle kohta öelnud vene pealist poiss krumpi. Sõbula tahtma ei tahts, sõbula ei tahtu ja. See tähendab, et nõuka ajal võisid asjad olla nii ja maa ja aga kolmandud moodi. Tegelikult on müüdid väärtus oma ette, kuna nad räägivad meile millest, mida kuivad faktid teavest ja nii teed. Nimelt inimikust kogemusest ja emotsioonist. Ajalusimus muutub müüdiks kohe, kui sellest hakatakse rääkima. Ja oluline on siin pigem see, kuidas nüüdid tekkivad ja millil on nende sisu, mitte tõe väärtus. Nüüdid on lahutamatu osa ajaloost ja kui me eirame nüüte, siis eirame ka olulist osa ajast ja selle loost. So, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Now it's time, I think, for the audience to come up with the questions, comments, notes. Thank you, Haley, for your presentation. Uh, I want to ask about uh, in this documentary, it was uh, said in Russian, Musikalnesestazania. Was it a competition there or it was just uh, yes. called in such way? Yeah, uh, it was very uh, common uh, for uh, Soviet era festivals that uh, they were not uh, just like, like nowadays we are used to have a festival. Uh, 
where musicians are performing, but uh, it was a competition and it, it was kind of uh, a way to le legitimize uh, in front of the uh, politicians or, uh, or political authorities uh, to, uh, uh, to show that uh, we, we are not just having fun, but there is a, a competition and that it was the, the entire festival was arranged in a let's call it the competition format because every ensemble there was a lot of ensembles as, as I, 26 ensembles and every uh, ensemble had a, a 15 to 20 minute performance time mm -hmm. and there were they gave uh, awards for the winners there was a uh, anatoly Kroll's group who was the winner <laughs> official winner of the festival but as the uh, so, uh, soviet musicians said that um, in estonia it was much more free or much more like uh, a joyful, not uh, not uh, a strict or uh, very competitive event like it used to be, for instance, in Moscow and Leningrad. It was uh, rather formal the, the, this competition element in, in Tallinn's festival, but it was yeah, it was a competition. More questions? Thank you for the presentation short uh, pre uh, situation after festival but uh, after after the festival mm -hmm. uh, it's closed uh, the are uh, the uh, festival um, by the event was especially in, uh, important in Estonian uh, jazz music history or jazz festival history uh, that uh, it was the as, as uh, in the film was said that the first festival was in 1949, with, uh, started by Una Nysa, and this, the one in 67 was the last one in this, uh, um, in, in this continuation. Next, the Estonian Jazz Festival took place in, uh, in 1989, so there was a more than a 20 year break. There are a lot, most, uh, most the popular version of why the tradition stopped, of course, is the political reasons, but um, I uh, really doubt in it because uh, um, from my perspective, the, the main reason probably why, why the festival tradition stopped was uh, more cultural or, or musical because uh, uh, as we know in, in meet, uh, mid 1960s or in, in the first part, half of the 1960s uh, there were other kind of music which became popular and not only in, in western side of the world but also in, in eastern side so the jazz uh, which was i would i would say that um, in soviet union the jazz was was in its highest in 1960s um, the, in this in those years the soviet jazz found its own voice there were uh, a lot of musical styles appeared at the same time. It was not like in American um, uh, jazz history, like all the styles uh, uh, appeared in, in different decades, but uh, the real explosion of Soviet uh, jazz was in 1960s. And, and after the Dallin's festival, uh, the, uh, because jazz was a youth part of youth culture this time, and interest of Komsomol organization who was the behind the or, organizing jazz festivals not exactly in Tallinn but in Moscow and Leningrad they um, they lost interest to jazz and then there because youth young people were interested in other type of music Beatles and then so forth so this is my interpretation and, and I, I found some evidence also that, uh, that this was the main reason thank you uh -huh. any more questions I have just really brief two questions, very short mm -hmm. questions. Uh, I noticed when I was um, watching the video that the first thing that the official uh, person addressing the audience, he's not using a word jazz. He's using just international festival. Mm -hmm. Is that coincidence? You just used the fragment where he's not talking about the jazz? Yeah. It's wrong. <laughs> incidental. Coincidence. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a and second thing, when um, it was uh, also mentioned that Scholz was um, uh, punished or uh, this Scholz, Scholz or Schultz? Schultz, 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 Schultz yes, yeah. uh -huh. because Lloyd arrived. It yeah. was not agreed with the officials. 
uh, he was punished uh, because uh, it would be very strange if someone arrived in Soviet Union and it was not agreed. <laughs> yeah, uh, mm, because uh, um, it was actually uh, his 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 fault because the uh, the permission for Lloyd to go on stage uh, was made by the head of the. Uh, it was high, higher somewhere. We, yeah, I, in I Moscow. Really, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know really uh, who who gave a permission. Maybe in Moscow mm. they gave this permission. But anyway, Schulz was the only person who made a okay. signature, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was in on the paper. And you know, in in Soviet era, it was different. <laughs> they, they they were they were looking just for a scapegoat. That's it. Yes, there is a question. Then I have a follow-up question, and like, I'm young, I'm from Portugal, so I have no clue how the Soviet era was, uh -huh. but if Lloyd was allowed to come by like a very higher up person, then why was afterwards Schultz uh, punished for it? Yeah, why I did think, they need the yeah. escape code? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, I think was that, uh, as, as it was said in the, in the film also, that uh, uh, Lloyd got the telephone call, a call before they left US, uh, not not exactly that, not Lloyd, but uh, Avakian, and uh, it was said that you you are not allowed to go to your Soviet Union, but they did it anyway. Uh, they uh, the, the main problem was actually um, during this time uh, the contacts between U.S. and the Soviet Union were only official. Like they they had the cultural exchange programs, and uh, and there was American. Uh, State Department and, and the uh, Soviet Ministry of Culture, who organized uh, uh, official cultural exchange events, but it was outside of those this channel. So this was the problematic. Probably Soviet uh, Soviet. I don't know who who called to <laughs> to uh, Avakian, and this this is this was where the problem started from. They they came to U.S. like. The Soviet Union as tourists, they were uh, they were outside the official cultural exchange program, program and this was the, the when the, pro, the problem started. Yeah, uh, uh, Heinrich Schulz sent semi-official invitation that they could perform 30 minutes, but um, they were not official. Were not officially included in the program. So, but main problem was that they they. Um, it came outside the official channels. <laughs> More questions in the audience? Yes. Thank you. It was very interesting and very revealing. I know Soviet Union, but I don't know anything <laughs> about this. <laughs> uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is, is this festival still exist? Uh, no, uh, this was a uh, Tallinn Tallinn, we have uh, another jazz festival tradition, but uh, the festival, the entire jazz festival tradition stopped in 1967. So it was the last one in the in the series, which started in 1949. Right, so just this is just my fantasy. Mm -hmm. uh, is this uh, Avak Avakian? Uh, Avakian. Avakian. This is Armenian. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Did he uh, maybe he has some have some connection here or? In yeah, Soviet he was Union? born in, in Russia, uh -huh, uh -huh. but uh, they the, the family left uh, already before the World War uh, Second. Uh -huh. So, but yeah, he he had uh, um, Armenian. He, he was Armenian. Uh -huh. But did he have some contact uh, in Soviet Union still at the, this time or not anymore? Uh, is he, is he still has a contact. Yeah. He, he's, he's, he, did he have contact uh, uh, yeah, in, the, inside? Yeah, yeah. The uh, uh, tour of Charles Lloyd was not the, the only uh, um, tour he organized. Actually, he got us uh, Lenin's order for <laughs> for uh, uh, arranging contacts, uh, cultural contacts between Soviet Union and the uh, US. So he was uh, involved not only uh, with um, jazz, uh, bringing jazz musicians to uh, Soviet Union, but also classical musicians. He um, issued some uh, albums, classical music albums, Harama Hachapturian, and so forth. I was uh, in New York Public Library, uh, where is uh, his archive. 
it's amazing what kind of materials I found, and it's a huge, <laughs> every kind of documents. More questions? And then we can say that uh, this is the closing uh, presentation for the first day of the conference. And I would like to thank all presenters and speakers for the first day of the conference and see you tomorrow. Can I take uh, that your